Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here and welcome to this course where we're going to be learning the basics of the JavaScript language. So JavaScript is an incredibly popular programming language and of course depending on what statistics you look at many consider it to be the most popular programming language currently. So it's a great language to learn. There's lots of opportunities out there for people who know how to use JavaScript and what we're going to be covering in this first section is a what can you do with JavaScript? So we're going to be seeing all the different types of applications you can build with JavaScript, front end, back end, mobile, etc. We're going to be talking about that in some detail along with the associated technologies. And we're also going to be seeing how to run JavaScript in all of those different situations, right? So we're going to be getting our hands dirty right away and seeing how to do things like run JavaScript alongside HTML in the browser. We're going to be seeing how to run JavaScript in your computer's terminal. And we're also going to be seeing how to run server side JavaScript code, which is very exciting for many people. Uh, by writing JavaScript in separate files and running that from the terminal as well. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so to get started here, the first thing I'd like to talk about is a question that almost everybody has when they start learning JavaScript or are interested in doing so, and that is, what can you do with the JavaScript language, right? What is this language good for? Well, the good news there, if you've already decided to learn JavaScript, is that JavaScript can be used for pretty much everything. And while that's a bit of a simplification, it's really not that much of an exaggeration. Uh, there are really very few situations where uh, it's not possible to use JavaScript. There are a few situations where JavaScript might not be the best choice, which we'll talk about later on. But in general, if you want to program anything, you are able to do so in JavaScript, right? In other words, anything that you can do with other languages like Python or Java, you, you can also do in JavaScript. So just to go into a little bit more detail on the main categories of JavaScript development, uh, the first one is going to be front-end development. So front-end development with JavaScript is basically going to be using JavaScript in the user's browser to create things like websites. And this can be done either using vanilla JavaScript, which is basically just JavaScript without any additional libraries that other people have written, or it can be done using existing libraries such as React or Angular, which are things that we'll talk about later on. So that's the front end, right? Writing JavaScript in a situation where it's going to be interacting with visual elements that users will be seeing. But you can also use JavaScript on the back end, right? And this is going to involve things like interacting with databases, managing file systems, uh, creating web servers, etc. And this is actually fairly new territory for JavaScript. We'll get into that in a little more detail later on, but really this is something that before, right, uh, let's say over a decade ago, you would have had to do with a different language, right? You would have had to learn a different language for the front end and the back end, but JavaScript can be used on both of those these days. Now, in addition to the front end and back end, JavaScript can also be used to develop mobile applications. Now, this is something that a lot of people don't realize because it used to be that, you know, if you wanted to write an iPhone application, let's say you had to learn Swift. And trust me, as a previous Swift developer, working with Swift and developing for a single platform, right, uh, for the iPhone platform was unpleasant, right? It meant that you had to learn a completely different language in order to write apps, but you don't have to do that anymore because JavaScript allows us to do this using, there's a few different technologies that let us do this, but the main one is going to be React Native, which I'll talk about in more detail in just a minute as well. And finally, the last main category of JavaScript development is going to be for writing desktop applications. Now, this is different from front-end applications because desktop applications actually you actually download them onto your computer and run them, right? They're not something that you open up in a browser. So, you know, this is a situation where before JavaScript came into the picture, you would have had to write desktop applications using Java or C++ perhaps. 
But with JavaScript now, as well as some other technologies that I'll talk about later on, uh, we're now able to write desktop applications using JavaScript. So anyway, these are really the four main buckets of JavaScript development. And chances are you'll find yourself working on more than one of these at a time, right? For instance, if you write front end and back end code, that's the that's generally what full stack developers do. So in other words, you'll use JavaScript on both the front end and back end. Uh, that may also include developing for mobile and desktop as well. I've definitely worked on teams where we use a single code base to develop for all four of these platforms at once. But in general, JavaScript developers, at least at first, tend to focus on one of these things, right? So maybe they choose to develop for the back end and write web servers or some kind of back end management system. Uh, maybe they choose to focus on more of the visual aspect of things and write front end applications. Or maybe they go the mobile or desktop route and develop applications for those using JavaScript. So anyway, that's just something to keep in mind that JavaScript can really be used for all of these things. All right, and additionally, while these are just the main buckets that you can develop for in JavaScript, a good rule of thumb is that pretty much anywhere where you can write code, you can run JavaScript. And as I said before, there are some situations where you're not necessarily going to want to use JavaScript, right? Where JavaScript might not be the best choice for the situation. Uh, and for this, I'm talking about situations like really performance intensive applications where you really need the ability to optimize behind the scenes and control the exact performance of the language. JavaScript doesn't really allow you to do that the same as other languages like C++ might allow you to do it. So anyway, just something to keep in mind. These are the four main buckets. So what I want to do now is just go through each one in turn and discuss it a little bit more deeply. Just talk about some of the main technologies that you might hear about in each bucket and so on. So with the front end, all right, when you're using JavaScript to develop front end applications, which again are going to run inside the user's browser, chances are you're going to be using one of a few main technologies. Now, uh, some of the most common ones that you've probably heard of are React. Right? React is currently the most popular front-end library that's used for creating front-end applications, and it is really based off of JavaScript. So you need to know JavaScript first before you move on to learning these technologies such as React. Uh, another one that you might hear about a lot is Angular. That's just sort of a competitor to React, if you will. And uh, there are some other ones that have come on the scene fairly recently, uh, such as Vue. Another one is Svelte, which I'm a really big fan of. And there are some older ones as well, such as Ember.js. And uh, really, all of these are just sort of different solutions to the same problem of how to efficiently develop a front-end application using JavaScript. So I'm not going to go too much into detail on any one of these. In fact, I have courses on pretty much all of these, except for Svelte currently, although I'd like to put that in at some point. So if you want to check those out, I highly recommend, as I said, learning JavaScript first. But these are some of the technologies that you can move to once you've mastered the basics of JavaScript. So anyway, in addition to all of these technologies, which are all libraries or frameworks that you can use to develop front-end applications more easily, you may also hear about something called vanilla JavaScript, right? Or vanilla JS, as it's sometimes referred to. Now, vanilla JS is basically just a fancy term for using JavaScript without any external libraries, right? So this is really just a JavaScript purist kind of thing where people want to develop their applications from the ground up and have control over every part of their application without relying on external libraries. Now, the reason that there's a term for it instead of just saying regular JavaScript without any libraries is because as a rule, JavaScript developers and many other developers as well for that matter have found that managers tend to like libraries, right? They, they, they tend to look at libraries as a solution to this or that problem. And so vanilla JS was created as a term to use so that managers think you're using a library when actually you're just building it from the ground up. Okay, so it's sort of a, a way to get around corporate bureaucracy, if you will. All right, so those are the main technologies and terms in the front end universe of JavaScript. 
Again, there's other courses that I've already published on those if you want to check those out, but I highly recommend learning regular JavaScript first, at least the basics of it. Uh, so let's talk about the back end, right? The back end in JavaScript is primarily based off of using a runtime called Node.js. Now, let me just talk about that in a minute here after I write back end. There we go. So Node.js, as I said, is a JavaScript runtime. And we'll go into more detail on what that means later on. But basically, Node.js allows us to run JavaScript outside of the browser. So that's something I didn't mention previously when we were talking about the front end, but JavaScript was originally created to run inside the user's browser, right? So in other words, if you had something like Internet Explorer or Chrome or Firefox or whatever kind of browser your operating system tends to use, then that browser would include the runtime necessary for running JavaScript code, right? So in other words, if you wanted to run JavaScript code, you would just download the browser and run the code inside the browser. Now that's great when you want to run JavaScript code on the front end, right? If you want to create a website using JavaScript, let's say, but when you want to do things like create web servers using JavaScript, that really didn't work, right? Because in that case, you would have to have a server running inside the browser, which just isn't really a good idea. So Node.js, as I've said, is a runtime that allows us to run JavaScript outside the browser. And there's a number of other libraries that go along with Node.js that make it easier to perform specific tasks, right? One that you'll probably hear of a lot is called Express. And Express is a library that just makes it a lot easier to write web servers using JavaScript, right? It is to the back end what things like React are to the front end. It, it just takes a lot of the nitty gritty details away from the developer so that you don't have to worry about them and can focus on the application that you're trying to build. All right, Express and some of the other related technologies we'll cover in a lot more detail later on. But anyway, that's the back end. If you want to develop back end code in JavaScript, chances are you're going to need to install Node.js, which is something that I'll cover in a little while. And again, that just allows you to run JavaScript code in a similar way to how you'd run code for like Python or Java. All right, so moving on to the mobile side of things, right? If you want to write iPhone apps or Android apps or whatever kind of application uh, using JavaScript, chances are you're going to be using a library called React Native. Now, there are other technologies out there. One that you might hear of is Ionic, which is pretty popular. And another technology called NativeScript uh, serves a similar purpose. But in general, I've, I personally have found that React Native is going to be hands down the easiest with the obvious caveat that in that case, you would have to learn React as well, since React Native kind of builds on the shoulders of the React library. But in general, if you're gonna write mobile applications using JavaScript, you're gonna be using a technology similar to these technologies that I've talked about here. All right, now the interesting thing about developing mobile apps using JavaScript is that in general, if you do things right, this actually allows us to share code between our front end and our mobile apps, right? So uh, I've definitely worked on projects before, as I said, that have a single code base that you simply build in different ways, and you can publish that either as a front end browser application or as a mobile app. And that's obviously way beyond the scope of what we're talking about right now, but the idea that you can have a single code base that can be built in order to uh, publish different types of applications is pretty cool in my opinion. So you just have one code base and you can publish that either as a front end application or as an iPhone or Android or whatever application, as I said. All right, so anyway, that's mobile development with JavaScript. I'm not gonna go into much more detail on that right now. So let's cover the final bucket, so to speak, of JavaScript development, and that is desktop development, right? So in other words, creating desktop applications that you can open up in the same way that you open up things like Chrome or Microsoft Word or whatever, right? That's all possible using JavaScript now as well, right? So you can develop desktop applications with JavaScript. And in general, the most popular technology for doing this is called Electron. All right, so Electron, if you hear about it, basically what Electron does is it takes 
front-end applications, such as React applications, and it builds them in such a way that they can be opened and downloaded and installed just like desktop applications. And in fact, an application that uses Electron in order to achieve this functionality that you've almost definitely heard of is Slack. All right, and I believe similar applications like Discord use Electron as well. And the nice thing here is that really these Electron applications that you can open up on your computer look and behave almost identically to how you'd expect a desktop application written in some other language to work as well, right? So if you were to write it in JavaScript or C++ or Swift, uh, you know, you're going to save yourself a lot of trouble just using Electron and JavaScript because you'll already know JavaScript, right? You won't have to go and learn another programming language just to develop a desktop application. All right, so anyway, we've covered the four main buckets of JavaScript application here. Just to, to give you an idea of a few of the other types of JavaScript development that you might want to do at some point. I've seen JavaScript used for things like Internet of Things, right, where you basically just write JavaScript on a Raspberry Pi, and, and you can use that to specify the logic for running your Raspberry Pi. JavaScript can be used for things like wearable devices, and these aren't as popular as they used to be, like, you know, things like the Google Glass, but, uh, you know, it can be used for those kinds of things as well. Essentially, uh, JavaScript can be used to write applications for anything that runs code, obviously within reason. There are certain things like uh, integrated circuit boards, right, an Arduino. You're probably not going to be able to use that one with JavaScript. You'll probably have to learn C or whatever languages those are using these days. But again, JavaScript in general can be used for pretty much any application that you'll want to create. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've discussed some of the basic uses of the JavaScript language, we're going to jump right into seeing how to write and run some JavaScript code. Now, there are a few different ways to do this, and the first way that we're going to take a look at is running JavaScript inside the browser's terminal. All right, now, a big question that a lot of people ask me when they're getting started with JavaScript is, what do I need to download in order to run JavaScript code? And this question generally comes from uh, the idea that in order to run things like Java or C++, you actually need to download a compiler, which is usually integrated into an IDE of some sort, in order to run your code. But in JavaScript, many people are surprised to find you don't need anything other than a basic web browser to run JavaScript code. All right, so let's jump right in. What you're going to want to do is open up a browser. I highly recommend using an up-to-date version of Chrome, although other things like Edge or Firefox will work as well for these basic cases. And what you're going to want to do is open up the browser's inspector window. You can usually do that by right-clicking and going to inspect. That might be different for different browsers, uh, but it's going to be something like that. And once you have this inspector window open, that's what this little thing here is called. And by the way, you can usually uh, change the position of this by clicking this little three dot thing here and uh, selecting whether you want it on the side or on the bottom or as a separate window, you can do as well if you click this here. But I usually prefer to have it on the bottom just for running basic JavaScript because it's just easier to read than if you have it over on the side, okay? So once you have this open, you're going to want to go to console. And if this is your first time working in the browser console, basically what this allows you to do, it's sort of like a command prompt for the browser, right? So if you've ever worked in a terminal inside your computer and used that to do things like move files around, run certain commands, etc., that's essentially what this is for the browser that you're inside of. Now I'm going to zoom in here using Command Plus, although the hotkey might be a little different on your computer depending on the operating system. I'm on a Mac here. And what we're going to do is we're going to run a very simple command. We're going to say let x equal 5 and put a semicolon after that and we're going to hit enter. And then we're going to say x times 2. All right, now what we've done here, these two things that we've just typed in and run in the browser's console are valid JavaScript statements. 
All right, so just to go back to our command prompt or terminal metaphor, if you were running commands inside a terminal on a Mac, let's say, you would be running basic Linux commands. The terminal in a browser, however, wants you to run JavaScript statements. Now, when you run a JavaScript statement in the terminal here, it's going to show you the output of that statement. So what we did here, when we said let x equals five, this is how we declare variables in JavaScript. Now we'll talk in much more detail about how to declare variables in JavaScript and some of the sometimes peculiar details about doing that in JavaScript. But this is how you define a variable. We've defined a variable called x and assigned the value five to it. And what the console did is it printed out this undefined thing. Now, undefined basically just means that there was really no output from the command that you just ran. So while this command that we just ran did something behind the scenes by creating a new variable called x, it didn't actually have any output, which is why we see this undefined thing. All right, so that's all that this means right here is that there was really no return value, so to speak, of this expression above. And then what we did is we used the variable that we defined, which was called x, and we multiplied it by two. Now, if you're already familiar with programming concepts, just bear with me here. I'm well aware that these are pretty simple uh, demonstrations, but what I'm demonstrating here is more the idea of running JavaScript inside a console than the actual concepts of declaring and using variables. So anyway, what we've done here is we've multiplied our variable x by two, and we see that our statement actually has some output this time. It's printed out 10 to the console. And you know, if you wanted to run something else like x times 100, you would see the output there as well. And that's how you run JavaScript in your browser's terminal. All right, now if you wanna clear out your terminal, you can always click on this little clear console thing here, and that will clear your console for you. All right, now you might be wondering what you would want to run JavaScript in the console for, right? Why would you ever want to open this up and run JavaScript statements inside of here? Well, there's a few different reasons why you would wanna do that. One reason, which I actually use quite a lot, is to test out different JavaScript statements, right? So if I'm writing a particularly long and complicated JavaScript statement, or if I want to make sure that I understand how some kind of uh, built-in JavaScript function works, then usually what I'll do is I'll just open up my browser's console and run some JavaScript inside there to see if it works the way I think it does. All right, so if I were to type something a little more complicated like this, and don't worry too much about what this is doing right now, just know that this is all valid JavaScript. If I wanted to test and make sure that this statement worked the way I thought it did, I would just type it in as I did there and, and I would see the output down below. Now we'll talk much more about what's going on here later on when we learn more about JavaScript syntax. But anyway, that's the first main reason why you'd wanna use the console is just for demonstration as I'll be doing throughout this course and also just to test your knowledge of JavaScript syntax if you have a question about it before putting that in a program and hoping that it works. Now, the other reason that you might want to run code inside the console here is to manipulate the website that you're on, right? So let's say that you're on a website and a pop-up window shows up. Well, if you know the right JavaScript to run, you can actually use that to hide annoying uh, paywall pop-ups sometimes, depending, of course, on how the website is built. We're not gonna go into detail about that right now, but uh, that's just something to keep in mind, is that this allows you to actually manipulate the website that you're currently on, right? So you can find different HTML elements, you can manipulate their CSS, you can remove elements, etc. And that's really getting into the domain of vanilla JavaScript, right? Actually manipulating the DOM using JavaScript. And that's how to run JavaScript code inside the console, right? So we've run our first few pieces of JavaScript code. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've seen how to run basic JavaScript inside the browser's console. So let's move on to taking a look at two more different ways of running JavaScript code on the front end. Now, in general, these are going to be the ways that you're going to want to uh, write and run your JavaScript code since 
you know, this is where we actually build applications. Running JavaScript inside the browser's terminal, as we saw, is usually limited to just testing out little JavaScript statements if you're unsure of something or manipulating the page once it's already being displayed. So anyway, what we're going to do here is we're going to see how to write and run JavaScript in the context of an HTML file. Now, there are two main ways to do this depending on your preferences, all right? One way is to write your HTML file, right? So you're gonna have HTML with uh, all the different tags in there, a head tag, a body tag, uh, you know, different elements inside of there. And somewhere inside of there, you're gonna have some JavaScript that will be run automatically when that file is opened up in a browser. We'll see what that looks like in just a minute. But that's called inline scripts, okay? So they're just scripts that you write in the same file as your HTML. Now, the other way, and this is generally the way that you'll want to do things in bigger applications, is to define your HTML and your JavaScript in separate files and import your JavaScript into the HTML file uh, using a special tag that we'll see in just a minute here. So, you know, you'd have your HTML here and you'd have your JavaScript file over here. Both of these would have some code inside of here, right? The HTML would have a bunch of tags and somewhere inside of here, it would have a tag that tells the browser to import this JavaScript file and run all of its contents. All right, and this one we'll call external scripts. So those are the two main ways of writing and running JavaScript code in the browser, uh, you know, as actual files. So let's take a look and see what both of these are gonna look like. We'll start off with inline scripts here and then we'll move on to external scripts. Now, before we do this actually, uh, one question that you're inevitably going to have is what IDE or what editor should I use to write and run JavaScript code? Well. The fact is that there are a lot of options out there. Uh, the one that I'm going to recommend personally is Visual Studio Code. You can find that just by Googling Visual Studio Code download. Uh, but there are also some other ones such as Sublime is a popular one, Atom is a popular one, and of course you can use pretty much any text editor to write JavaScript code. Uh, but I like Visual Studio Code just because of all the features it's got, and frankly, I'm just used to working with it, as are many other JavaScript developers, so feel free to download and use Visual Studio Code. That's what I'm going to be doing here myself. So what we're going to do, first of all, is create this new file that we're going to be writing our JavaScript inside of. Now... Uh, what I'm going to recommend you do, first of all, is open up a terminal of some sort. Now, if you are using Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code actually has an integrated terminal, right? A terminal that you can just open up uh, as another pane inside this window. And you can do that by going to Terminal, New Terminal. And then what you'll see is you'll have this little terminal here, just like if you opened up the command prompt or terminal separately. All right, so in order to create our files, what we're going to do is just create a new folder here. So I'm going to say make directory, and we'll call this uh, JavaScript basics. And I'm going to hit enter, and then I'm going to change directories and go into that directory. All right, now these commands here are going to be different if you're using a different operating system such as Windows. Uh, basically, all that we're doing here is just creating a new directory and we're moving into that directory. Those are things that you can easily do just by opening up the files in their own window and right-clicking and doing new folder. But, you know, I usually prefer to do things this way. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open this in Visual Studio Code. And you can do that by running code and the directory that you want to open up in Visual Studio Code. Now, chances are, if you just opened up Visual Studio Code, that this actually won't work for you. So what you're going to want to do is open up what's called the Visual Studio Code command palette. And you can do that either with Command-Shift-P if you're on a Mac. I'm not sure what the equivalent would be on Windows, but you can always just find that by going up here to View and Command Palette. And that'll open up this little thing where you can type in different commands for Visual Studio Code in order to make certain changes. And in order to install this code command so that you can open up certain directories in Visual Studio Code just by running that command, you're gonna want to search for shell command. 
And you're going to click on this shell command install code command in path. And you may have to close Visual Studio Code and reopen it after that. But once you've done that, it should work. All right, so I'm going to run code dot, which will open up this JS Basics folder that we just created. And we should see that open up in a new IDE window. And you'll, and you'll see JS Basics here with nothing inside of the folder. Okay, so let's create the HTML file that we're going to be writing our JavaScript inside of. For that, we're just going to say new file. And we'll call this something like inline script.html, right? You can call it whatever you want. The name is not really important in this case. And then what we're going to do is just write some very basic HTML. We're going to say doc type HTML, and then we're going to have HTML tags along with head and body tags. All right, so head and body. And then inside the body, we're just going to display an H1 tag that says something like Hello, JavaScript. Okay, now, first of all, in order to open up this HTML file in your browser, uh, which we're gonna do just to make sure that everything's working here, all you need to do is right click on this file. You're gonna want to say copy path, which will give you the full path for this file in your file system. And then you're gonna wanna open that up in a browser and paste that inside the URL and hit enter and you should see hello JavaScript being displayed there. Now, we're not actually using any JavaScript to do this at this point, so let's head back and see how to do that. All right, now in order to write JavaScript inside an HTML file, you're gonna need to use the script tag. So the script tag, it just looks like this. You're generally gonna want to put it either inside the head or after all of your body content, depending on your exact needs with it, which we'll discuss later. And inside these script tags, you can basically write whatever JavaScript code you want, and that code will automatically be run as soon as you open up this HTML file. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do here is display what's called an alert. Now an alert is just a little window that pops down. You probably see it all the time on websites asking you to do things like enable notifications for that website or asking if you want to leave the website without saving changes, etc. So it's just a little window that's gonna pop down from here. And the way that we display that window in JavaScript, it's actually very simple, is we're just gonna say alert and put parentheses after it. We'll discuss what exactly this means later on. We're just, this alert thing is basically a function that we're calling for those of you who are already familiar with those concepts. And then inside here, we're going to have quotation marks. And these can either be single or double quotes. It's gonna make very little difference in our case here. And we'll just say something like, hello, all right? So what you're gonna see is if you go back now to your browser, and here I'm just gonna close this extra Visual Studio Code window that we had from before. And if you go back to the browser now and refresh, you have to refresh it in order for those changes to take place, by the way. What you're gonna see is this little alert window pop down with the message that we specified there displayed inside of it, right? It just says hello. And then when we click on okay, we'll see hello JavaScript appear. All right, so that's how to write and run basic JavaScript inside HTML files. Another thing that I wanna demonstrate here, I mentioned that this script tag could either be up here in the header or down here in the body. The reason that you would want to put the script tag inside the body, let me just show you that here, we'll say goodbye. Now the reason we might wanna do this is because quite often in JavaScript, we're gonna to want to interact with and manipulate elements inside our own site, right? So we might wanna change the text, let's say that's inside this H1 heading. And the problem with doing that is if we try and run that code up here inside the script in the header tag, this H1 heading won't actually exist at that point, right? So basically by putting the script down here at the bottom, it waits for everything else to run and render in the browser and that means that if we wanted to write some code that changed the text inside this H1 heading, the heading would already be there for us to manipulate. That's a finer point that we'll touch on much later on, so don't worry too much about it now. For the time being, just know that when you have inline JavaScript 
scripts, right, which we specify in between script tags, you can either have that in the header or in the body tag. Uh, and in the body tag, you'll want to have that, generally speaking, underneath all of the actual visual elements for the page. Not always, but generally speaking. So now that we've seen how to write inline JavaScript scripts, and these are very, very simplistic scripts. The point here is mainly just to show you the different ways that you can run JavaScript code. We're not really worrying right now about actual JavaScript syntax. The next thing that we're going to take a look at is how to write our JavaScript in an external file and import it into an HTML file. So let's create another HTML file here. We're going to say external script HTML. And then we're also going to create another file, which we'll call something like my script.js. All right, so JavaScript files almost always end with this .js suffix, and that just designates them as JavaScript file. And make sure that Visual Studio Code or whatever IDE that you're using knows what syntax highlighting to apply. All right, so what we're going to do is inside this myscript.js file that we just created, we're going to write some basic JavaScript. Now, instead of doing the alert thing, we're going to instead say console.log, and we'll say hello from an external script. All right, now you might be wondering what console.log does. If you don't already know, then we'll see once we import this file into our HTML and run it. So let's head over to external script.html now. And what we're gonna do, just uh, we're gonna specify a basic HTML file just like we did before with HTML, head and body. All right, so inside the body, we'll just have a basic h1 tag that says, hello, JavaScript. And then in order to import this myscript.js file and run it inside our HTML file here, what we're going to do is say script, right? So we still use that script tag, just like we did when we wanted to write an inline script in here. But instead of just closing this off and writing JavaScript inside of here, we're going to add an attribute to this script element and say source equals and then we'll say dot slash my script dot JS. All right, now what we're doing here, this source attribute tells our browser to, to import this JavaScript file and run its contents. So what you're gonna see is if you get the path for this external script dot HTML and go back to the browser and paste it in here, you're gonna see hello JavaScript again, and you're not going to see the alert because remember we did console.log instead of alert. So in order to see the message that we put inside console.log, you're gonna to want to open up the inspector window and go to console, all right? And then inside of there, you'll see hello from an external script. So console.log has the effect as we've seen of simply logging out a string inside the console here. And it's a very, very frequently used thing in JavaScript for doing things like debugging, right? If you're writing a large program, it can often be very helpful to log out the value of some variable to the console so that you can see what that variable's value is at one point in time. All right, so we've seen how to do internal scripts and external scripts in JavaScript. And we've also seen how to use this alert function and this console.log function to print out messages in different ways in the browser. All right, so I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so at this point, we've seen three different ways to write and run JavaScript code. We saw how to run JavaScript code in the browser console, and we've seen how to run it both in inline and external scripts in conjunction with HTML files. So the next thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to run JavaScript on the back end, right? Now I'm doing this because I realize that for many of you, your main motivation for learning JavaScript may well be to use it on the back end. So I'm gonna be showing you right now two different ways of running JavaScript code using Node.js. Now the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is actually download and install Node.js on your computer. 
And what you're going to want to do, first of all, is find out whether you already have those things installed, right? You may well already have them installed. And, and in that case, you may not need to download and install it as I'm going to show you. So the way that you're going to find out whether you have node installed is by typing node dash V in your terminal. And if you have node installed, what it will do is show you the current version of node that you have installed. Now, the version that I have here is almost up to date. The current version is actually 16.14 at the time of recording. At the time you're watching this, it's probably something higher. Um, but you're just going to want to make sure that you have a fairly up-to-date version, preferably V16 or higher as the first number. And the other thing that you're going to want to check as well is the version of NPM. Now, we haven't actually talked about what NPM is. Basically, NPM is a tool that you can use in conjunction with Node to install other people's code into your projects. We'll talk about this in much more detail later on. Uh, but for now, you're just going to want to run NPM-V. And if you have Node and NPM installed, you should see a version for that as well. Um, if you just see something like command not found, then that means you don't have it installed and you'll need to do the instructions I'm about to show you. So assuming that you don't have Node and NPM installed, what you're going to want to do is go to nodejs.org and you're going to want to download it. Now, on this page, there are two main options that you have for downloading Node.js. One is the long-term support version, and the other is what's called the current version. Now, for most people, right, as Node.js's website itself says, the long-term support version is going to be what's recommended, right? It says recommended for most users. So what I'm going to recommend you do is click on this button, which will download the package for installing Node.js, and... Once that's completed, you're going to want to click on that and it will walk you through the installer wizard. Now, if you are feeling more adventurous, I wouldn't recommend this right now, but if you ever want to work with the latest features of Node.js, uh, all you would need to do is just come in here and select the current version instead. And again, you're probably going to be seeing different versions of this than I am right now because chances are versions will have advanced quite a bit since I recorded this, but everything that I'm about to show you will still work exactly the same way. All right, so let's click on the installer that we just downloaded. And what that's going to do is open up the installer wizard. We're just going to click on continue, continue, agree, and install. And what that will do is it'll probably ask you for your password. So I'm going to enter mine there. And then what we're going to see is it'll just install everything for us. It usually takes, you know, a few seconds max. And then of course, uh, depending on your operating system, you're going to want to follow the directions that it displays here. I've already done that myself, so I'm not gonna do that again. And we're just gonna click on close, all right? So now that we've installed Node.js, we should be able to go back to our terminal here and we may want to close it and reopen it just, just to restart the terminal. Oops, it looks like we need to click on the trash can button instead. And then we'll open up a new one here. And now what should happen is if we run Node-V, we should see that we have the latest version that we saw inside here, right? The long-term support version that is displayed there. And if you run npm-v, you may see a different version there as well. Now, npm is actually bundled with Node. So by installing Node, as we just did, you're going to have access to npm as well, right? You don't need to install that as a separate thing. Okay, so now that we've installed Node.js and NPM locally, I'm going to show you how to run backend JavaScript code using Node. Now, now I just want to preface this by saying that in general, JavaScript syntax is going to be the same between the front end or the back end. But obviously, there's going to be specific things that you'll only be able to do on Node or things you'll only be able to do on the front end. An example of that might be something like manipulating elements on the front end, which obviously you would be able to do on the back end because on the back end you're just on a server right there's nothing visible to manipulate and on the server that would be something like uh, moving files around or connecting to a database okay so there's going to be different tasks that you perform depending on whether you're on the front end or the back end but but the actual javascript syntax you're going to be working with will generally be the same all right so we saw earlier how to run JavaScript code in the browser's console. And as a matter of fact, Node 
also has a console of its own. The way that you get to that console is simply by typing node inside your terminal and hitting enter. And what that will do is it'll open up what's called a read evaluate print loop, an REPL for you where you can just type in JavaScript statements and see them evaluated. So we're just gonna use the same example that we did inside our browser's terminal. We're gonna say let x equal five. And we'll hit enter, we'll see that same undefined output there, which just means that there was no output from this statement. And then we're gonna say x times two, and hit enter, and we'll see that that prints out 10, right? You can do the same thing by saying x times 500. Now, you may have noticed earlier that when I ran x times two in the browser, I didn't run it with a semicolon. And that's because in JavaScript, the semicolon at the end of lines is optional. Right? Unlike in languages like Java, where you have to have that semicolon or it'll give you an error, in JavaScript we can either add it or leave it off. Although in general, I always recommend adding it because it just makes sure that your code is going to be interpreted correctly. Okay, so anyway, that's how you run JavaScript code inside the node terminal. This can be very useful if you just wanna test out a given JavaScript expression to see if it works the way you think it does, uh, just like we saw on the front end. Okay, so let's exit this read evaluate print loop by hitting control C and we're gonna have to hit it twice in, or in order to exit. And then we'll type clear to clear the terminal. So the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is how to run JavaScript code in Node.js by writing it in a separate file. All right, so just like we were able to write separate JavaScript files and run them on the front end by simply importing them uh, using this script source thing that we saw earlier. On the back end, we're able to do the same thing. And to do that, what we'll do is just say new file. We'll say node script.js. And inside here, we'll say something like let x equals five, let y equals, I don't know, 12, right? You can pick whatever numbers you want here. And then what we'll do is say console.log. And we'll say the sum is and we'll put a colon there, and then we'll say in parentheses x plus y. We'll talk about why we had to put parentheses there in just a minute, but now that we've written this very simple node script, the way we can run this is by opening up our terminal and typing node, and then specifying the name of the file we wanna run. So I'm gonna say dot slash node script dot js and hit enter, and we'll see that it says the sum is 17. And this dot slash is optional too, by the way. You can just say node, node script.js. The dot slash just makes it clear that it's inside the current directory. All right, so that's how you run specific JavaScript files in Node.js. And one thing that you're gonna notice is that the console.log that we saw earlier on the front end, all right, when we wrote inside my script.js console.log, hello from an external script, we saw that this logged out this message here to the browser's console, right? Now in Node.js, if you say console.log, as we've seen, it's going to log that out right underneath where you run the script, okay? So again, this can be a very useful way to troubleshoot Node programs. You can use it to see the value of different variables at different times. You can use it to check if a given piece of code is getting called. It's really just a useful troubleshooting tool and it's also used in scripts that are meant to have some kind of output to communicate to the user, right? Like if we wanted to write a web server, which we'll learn how to do later on, you'd wanna use console.log with a message saying something like the web server is now up and running, right? In order to tell whoever's running that script that everything went as expected and the script is successfully run. All right, so that's how to run code in Node.js. And just to be clear, the code that we wrote inside myscript.js, we can run that as well by simply saying node myscript.js and hitting enter, and we'll see hello from an external script printed out to the console. So there are going to be a lot of cases where the JavaScript code you write can be run either on the front end or on the back end. Although as you start to actually write full stack applications with JavaScript, the different duties of the front end and back end are gonna to start to diverge. Right, the front end will generally be doing more DOM manipulation and the back end will be doing things, as I said, like working with files, connecting to databases and so on. But that's just something I wanted to point out in case you were wondering, yes, we can run 
this front end script from the back end as well. So just to review here, we saw several different ways of running JavaScript code. One was inside the browser's terminal. All right, so uh, in order to do that, you're just gonna wanna open up the inspector window, open up console, and you can run whatever JavaScript you want right here. Next, we saw how to run JavaScript from inside an inline script that we write in our HTML. We saw that as soon as we loaded this HTML file, it ran whatever JavaScript it found inside these script tags. After that, we saw how to run JavaScript using an external script, right? So we wrote our JavaScript and HTML in separate files and imported the JavaScript into our HTML file in order to run it. And just like with the inline scripts, we saw that this automatically ran all of the JavaScript as soon as we opened up the HTML file. And then we moved on to the back end and saw how to run JavaScript code inside a Node.js read evaluate print loop by simply typing node. Right? And then we could run whatever JavaScript we wanted inside of here. And we also saw how to run JavaScript code written inside files with Node by saying Node and then the name of the file. So nodescript.js, and that runs whatever code is inside. All right, so those ways are really the main ways that you're gonna be running JavaScript code for the foreseeable future, right? I'm gonna be using this in different examples depending on the exact situation, but sometimes I'll be showing examples in the browser console. Sometimes I'll be writing them in separate files. Sometimes I'll be writing them in as inline scripts in HTML. It's really gonna depend on the situation. But what we've seen here, at least while you're learning the basics of JavaScript, is going to constitute the vast majority of situations where we'll need to run JavaScript. So. Anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. When picking up a new programming language like JavaScript, one thing that you can do that will really increase the speed at which you end up mastering that language is to really dig deep into that programming language's syntax. So what we're gonna be doing in this section is just that, right? We're gonna be taking a look at JavaScript syntax, how to do things like declare variables in JavaScript, which actually isn't as straightforward as it sounds. And we're also gonna be seeing some of the basic control structures in JavaScript, such as if statements and loops, of which there are many different types. So without further ado, let's jump right in and learn the basics of JavaScript syntax. All right, so to get started here, let's talk about some of the most basic syntax concepts in JavaScript. Now, to demonstrate this, I'm gonna be using Node.js, so we're just gonna be writing all of our JavaScript code inside a .js file and running it using Node.js, so you'll wanna make sure you have Node.js and NPM installed. Uh, if you don't already, just go to nodejs.org and download the long-term support LTS version, and you should be good. So anyway, what I'm gonna do here for the demonstration, let's start off by creating an empty directory, which I'll just call something like JS syntax, and then we'll open that up inside our IDE. And if you're using Visual Studio Code like I am, you can open that by saying change directories, JS syntax, and then you can simply say code dot, and hit enter and that will open it up inside Visual Studio Code for you. Now, if you don't have Visual Studio Code set up to do that, you're gonna wanna take a look at my previous section on just the basics of JavaScript where I walk you through that process. But otherwise, you can just open that up by going to File Open and finding this folder. So anyway, let's start off here, as I said, by creating a new file and I'm just gonna call this file something like syntax basics. Dot JS. The name of this file doesn't really matter as long as you remember to fill in the name of this file when we actually run it. So first of all, let's talk about some of the very basic concepts I said of JavaScript syntax. The first thing that we're gonna cover is declaring variables. Now declaring variables in JavaScript, there are actually three main ways of doing this. All right, the first way is by using the var keyword, right? Var in JavaScript just declares a new variable. And then after that, you can name your variable whatever you want. So we could name this x, we could name it my variable, we could name it uh, 
not my variable if you wanted, and whatever we call it, that's going to be the name of our variable. It's going to work pretty much the same way as variables work in any other programming language. All right, now, something you should know about variable names in JavaScript. Uh, usually, variable names are going to be camel case, like what you see here. So, lowercase letter at the beginning, and then an uppercase letter at the beginning of each new word. Snake case names, where you do things like my underscore variable, those are valid in JavaScript, but personally, I don't see those used very often, and when I do see them, I usually assume that the person is coming to JavaScript from PHP. So anyway, while this is acceptable, I usually see camel case in pretty much every JavaScript program that I look at. All right, now, there are other characters uh, like a dash, for example, that aren't allowed in JavaScript variable names. And again, this is probably going to be similar to what you're used to with other programming languages. Uh, you know, you can't put exclamation points in the variable name. You can't uh, put question marks. Pretty much, pretty much anything besides just your regular characters and underscores, you know, specific characters like that are not going to be valid in variable names. All right. So anyway, once you've said var followed by the variable name, you're going to usually put an equal sign and the value of that variable that you want to assign to it. So we could say seven, or we could have a string saying something like hello, or we could have you know a Boolean like true or false. There's lots of different data types in JavaScript, and that's something that we'll discuss elsewhere. Um, but basically, that's how you assign a value to a variable. Okay, now I said that there were three ways of declaring variables in JavaScript, and this is just the first one using the var keyword. The second way of declaring variables in JavaScript is going to be using the let keyword, right? So you might say let my other variable equals, and then you could assign any value that you wanted to this. I'm just going to pick seven. And the next question that comes up after this is what's the difference between these two keywords, right? What's the difference between using var and let? Well, the main difference between these two things comes down to what's called scoping, right? So variables declared with var are what are called function scoped. And we're not going to go too much into detail about this right now. We'll talk about it later on, perhaps. Uh, because it's a little bit too much up front for many of you. But basically what this means is that the scope of the variable, right, where the variable can be accessed from is determined by what function it's declared inside of. Whereas variables declared with the let keyword are what are called block scoped. Now, again, we're going to discuss this in more detail later on, but basically block scoped variables are what you're used to in other programming languages, right? Assuming that you've used another programming language like Java or Python or C++ or whatever other language you've used, chances are the variables in that language have been block scoped, which means that variable access, right? Where you can actually refer to those variables is determined by uh, the nearest block, right? So in JavaScript, that's going to be denoted by these curly braces as we'll discuss shortly. So anyway, var is function scoped, let is block scoped. And what I'm gonna recommend for the time being is that you always use the let keyword. Again, since block scoped variables are gonna be what you're already used to working with. And as we'll see later on, there are quite a few situations where using function scoped variables doesn't really work the way that you would expect it to. Right, so from now on, we're only going to use let. I'm just going to use let to declare pretty much every variable in JavaScript, and that's what I recommend you do as well. All right, so just uh, to add some notes next to these, we'll say function scoped, and we'll say block scoped for this. I'm just gonna make you a little cheat sheet here. Perhaps I'll make this accessible on GitHub. So those are two of the main ways to declare variables in JavaScript. The third way, which you should never ever use, or very rarely anyway, I've never had a reason to use this personally, is by declaring global variables. And declaring a global variable is pretty straightforward. You just say the name of the variable, right? So global variable, and then you say equals and then you can say something like, I'm global, and that's that. So 
I mention this because it's particularly confusing for Python developers or developers coming from any language where this is just how you declared normal variables because this does work in JavaScript. This will declare a variable for you and in many situations you can even do this by accident and you won't notice it until some very strange bug starts happening way down the line. So. Anyway, this is a global variable, and basically what that means is that it will be accessible from anywhere else in your JavaScript program, no matter where you've declared it, right? So this could be declared inside a function, let's say, and you'd be able to access it outside of the function. We'll discuss this in more detail later on as well, but uh, this is a global variable. We'll just say global scoped, and I'm going to emphasize here that you should never use this. Okay, and for block scoped, we'll say use this. Cool, so those are the three main ways to declare variables in JavaScript, and really there's only one main way that I'm gonna want you to do so, and that's using the let keyword. And another thing that you might have noticed is that as I've been adding notes to the code here, I've been using this double slash, right? Now the double slash in JavaScript, you've probably seen this in many other languages such as Java or C++. This is just how you denote comments in JavaScript. So essentially uh, on the same line, nothing coming after this double slash will be run. All right, and if you wanna do a multi-line comment, right? These things only work on a single line. If you wanna do a multi-line comment, again, this is gonna be similar to some other languages out there, like I believe Java does this. Uh, you can just have a slash and then an asterisk, followed by an asterisk and a slash, and anything in between those two will be a comment. All right, so single line comment, multi-line comment, pretty straightforward. You've probably seen this at some point in some other programming language that you've worked with, all right? Cool, so now that we've seen how to declare variables, another thing that you might have noticed is that there's not really any indicator when we declare these variables of what type the variable is, right? So in other languages such as Java, you might say something like int x equals seven, signifying that this variable contains an integer value, or you, know, you might see something like string my string equals hello. And that would signify, of course, that my string contains a string value. But in JavaScript, everything is just declared with the same keyword, right? And that's going to be this let keyword, which I'm actually going to put up at the top here, just so you know that that's the one you should be using. All right, and I'll rename this as well to my variable and my other variable, just to keep things in order. All right, so anyway, when we declare a variable with let or var or even a global variable, but again, you should only be using let, you can basically determine what type that variable is by whatever value you assign to it, right? So if you assign a number to it, it's gonna be a number. If you assign a string to it, it's gonna be a string. If you assign a Boolean to it, it's gonna be a Boolean. So the value that you assign to the variable is going to determine the type of the variable. And this is actually something that's referred to as dynamic typing, all right? So JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. And this is in contrast to statically typed languages like Java or C++ or really anything where you declare a variable with a specific type keyword. And, and what this also means is that you can change the type of a variable by simply assigning a new value to it of a different type. All right, so while we've assigned the value seven to my variable up at the top here, we could later on say something like my variable equals hello. And that would change the type of my variable. All right, so JavaScript is dynamically typed because the variables that we declare aren't restricted to the type that they start out as, right? They can change throughout the course of a program. All right, so the last thing that I wanna cover here is declaring constants in JavaScript. Constants are basically just variables that you can't change the value of, right? They represent a concrete, unchanging value in the program. So you might say something like const pi equals 3.14159, however precise you want to get. And throughout the rest of the program, you won't be able to change the value of this, right? If you try and say pi equals 4, it won't let you do that. You'll end up with an error. All right, so that's how you declare constants in JavaScript. 
So the takeaway here is that in JavaScript, you're usually gonna be using either let or const, depending on whether you wanna be declaring a variable or a constant. And one thing that I wanna point out as well is that in JavaScript, you're gonna to tend to see this const keyword used a lot more than you might in other languages. Right, and the reason for that is that JavaScript developers, in my experience, tend to be big fans of functional programming, myself included, where basically when you declare a variable in your program, the value of that variable isn't going to change. Now, I'm not gonna go into any more detail on that right now because quite frankly, that is a very deep topic to go into, but I just wanted to point out that in JavaScript, especially if you're looking on like Stack Overflow, let's say, for examples, you're going to see const used a lot more than you might have in other languages. So anyway, that's how to declare variables in JavaScript, and we've also seen how to write single line and multi-line comments. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen the basics of declaring variables and constants in JavaScript, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is if statements in JavaScript. Assuming that you've already worked with if statements in some other programming language, they're going to look very similar to what you're probably used to. So I'm just gonna show you right now what they look like and I'll discuss some of the finer details uh, after that. So anyway, if statements in JavaScript are obviously going to start with if, and then they're gonna be followed by parentheses with some kind of condition inside of it, right? So you might say, if pi is less than four, right? And then they're going to be followed by curly braces, right? An opening brace and a closing brace. And inside here is going to be the body of the if statement that will only be executed if this condition here is true. All right, so if you wanted to say something like console.log, yes, pi is less than four, then that would work just fine. You would see if you were to run this program that this console.log statement would be executed. And in fact, let's just do this here for fun. We're just gonna say node syntax basics.js and run this and we'll see of course that that was printed. And just as a reminder, this is how you run JavaScript files using node.js. All right, so, Anyway, that's an if statement in JavaScript. And of course, as in other languages, if statements in JavaScript allow you to add an else block. Now this else block is going to be executed. Whatever you put inside of it will be executed if this condition here is false. All right, so in this case, we'd wanna say something like console log, nope, pi is greater than or equal to four. All right, and of course, in this situation, this would never be executed because pi is less than four, but that's the point of an else block, is basically to be the plan B, so to speak, of whatever we put inside of here in case that condition is false. Of course, just like in other languages, uh, you're gonna also have an else if block. Now the else if block, which is gonna look like this, we'll say else if pi is equal to four, all right, and then we'll close it off like that. The else if block, basically this contains its own condition and this condition will only be evaluated if the original condition in the if block was false, right? So in other words, if this was false, then JavaScript would go to the next one here in else if, it would take a look at this to see if it's true. And if this was true, then it would execute whatever is inside of here, right? So we'd wanna say, pi is equal to four, okay? And if this does happen to be false, then it will go to the next block, which in this case is an else block, and it would execute whatever is inside of here, right? So in this case, we would say pi is greater than four. Now it's also possible to have multiple else if blocks, right? You could have else if pi is equal to five, and in here you could have something else like pi is equal to five, of course. And here I forgot the uh, semicolons there. And you can have as many else if blocks as you want, although 
if you start having too many of them and you're checking specific values as we're doing here, that's when you would want to probably use a switch case statement, which we'll talk about later on. So anyway, that's what a basic if statement and all of its other blocks look like in JavaScript. Again, this is probably something that you're used to if you have experience with another language like Java or C++. And, uh, you know, it's really nothing out of the ordinary. Another thing to keep in mind, though, and you will see this from time to time in JavaScript, is that if the body of an if statement, right, one of these blocks is only one line, we can actually leave these curly braces off, right? So in our situation here, we could say if, else if, and then we could just remove all of those curly braces if we wanted to, and everything would work just the same way. Now, the problem with this, and the reason that I don't recommend ever doing it, even though it saves us a little bit of code, right, a few characters here and there, is that this can cause some syntax problems later on down the road, right? So let's say that someone comes along and they wanna add another statement for one of these cases, right? Let's say that in addition to saying no pi is greater than four down here in the else block, we wanna say console.log hello, I'm in the else block. Okay, well, what we're gonna see if we run this code now, and I'll just scroll down a little bit so that you can see it, is that if we run this, we know that the if statement is true, right? We know that pi is less than four, so this should be the only thing that gets executed out of the entire if block, right? However, what we're gonna see if we run node syntax basics is that in addition to seeing yes, pi is less than four, we're also gonna see hello, I am in the else block. And that's because in leaving off the curly braces from all of these statements here, we've accidentally added console.log to the main portion of our program instead of, as it would appear, to the else block, right? So what we just did here would be equivalent in JavaScript to if we were to add these things back and say console.log pi is greater than four, right? It would be equivalent to doing this and having this just outside the if block altogether. So that's where things can get a little bit confusing when you leave the curly braces off of statements like this. So I really recommend that you add them. And the same thing is gonna be true for loops in JavaScript as well. So um, anyway, even though they might be ugly and you might be searching for an opportunity to get rid of them no matter what, I highly recommend putting the curly braces on your if statements, loops, etc. in JavaScript just because it makes it less prone to error and it makes it a little more visually obvious what things should be grouped together in a JavaScript program. So let's add those things back. I'm just gonna go back here and undo everything that I did before. And now if we run this again, we should see node syntax basics.js, we'll see only yes pi is less than four printed out to the console. All right, now one more thing I wanna point out with if statements in JavaScript is something that we'll go into much more detail on later on when we talk about Boolean variables in JavaScript. And that is the fact that the if statement, the condition that we put here, doesn't actually have to be a Boolean statement. Right now, in other languages, again, like Java or C++, the statement that you put inside of this if statement parentheses has to be a Boolean, right? So it has to evaluate to a Boolean value, either true or false. In JavaScript, however, that's not a restriction, right? So you could just say if pi, and what that would actually do is check to see if pi is equal to some other value than zero, right? Zero in JavaScript, as we'll end up seeing, is going to be what's called falsy, right? In other words, in situations such as an if statement, it will behave as if it's the Boolean value false. Again, that's something that we'll talk about later, so don't worry about it too much right now. That's just something else I wanted to point out with if statements in JavaScript. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've covered variables and if statements in JavaScript, the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is how JavaScript loops work. So basically, whenever you want to repeat a given piece of code, what's the way that you would go about doing that in JavaScript? Well, 
As a matter of fact, JavaScript has a fair number of different ways for doing loops. And just to give you an idea of what those are, first of all, you have the basic for loop. Now this is gonna be similar to what you would see in things like Java, right? where you say for and then in parentheses and you declare your variable, you have the semicolon, you have the condition here, you have another semicolon and, and you have an expression for incrementing this variable over here, right? Any of you who have worked with this before, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who have maybe come from Python, uh, just be glad that you don't know about this because this is probably the ugliest way of doing for loops in JavaScript. All right, so that's one way of doing it, and that's the first way that we'll be taking a look at in just a minute here. The second way of doing it is using what's called a for of loop, right? And there's also an alternative to this called the for in loop, and they're used in different situations, which I'll discuss when we get there. Basically, this is just the syntactically improved, is syntactically a word? I'm not sure. Syntactically improved version of the for loop up here, and it's used specifically for looping through arrays or objects. And we haven't talked about arrays or objects yet, but just know that this is, uh, it's a better looking version of a for loop. It makes it easier to work with than this nasty thing up here that we'll talk about as well. All right, so that's really the second way of doing loops in JavaScript. The third way of doing loops is by using something called for each. Now this one's a little bit more advanced because it's actually a function that you can call on JavaScript arrays. We'll see what that looks like in just a minute here. But anyway, this one is usually considered to be pretty usable as well, along with for of and for in. All right, now, in addition to the for loops, what I would refer to as the sort of for group here, we also have another group of loops, which are referred to as while loop. Um, so you're gonna see there's two main ones here. Uh, the first one is going to be the basic while loop. And this is again, probably very similar to what you've seen in other languages uh, that have a while loop. It, basically just provides you with a way of executing some piece of code over and over and over and over again for as long as some condition is true. We'll take a look at the syntax for that shortly, but uh, it's, it's probably gonna be what you're used to if you've worked with another language that has a while loop in it. And finally, similar to the while loop, we also have a do while loop. And this one, we'll take a look at the difference between the two of them here, but it really just provides another way to get that repetitive functionality um, until some condition changes. So anyway, that's the while group of loops here. So we have the for loops and the while loops. Let's start talking about each of these in a little more detail. So let's start off here with the ugly for loop and uh, for those of you who haven't worked with this yet, those of you who are coming from a language like Python that's very clean, this one is going to make you probably feel a little bit nauseous, so I apologize in advance. Um, it's going to look like this. Basically, what we're going to do is say for, this is gonna be followed by parentheses, and inside those parentheses, there's going to be three main statements. The first statement is going to be declaring the counter variable for this for loop, right? So basically we're gonna use this variable to make sure we loop through this loop, uh, you know, a certain number of times. So usually we call it something like I, and we'll start off by setting it equal usually to zero or one or some other number, right? Usually zero from what I've seen. So that's the first statement that we put inside of there. The second one is going to be the condition for the for loop, right? So in other words, the for loop is going to repeat as long as this condition is true. So if we wanted this loop to go through 10 times, we would say something like i is less than 10. And what this does is after the loop completes, JavaScript is going to check this expression again to make sure that it's still true. If it is true, it'll execute the loop again. Otherwise, it will stop and it will continue on after the for loop. All right, we'll see what that looks like in just a minute here. And the last statement that we're gonna put inside this for loop is going to be the incrementing statement. So what that's gonna look like is we're just gonna say i equals i plus one, right? So in this case, we're telling JavaScript that we want to increment i by one every time this loop completes, right? So this will be executed after the loop completes. 
And over time, it will make it so that the loop stops because I will get to be 10 or greater. All right, so this is, again, the ugly way of doing loops. I'm sorry, again, for those of you who are Python programmers. Uh, just count yourselves lucky that you've never had to deal with this. So basically what this is going to do is it's going to execute whatever we put inside these curly braces, right? So for loops have curly braces, just like if statements in JavaScript. It's going to execute whatever code is inside here 10 times, just because of the way we have this set up. So what we're going to do is we're going to say console.log, and what we'll do is we'll say i is, and then we'll add the value of i onto the end of it, just like that. So what this will do if we run our code by saying node syntax basics.js, we'll see that it says i is zero, i is one, i is two, all the way through i is nine, at which point this condition that we specified here in the middle is no longer going to be true, and JavaScript will continue on after the for loop. All right, so that's the ugly for loop. One way that this is often used is to loop through arrays in JavaScript. Now, we haven't actually talked about arrays in JavaScript yet, and um, I actually want to go into much more detail on this later on. But for now, just know that arrays in JavaScript are gonna look something like this. We're gonna say const my array, right? Notice that I'm using const here because I'm not planning on changing my array. And we're gonna specify an array in JavaScript by using square brackets, and inside here we can put a few different items separated by commas, right? And they don't even have to be the same type in JavaScript, so it could be hello, goodbye, hello again, goodbye again. All right, we'll just use that as an example here. Now, if you wanted to use this ugly for loop to loop through this array and display all of the messages inside of it, what you could do is you would simply have to use this i to index the array. So in other words, you'd use this i to access elements at specific positions in the array. Again, we're gonna go into much more detail on this elsewhere, but for now, just know that it looks like this. We're gonna say console.log my array, and then inside square brackets, we'll say i, right? So in other words, what this is gonna do is it's going to access the ith element in the array. Right, so if i is zero, it'll access the zeroth element, because just like in most other programming languages, arrays start their indices at zero. All right, and instead of having i less than 10, we're gonna want i to be less than four, right? Because as soon as i is equal to four, we've already exceeded the length of the array in JavaScript, which is something, again, that we'll talk about in more detail elsewhere. So anyway, what this'll do, as you'll see, is if we run our code now, by saying node syntax basics.js, it'll successfully loop through all of the elements in our array and print them out to the console, right? So we see hello, goodbye, hello again, goodbye again, and that's that. Now, even though this for loop works in JavaScript, as I've said, it's generally not the go-to for loop simply because it's ugly and it's error prone, right? Um, for many of you, you may have found yourselves wondering why this was four and not three, or whether we could say i is less than or equal to three instead. Really, it's just a confusing way to have to go about doing loops when all you want is to loop through all of the pieces of data in an array. So what JavaScript actually provides us with is another for loop called the for of loop. And it's going to look something like this. We're going to say for let message of my array. And then we're gonna have curly braces. Now, what this will do for us is it will repeatedly execute whatever's inside these curly braces for each item, right? For each element in whatever array we're referencing here, right? So if my array has four elements in it, as ours does here, then it's going to execute whatever's inside these curly braces that many times. Now, message, this is basically just a variable that we're declaring again each time that the loop executes, and each time it will represent a different element in the array, right? So the first time that this executes, it'll be this element, the second time it'll be this one, the third time it'll be this one, the fourth time it'll be this one. Okay, so essentially what we can do if we wanted to do something equivalent to what we did here in our ugly for loop, we could just say console.log message 
And that's going to be the same thing. And as you can see, it's much easier to read than what we had up here, right? It's uh, much more clear what's going on in this for loop than what we had up here. So anyway, if we run this again, and by the way, I'm just going to comment out this ugly for loop so that we don't have all of those console logs happening in the console when we run this one. What we're going to see if we run this is the same output that we had before with what is, in my opinion, a much simpler and uh, prettier syntax. All right. Now, when I mentioned the for of loop, I said that there was also a variant called the for in loop. All right. Now, the for in loop is similar to the for of loop, but instead of looping through elements in a JavaScript array, it's used to loop through properties of a JavaScript object. Now, again, we haven't learned about JavaScript objects yet, and that's something that I want to discuss in much more detail elsewhere. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here on how that works. But just to give you an idea of what JavaScript objects look like, I'm going to say const my object equals... And we'll say something like name, Sean, hair color, brown, and beard, true. All right. That's usually true for me anyway. I usually have a beard. So anyway, this is an object, and it's basically just properties, which each have their own name, and the values for each of those properties. So this is what you might refer to as a hash map in other languages or a map or a dictionary. There's different words for this in most other programming languages, but in JavaScript, this is called somewhat deceptively, as we'll find out later on, an object. All right. Now, a for in loop is similar to a for of loop, but again, it loops through the properties, that's these, of an object. So let's see what that looks like. What we're going to do is say for, and then we'll say let property in my object. And what this is going to do is very similar to what we saw up here, except that this property thing is going to be the name of each of these properties respectively, right? So the first time it's executed, it's going to be this property, right? So it's literally going to be the string name. The second time it's going to be the string hair color. And the third time it's going to be the string beard. And we can actually see this by saying console.log property. All right, and again, I'm going to comment out this for loop that we had up here above this, just so that we can see this in action without getting all of these things printed out again. So let's run node syntax basics.js again. And what we'll see, as I said, is name, hair color, and beard printed out. Now, if you want to actually access the values of these properties inside the for in loop, the way that you can do that is by actually using this property string to access the property's value on my object. And what that looks like, again, we're going to go into this in much more detail later on, uh, but for now, I'll just show you directly. We're going to say my object, and then in square brackets, we're going to say property, right? So that'll basically get the property property of my object. So it'll get the name property, the hair color property, the beard property, etc. So if we run this again, what we're going to see is that it'll give us Sean, Brown, and True, right? That's the respective values that we had inside this object. All right, and if you wanted to display both of those things together, you could say property plus, and then you could have a string with a colon there. And then you could say plus again. And what that would do is it will display the actual property name along with the property value. So we'll say node syntax basics.js, and we'll see name, Sean, hair color, brown, beard, true. All right, pretty straightforward, right? So that's the for in loop. And again, it's used to loop through the properties in a JavaScript object. We'll cover JavaScript objects in much, much more detail as we go through learning the basics of JavaScript. This has been a very, very brief introduction to it. Uh, but that's what for in and for of loops are used for, is to loop through arrays and objects respectively. Okay, so I'm going to comment out this for in loop, and let's move on to the next method of looping in JavaScript, and that is using the for each function. Now, the for each function in JavaScript, the syntax here might freak you out a little bit, but don't worry about it too much right now. We'll go into much more detail on what exactly is going on later when we talk about arrays in more detail. So what it looks like is you need to reference an array, right? So we'll reference our my array up here. And you're going to say my array dot for each, right? So what this is doing is it's calling this for each function on this array, 
right? My array. And what we do is in between these parentheses after for each, we're gonna say X, and then we're gonna have this little arrow thing that we create using an equal sign and a greater than sign. And after that, we're gonna say console.log and we'll say X, all right? So what's going on here is when we say my array dot for each, this is going to execute the code in between these parentheses one time for each element in the array, just like we saw with the for of loop. And each time this X is going to be a different element in the array, right? So first time it's executed, it's gonna be this one. Second time it's gonna be this one. Third time it's gonna be this one and so on and so forth, right? Same as our for of loop. Now X, this is actually just a variable name that we can choose ourselves. So if we wanted to say message like we did up here in the for of loop, we could do that as well. We would just have to change this to message and console.log message and that would work as well, right? So if you wanna run this again, just to see that it works, we're gonna say node syntax basics.js. And sure enough, you'll see hello, goodbye, hello again, goodbye again. And that's how the for each works. Again, this is actually a pretty complicated thing that's going on here because this that you see here is actually a JavaScript function. But again, that's something we'll discuss in much more detail elsewhere. So don't worry about it right now, just know that this will have the same effect as a for of loop. All right, so that pretty much covers all of the major for loops in JavaScript. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've covered all of the major for loops in JavaScript. So let's move on now to the while loops in JavaScript. While loops in JavaScript are different than for loops because whereas for loops are usually meant to be executed a specific number of times, right? Usually what we wanna do with for loops is loop through all of the elements in an array, or as we saw with the for in loop, we wanted to loop through all of the properties in an object. With while loops, we want that logic to be repeated pretty much until some condition is no longer true. So this might be the case if you're searching through an array for some value, let's say, or it might be the case if you want to create a game in JavaScript, let's say that should keep running until the game is over. All right, those are just two examples of where you might wanna use these kinds of loops. So the first one is just the basic while loop. And what it looks like is this, we're just gonna say while, and then inside these parentheses, you're going to have some kind of condition, right? So uh, just for the sake of example here, what I'm gonna do is declare a new variable, which we'll call X, and I'm gonna set X equal to zero. All right, now the condition here that you might have in your while loop is that it should loop until X is equal to some number, right? Let's just say uh, five, all right? So what we would do is we would say X is less than five, and then inside the body of this while loop, which again is denoted using curly braces, same as with for loops and if statements, we would want to do some kind of logic. So maybe we're just gonna say console.log looping. And then of course, in order to prevent an infinite loop, we would want to push this variable in the direction of stopping this loop, right? So we might say x is equal to x plus one. All right, which would increment X for every loop. So if we run this now, we'll just do node syntax basics.js, we'll see that it loops through five times. It says looping, 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 looping. And once X is equal to five, X is no longer less than five, so the while loop is done. Now, if you're seeing some similarity between this while loop here and the for loop that we had up at the top, that's no coincidence, right? Basically, what you're seeing inside this ugly for loop is declaring the variable, which we did here with X. We're checking the condition, which we did here inside the while loops parentheses, and we have incrementing the variable, which we did down here at the bottom of the while loop. So in other words, both of these things here, the for loop and this form of the while loop anyway, are doing pretty much the same thing. Now the while loop has a bit of an advantage because it's able to work in situations where, as I said before, we don't quite know how many times we want it to loop through. As would be the case in knowing whether, let's say a game of virtual chess would be over. 
In that case, we would say something like while game should continue. All right, and then it would just keep looping until one of the players won. All right, so anyway, that's the while loop. The other loop inside the while group is going to be the do while loop. Now the do while loop looks something like this. We're just gonna say do, and that's gonna be followed by curly braces, which contain the body of the loop. And after that, we're gonna say while, and here's where we're going to specify the condition by saying something like x is less than five, right? So the main difference between the do while loop and the while loop is that the do while loop will always be executed at least once. Right, so let's just check this by setting x equal to five. If we were to do the same thing inside our do while loop that we did inside our while loop, we'll just say console.log looping, all right, and then increment x by saying x is equal to x plus one. Well, in that case, do while loop is going to execute at least once, even if this condition here is false, right? So if x is 100, then this while loop isn't going to execute at all, and this do while loop will execute once and then stop. And you can see this if you comment out this while loop and run the code. We'll see that it says looping, which is coming from our do while loop. And if we change this around, right, if we uncomment this while loop and comment out the do while loop, we'll see that nothing will be printed out from the while loop because it simply won't even loop through once. All right, so the do while loop is used in situations where you know that you want the code to be executed at least once, right? So you might wanna do something like connect to a database inside of here, right? Where you would say uh, something like connect to database. And then if that's successful, you'd wanna have a variable that you'd call something like is connected and you would just wanna say, well, is not connected, right? And this exclamation point here, by the way, is how you invert Booleans in JavaScript, right? So that takes true and converts it to false and takes false and converts it to true, right? So that would be a situation where you would use a do while loop is when you know that you want it to execute at least once and then maybe you only want it to loop over and over again if it failed that one time, okay? So anyway, that completes our discussion of the main loops in JavaScript. Just to review here, we have our ugly for loop where we have these three statements here, a variable for counting, we have a condition, and we have a statement for changing that variable in some way. All right, we have our for of loop, which is mainly used for looping through all of the elements in an array in a nice way. We have our for in loop, which is used for looping through all of the properties in a JavaScript object. We have our for each function, right? We like for or while, but it's just a function that you call on an array. And that does the same thing that we saw with for of. And then down here in our while group, we have the while loop and do while loop whose main difference is that the do while loop will be executed at least once, whereas with the while loop, it may not even be executed at all. So anyway, those are the main loops in JavaScript. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. The vast majority of computer programs that you'll write in pretty much any programming language have at their core the need to be able to work with data effectively. And it's for that reason that it's very important when learning a new programming language to learn about the different data types that that programming language defines. Now in JavaScript, there are eight main data types that you'll end up working with. And what we're gonna be focusing on in this section are some of the more basic data types such as numbers, strings, and Booleans. So without further ado, let's jump right in and learn all about these data types. All right, so to get started here, before we jump into learning about some of the basic data types in JavaScript, I wanna talk in a little bit more detail about JavaScript's typing system in general. All right, so JavaScript is what's referred to as a dynamically and weakly typed language. All right, so it's got dynamic typing and it's got weak typing. And this is in contrast to the alternative, which is static typing and strong typing. Now, these are really two independent variables here, if you will. 
right? So you can have a language that's dynamically typed or statically typed, and you can have the same language be either weakly typed or strongly typed. And if you want to imagine those, let's say, as axes on a grid, you might have weak typing and strong typing here, and you might have dynamic typing and static typing here. And in this case, JavaScript would show up in this quadrant, dynamically and weakly typed, and other languages such as Java, let's say, which is strongly and statically typed, would show up in this quadrant here. And of course, there's gonna be languages that are in the other quadrants as well. So the next question then is, what do these terms actually mean, right? What is weak versus strong typing and dynamic versus static typing? Well, let's talk, first of all, about dynamic versus static typing, right? We said that JavaScript is a dynamically typed language, right? Its typing is dynamic. And what this means is that the types for JavaScript variables are determined at runtime instead of at compile time. So, you know, let's say that uh, we want to declare a variable in JavaScript. We're going to say something like let x equals 5. Now, usually a giveaway that a given language is dynamic versus statically typed is that when you declare a variable, there's not really any type declaration in there, right? We're not saying that x is specifically a number or an integer or whatever here. We're just saying let x equals five, right? And in other dynamically typed languages such as Python, you wouldn't even have to have this let keyword. You would just say something like x equals five or 10 or whatever you want. Oops, and Python doesn't even have that semicolon there. So in dynamically typed languages, the typical phrase is that variables don't have types, only values have types, right? So in other words, we're declaring x here as a variable but really the type of this variable x is determined by the value that it currently contains. So what this means is that in most dynamically typed languages, we're able to assign a different type of value to this variable elsewhere in the program, right? So, you know, while x would be a number here because it contains a number value, later on in the program, we could assign it, uh, you know, a string value, let's say. We'll talk about these types in more detail shortly, but basically, this would be allowed in dynamically typed languages. All right, now this stands in contrast to statically typed languages, right? Uh, that is languages with a static typing system. And this includes languages like Java, C++, and even TypeScript, which is what's referred to as a dialect of JavaScript. I'm not gonna talk too much about TypeScript here, but basically in statically typed languages, the types of our variables in our programs are determined at compile time and not at runtime, right? So the giveaway here is usually that in statically typed languages, when you declare a variable, you're going to need to have some kind of type declaration. So, you know, in Java, for example, if you wanted to declare an integer variable, you would probably say something like int x equals five, all right? Now, another side effect of this, of course, is that generally in statically typed languages, you're not allowed to change the type of a variable later on in the program, right? So if we declared that X is an integer here in our Java program, right? We're not gonna be able later on to say X equals and then assign a string to it like this, right? That's just not gonna fly. And generally the compiler itself will warn us before we've even had a chance to run the program in the case of statically typed languages. Now you might be wondering why dynamic typing is associated with JavaScript, right? Why did JavaScript choose to be dynamically typed instead of statically typed? Well, really this has to do with the fact that JavaScript is what's referred to as an interpreted language, all right? So basically what this means, and I'll go into more detail on this in just a minute, but in interpreted languages, there is no compile step. Interpreted languages are generally speaking, never compiled, and this stands in contrast here to compiled languages, of course, where there is a compilation step. So in compiled languages, you know, for those of you who have ever worked with languages like Java or C++ again, there's a compilation step. So in other words, after you write your code, right? So you might have the code that you write over here. You know, this might be a class file if you're writing Java. Basically, in order to run the code that's in here, you're gonna first have to compile that into something that 
the runtime will understand, right? Usually this will compile it into some kind of machine code that uh, the runtime can actually execute. And then and only then are you able to run this, right? So you're able to click that little play button that you see in most Java IDEs, and that will basically run this compiled version of your code. Now in interpreted languages, this compilation step just doesn't exist. So in interpreted languages, what you're actually running is your code itself, right? So if we write a JavaScript program inside its little JS file here, the runtime is actually going to be looking at the code exactly as we wrote it. And on the fly, it's gonna be interpreting that in a way that the runtime can actually understand, right? So generally with interpreted languages, you just run, there is no compilation step. Now, all of this is relevant to our discussion of dynamic versus static typing in JavaScript, because remember that I said in dynamic typing, the types of variables are determined at runtime instead of at compile time. And what that means is that in languages like JavaScript, where there is no compile step, dynamic typing, where the types are determined at runtime, is really the only option, right? Because there is no compile step in here that we, that we would be able to check the types in before running our code, right? We really have no other option than to just check our types at runtime because again, that's all there is. Now, this can be remedied somewhat if you want warnings about misusing your types, let's say, by a host of tools. There's a lot of different tools out there that help you to spot errors in JavaScript before you actually run your code. One very popular one is ESLint, which we'll talk about in much more detail elsewhere. I'm not gonna talk about it here. But basically these tools are gonna to compensate for the lack of a compilation step, where again, the compiler can check and verify the variable types. So anyway, that's dynamic versus static typing. Let's talk now about strong versus weak typing, all right? So we said that JavaScript is a weakly typed language, right? So it's got a weak typing system, and this is in contrast to strong typing systems. Now the descriptor weak or strong when talking about a typing system doesn't refer exactly to how good a typing system is. It refers more to how restrictive a typing system is with combining variables of different types, right? So a classic example of this is let's say that you have two variables in JavaScript. One is let's say a string, all right? So we might say let X equals hello. And let's say we have another variable now that is a number, right? So we say let y equals, and uh, this will be, let's say six, okay? Now the question of weak and strong typing is if you have two variables of different types, what are you allowed to do with those variables, right? Are you allowed to say x plus y and see the result? Well, in weakly typed languages, the answer to this is usually yes, right? So in weakly typed languages, you can generally add together variables of different types and see the result, right? Right. So you can say the string hello plus the number six and it'll give you the answer, right? It's not going to complain about that. Whereas in strong typing, this kind of thing generally isn't allowed without explicitly converting one type to another, right? So generally uh, an indicator that a language is strongly typed as opposed to weakly typed is that you'll see stuff like in this case, X plus, and then you might have to explicitly convert Y to a string before adding it to X, right? And this would just be something called typecasting where you explicitly convert one type of variable into another type of variable so that this operation would work. But in general, JavaScript is going to let you add pretty much any two variables together without complaining, and this can be for better or worse, as we'll see later on. All right, so anyway, just to sum everything up, JavaScript is a dynamic and weakly typed language. Oops, there we go, dynamic and weakly typed language. And what this means is that the types of its variables are determined at runtime as opposed to at compile time, and the types of its variables aren't enforced very strongly, right? So you can do things like add numbers and strings together as we saw. So anyway, that's just something to keep in mind as we go on. This is something that people ask about a lot when they first start working with JavaScript, because especially if they're coming from a language on the opposite corner of the quadrant that we saw earlier, uh, you know, JavaScript's type system might seem a little loosey-goosey compared to things like Java or C++. So 
Anyway, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've talked in a little bit more detail about JavaScript's typing system and how it's different from some of the other programming languages out there uh, because it's weakly and dynamically typed, we can now move on to the first of JavaScript's data types, and that is numbers. Now, in order to demonstrate most of these things, what I'm going to be doing is just running a simple node shell. And you can do that by just opening up a terminal and provided, of course, that you have Node.js downloaded and installed, which we discussed elsewhere, you should just be able to run the command node. And what you'll see is it'll say, welcome to Node.js v1614. Your version might be different than mine, although you'll almost definitely want it to be at least this high. And underneath that, you'll see that the little prompt has now changed and we're in the Node shell. Now, what this means is that we can run JavaScript statements and we'll see their outputs underneath, right? So in other words, we could say something like five plus 10, which is a valid JavaScript expression here. And it'll give us the answer underneath. And we can also do stuff like declare variables, etc. All right, so numbers in JavaScript as we just saw here with this expression, uh, basically the number type in JavaScript stands for any kind of number. There's not a distinction between integers and floating point or double numbers as there is in some other programming languages, right? So uh, in other words, you could have five or six or 20 or 4,027, and all of those would be considered numbers in JavaScript, as would 3.14159, whatever it is, right? And that actually brings me to another thing that I wanted to show you here, and that is that if you're wondering about the type of any variable or value in JavaScript, there's a special keyword that you can use, and it's called type of. And what this keyword will do is it'll tell you the type of whatever you put after it, right? Now, this can be a concrete value such as 10, or it can be a variable name or something like that. And what it's going to give you is, rephrase, and what it's going to tell you is the type of that thing. So if we do type of 10, as we saw, it's going to return the string number, telling you that that is a number. And if we were to say something like let x equals 10, and then say type of x, we would see that we would get the same thing there as well. Okay, so this type of operator is gonna be very useful for us going forward, and we do use it in JavaScript programs from time to time in order to check what type a given variable is, right? If we wanna know whether a variable is a string or a number, we can always check the return value of this statement inside something like an if statement, right? So we could say if type of x is equal to string, let's say. And then inside here, we could write some logic that we would want to execute if x was a string. Okay, so anyway, that's numbers in JavaScript. They're pretty straightforward. And again, you can have them either be integer numbers like 10, or you can have them be decimal numbers like pi. You could say let pi equals 3.14159. That's as far as I go there. And what we'll see is that if we do type of pi, we'll see that that will return number as well. So there's no differentiation, as I said, between integers and decimal numbers in JavaScript as there are in some other languages. Now, another thing that you should know about numbers in JavaScript is that they're not really very accurate. And this has to do with the fact that all numbers in JavaScript are stored as 64-bit floating point numbers, all right? And I don't expect you to remember that. That's not gonna be in the quiz question after this, uh, but they are stored as 64-bit floating point numbers. And that means that, as I said, they're, they tend to not be very accurate. To show you what I mean here, what do you think is gonna happen if we try and add together 0 0.1 and let's say another decimal like 0 0.7, all right? If we try and say 0 0.1 plus 0 0.7, you would expect it to be 0 0.8, right? However, you might be a little bit surprised to find that the answer is not 0 0.8, but 0 0.799999999999. And that answer comes about, again, because of how these numbers are stored in memory. So, so unfortunately, numeric accuracy is not one of JavaScript's strong suits. And therefore, you know, if you require an application that has great numerical precision, 
JavaScript probably isn't going to be what you're looking for. Although there are workarounds for most of these situations here. Now, another place where this is apparent is in very large numbers. So let's say we wanted to declare a variable, we'll call it big number. And uh, we'll put that number at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now that is a very big number. And the problem is that when we try and access now the value of big number by typing in big number, what you're going to see is that what we get out of big number is not quite the same thing that we put in, right? So this ends in a seven, this number here ends in an eight. So they're just not the same number. And furthermore, if the numbers get big enough, JavaScript will just kind of give up on you and call it infinity. You can see this if you generate a very large number, like if you do, let's say 10 to the 999th power, which you can do in JavaScript by saying math.pow 10999 you'll see that that gives us infinity. Now, obviously that's a huge number. I would guess that a lot of programming languages out there would have trouble handling that number, but as you can see, JavaScript just says, eh, you know what, forget about it. That's basically infinity, and it'll give you this infinity value, right? So this infinity is what I refer to as a special numeric value in JavaScript. There are two main special values of numbers in JavaScript. Um, one, as we've seen, is infinity. And there is also negative infinity, by the way, that you'll see if you do the same kind of thing with very large negative numbers. But there's also a special numeric value that will come about if you try and do something with numbers that numbers aren't meant to do in JavaScript. So let's say that we were to take a number, right? So we'll just say five, and we were to try and multiply it by something that's not a number, right? This is a ridiculous operation, of course. So let's say we were to try and multiply this number by a string. All right, and strings we haven't talked about yet, but that's what they look like in JavaScript, of course. Well, what you're gonna see in that situation is this weird value called nan, and that stands for not a number. Now, not a number is basically just JavaScript's way of telling you that you did something stupid and that you should go through and check your code for operations on numbers that shouldn't be performed in the first place, right? Such as multiplying numbers by strings, uh, you, this can also happen if you're multiplying a number by a non-existent value, which is something that we'll talk about later on, right? So basically, not a number is just JavaScript's way of telling you that you did something wrong, right? It's a, it's a polite way of saying that there's a programmer error going on. All right, so infinity and nan are the two special values of numbers in JavaScript. Everything else is gonna be pretty straightforward, besides, of course, the obvious weirdness that we've seen here with adding simple decimal numbers together and very large numbers, etc. But despite all of this, numbers in JavaScript, I, I usually don't run into too many problems with them, right? Once you're aware of these kinds of things here and some of the side effects that they can cause, for example, with decimal numbers, you usually don't wanna check to see if two decimal numbers are equal to each other, right? If we were to say something like let x equals 0 0.1 plus 0 0.7, Oops, and X has already been declared, so let's try using Y here. It just the terminal here just doesn't like if you try and redeclare a variable. So let's do let Y equals 0 0.1 plus 0 0.7. If we were to check if Y is equal to 0 0.8, which is you know a valid thing to want to check, what we would find, and the way you do this by the way is by saying Y triple equals sign. We'll talk about that in more detail shortly. Uh, 0 0.8 you'll see that that will return false, right? So in other words, even though we know that mathematically this here should be 0 0.8, this is returning false because uh, the actual value of this behind the scenes, because of, again, how JavaScript stores values, is 0 0.799999999, etc. And the same thing is true for big numbers, right? You wouldn't want to check to see if a number is equal to this because it very well could be off by a little bit as we've seen here. Now, as I said, there are workarounds here. In this case, what you would wanna do instead of just checking if a number is equal to 0 0.8 is, you know, uh, one possible workaround would be to actually round those numbers by saying math.round y times 10, which would multiply it by 10 and eliminate that decimal portion. And then you could say is equal to math.round 0 0.8. Oops, I wanted to say math.round 0 0.8 times 10, right? And you would see that that would give you true 
So there are workarounds, they're really, really ugly, and that's just how JavaScript's number system works. So anyway, that's numbers in JavaScript. We'll be dealing with this kind of numeric weirdness at various points throughout the rest of our sections. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get more experience with this if this seems a little bit overwhelming. But anyway, one last thing I wanted to show you here is if you ever have the need to work with numbers in a different base, right? For example, if you need to be able to specify binary numbers or hexadecimal numbers, JavaScript provides a pretty straightforward way of doing that. All you have to do is say 0B for binary and then type out whatever binary number you want, right? So 101010. And if you hit enter, of course, that will show you the actual decimal equivalent of that number. So that's binary. And if you ever need to specify a hexadecimal number, you can do that by saying 0X and that would be followed by the hexadecimal number, right? So you could say something like a, B, C, one, two, three, right? And that would give you the equivalent in decimal down below, okay? So I personally very rarely, if ever, have to use binary numbers or hexadecimal numbers, but that being said, I'm sure there are situations where these things will come in handy, so just keep it in mind. Oh, and one last thing, if you ever need to specify octal numbers, right? That is base eight instead of base 10 or base 16 or base two, uh, you can do that by saying zero O, right? Zero lowercase O, and then specify your number in octal, right? So let's see, 100 in octal would be 64. Okay, so that's how you specify numbers with binary, hexadecimal, and octal in JavaScript. Again, I personally haven't really had any situations where I've had to do this, but if you ever run into this situation yourself, now you know how to do it. So... Anyway, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've taken a look at numbers in JavaScript and their many quirks, we're gonna move on to a type that hopefully you'll find a little bit less unpredictable, and that is strings. So strings in JavaScript, for the most part, behave more or less like you'd expect them to, unlike numbers as we saw before, with obviously a few exceptions that we'll take a look at as well. So first of all, I'm gonna be demonstrating this just like I did before in the node shell, and what I'm gonna recommend you do is exit the shell by just pressing Control C twice and then rerunning Node, which will clear out all of the Node variables for you so that you don't get uh, complaints from the Node shell about trying to redeclare X or Y or any of those things, which are easy to use for examples. All right, so strings in JavaScript are defined in one of several ways. As you've probably noticed by now, JavaScript is not one of those languages where there's one right way to do everything. So the first way to declare a string in JavaScript is just using single quotes. So you can say hello, and that is a string, as you'll see if you use the type of operator that we saw before, right? That will output string. All right, so strings can be declared using single quotes, and they can also be declared using double quotes. So if you prefer that, right, if that looks more correct to you, then you can always say type of hello in double quotes, and that will be correct as well. And furthermore, if you want to use back ticks, and for those of you who can't find that key, it's usually in the top left-hand corner on American keyboards. On some other keyboards, it's in the bottom left-hand corner right next to the shift key. Uh, but anyway, they look like this, right? They're just little teeny slanted lines right up at the top. And those can be used to define strings as well. So we can say hello, and we'll see that that is also a string. Now, defining strings using backticks, this actually does have one special use case, which I'll show you later on. But for now, just know that these are three different ways to declare strings. Now, strings in JavaScript, just like in most other languages, have built-in properties. So, you know, if you want to know the length of a string, let's say, you can get that length just by accessing its length property. So let's say we have a variable called myString, and we'll set it equal to hello in single quotes or double quotes or back ticks, whichever one you prefer. If we want to get the length of that string, we can just say myString.length, 
and that will return the number of characters in that string. So this can be very useful for checking if a string is empty, for example, because in that case, the length would be zero. Now, you can access these properties on a variable that you've declared that has the type of string, but you can also call them directly on a string itself. So if we had just declared our string like this, and again, you can use whatever quotation marks you want, we can say hello.length, and that will work just the same way. All right, so you can use either of these. You don't have to define an intermediate variable like we did here, but uh, you know it might make it a little more readable in certain cases. Now, in addition to properties like length that strings have, they also have a variety of functions that you can call on them as well. Now, two of these functions, which are used quite frequently in JavaScript when comparing strings, are to uppercase and to lowercase. And what they'll do is they'll actually return that string where all of the characters have been converted to uppercase or lowercase, respectively. So, you know, if we want to say my string dot to uppercase, and do keep in mind that the case here has a capital C. I make that mistake all the time where I say uppercase with a lowercase c, and then I get an error saying that that's not a valid function, which is a little bit annoying, but whatever. So if we hit enter, we're going to see that that will give us, as I said, the string all in uppercase. Now, it's important to keep in mind that these functions, such as to uppercase and to lowercase, which does the opposite here, these don't actually change the value of the string itself. So in other words, if we take a look at the value of my string, we'll see that it's still the same thing that we assigned to it up here at the top, right? So calling these functions doesn't actually change the value stored inside the string. It just returns a modified version of that string so that we can see it. Now, you know, these kinds of things are usually used when you want to do things like compare strings, right? So if you're writing an application where the user is entering a keyword of some sort, well, users who don't usually behave in the way that web developers expect them to may well enter in that keyword with a capital letter at the beginning. And if you're checking to see whether that matches some other keyword, which you've entered all in lowercase, well, they're not going to be equal, right? Keyword is not going to be equal to keyword with a lowercase k. You'll see that that's false. So what these sorts of functions are usually used for is to compare two strings without regards to case. So in this case, we could say keyword dot to lowercase is equal to keyword dot to lowercase. And you'll see that that is true, right? So it allows you to compare strings without regards to case. That's just an example of what these kinds of functions might be used for in JavaScript. So there are quite a few other functions as well that you can call on strings. And if you're curious to see the entire list, that list is available. And you can find that list if you go to something called the Mozilla Developer Network, right? That's MDN. And this is basically the documentation of the entire JavaScript language. So if you just search for, you know, I got here just by searching MDN JavaScript strings, and I believe it was the first thing that came up. So this basically will just tell you everything you need to know about strings, and it'll give you examples of all of the different functions that you can call on strings, right? You can see that there's quite a few different options here, including to lowercase, to uppercase, as we just saw, and so on. All right, so just to give you an example here, one other function that's used quite often is the character at function, and that looks like this. It's just my string dot char at. And basically, this is just a function that you can pass a number to, and it'll tell you what character is in that position, right? So this is the position three, which is actually the fourth letter, because just like with arrays in most other languages, string indices in JavaScript start at zero. So you have zero, one, two, three, and that's that L that we're seeing there, right? So you could say character at four if you wanted to, and that would return O. Okay, so those are some of the basic things to know about strings. Another thing that you'll probably want to do quite often with strings in JavaScript is insert values of variables into strings, right? So let's say that you have a variable which we'll call x, and that variable is a number. And let's say you want to display the value of x inside a string by saying, you know, x is and then you want to insert the value of that into the string. Well, you can do that in several ways. One way is of course to use the basic addition operator. You can say x is plus x, 
And in this case, JavaScript will automatically take care of inserting the value of that variable into the string. Another way to do this is using backticks, right? So I mentioned earlier that, that declaring strings using backticks had a special use case, and that use case is to insert the values of variables in the middle of string, right? In this case, we were able to add the value of x to the end of this string, but there might be cases where we wanna insert that into the middle, so in that case, we could do the same thing using plus signs. If we wanted to, for example, say X is, and then insert the value of X, and then add an exclamation point at the end, we could say plus X plus, and then have another string at the end. And we would see that that would work just fine. But that can get a little bit verbose. So what we can actually do using back ticks is insert the value of X in a slightly different way. What that's gonna look like is we're gonna say X is, and then we're gonna put a dollar sign and single curly braces like this. And then we're gonna put X inside of there. And, and what we'll see is that that will actually insert the value of the X variable into that string, right? This is called string interpolation. So you can only do this, by the way, with back ticks. You can't do that, for example, with single or double quotation marks. If you try and do that, it, it will literally just add that into the string and you'll end up with this kind of thing instead of what you probably wanted, which is this thing with the back ticks. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanted to discuss with the string type in JavaScript for the time being. There are obviously quite a few other details that we'll learn about as we go on, but these are really what I would consider the main things to know about strings in JavaScript. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so we've talked about numbers, we've talked about strings. The next type that we're gonna take a look at here in JavaScript is the Boolean type. So I'm gonna recommend again that you restart your Node shell and clear out all of those variables so that we can have a clean slate to start off with, all right? So the Boolean type in JavaScript is deceptively simple because it only has two basic types, right? So that is true, all right? So type of true is gonna be Boolean and type of false is gonna be Boolean as well. And those are really the only two types that a Boolean variable can take. Now, these Booleans can be generated by the result of logic. So for example, if you wanna check if a given variable is greater than or less than or equal to some number, or if you wanna check if a string is equal to another string, etc., those types of expressions are going to generate a Boolean result. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you have, let's say a variable called X, and this time we'll set it to 11 maybe, and you say x is less than 22, then you'll see that that's true. If you check and see if x is less than, uh, I don't know, two, you'll see that that's false. And the same thing is gonna happen if you check and see if x is equal to some number, or if you check, as I said, whether or not a string, so we'll say my string, is equal to some other string. All right, all of these are gonna return a Boolean result. And if you want to get the opposite of a Boolean variable, you use the not sign, right? That's just an exclamation mark in JavaScript. So if you wanted to say not true, that's gonna return false. And if you say not false, that'll return true. And of course, you can apply that to any of the expressions above to get the opposite result. So if you were to say not, and in this case, we're gonna have to surround this in parentheses to make sure that this is being evaluated before we use the not symbol. If we were to say X is less than 22, we'll see that that'll give us the opposite result from what we had up here because this inverts what was true into false. So pretty straightforward, right? Well, where Booleans start to get a little bit tricky in JavaScript is that all other types in JavaScript are considered under certain circumstances to be equivalent to one of these values. Now, what I mean by that, that might sound a little bit confusing. What I mean by that is let's say we were to use an if statement and we were to put something in between these parentheses of the if statement that's not a Boolean, right? It's pretty straightforward if we just say if true and then inside the body, we'll say console.log hello 
we're going to see that that will log out hello because this part of the statement will be executed since this condition is, of course, true. However, in JavaScript, it's possible to pass things that aren't directly Booleans to an if statement in between the parentheses, All right? So let's say we have a string. We'll say, let my string equals hello. Well, you can actually say if my string and inside this if statements body, if we say console.log hello. Oops, and we got to close that bracket there. We're going to see that that gets executed. So in this case, as we just saw, the current value of my string is being treated the same way as the Boolean value true, right? So this is what we refer to as a truthy value in JavaScript. And uh, yeah, that's sort of a made up word. I'm actually not even sure how to spell it, whether it's Y or EY or whatever, but this is considered to be a truthy value in JavaScript. And this isn't just true of strings either. If we have a number, right, like X that we have up here, that can be treated as truthy as well. So if we say if x console.log, we'll say x is truthy. If x is indeed truthy, we'll see in just a minute. And let's hit enter. And sure enough, we'll see that it prints out x is truthy, which means again that x in this situation is being treated in exactly the same way as the Boolean value true. Now, the opposite of truthy values in JavaScript are falsy values. And again, I'm not exactly sure how this is supposed to be spelled, whether it's falsy or falsy EY. But in any case, falsy values are values that are treated in the same way as the Boolean value false, right? So essentially the opposite of what we just saw here with our truthy values. Now, to give you an idea of what this might look like, let's say that we have another variable. We'll just say, uh, let y, and we'll set this equal to the number zero, right? So what do you think is going to happen? Perhaps I already spoiled this. What do you think is going to happen if we say if y, and then have some kind of thing in here that says x is, or y rather, is truthy. And then we'll have an else statement. And we, and we are allowed to write this all in one line, by the way, in case you were confused by that. And inside the else statement, we'll say console.log y is falsy. All right, I believe it's ey. I'll just take a guess there. What do you think is going to happen here now if we hit enter? Well, what you'll see is that this will output y is falsy, which means that y in this situation is being treated as the Boolean value false, right? The same result would happen if we were to go back here and just change y to the actual Boolean value false. We'd see that we would get the same result. Now, in this case, right, with y equal to zero, it might make sense to a lot of you, and you might think, oh yeah, of course, the value zero is falsy. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because, you know, you have zero and one, which is false and true in most cases. But the fact is that which values are truthy and falsy in JavaScript, there's not really a good satisfying pattern to it, as you'll see. And just to give you an idea of what I mean by that, We'll do a little test here and see if you can guess which values are truthy and which values are falsy. All right, so what do you think is gonna happen if we say if, and then we put an empty string in here? Now this one might be a little bit easy, but I promise you it'll get a little bit harder in just a minute here. We'll say console.log empty string is truthy, if it's truthy, and otherwise, of course, we'll say console.log empty string is falsy. Okay, so what do you think is gonna happen if we hit enter? Well, what we'll see is that it prints out empty string is falsy. So again, that means that an empty string in JavaScript is gonna be treated in the same way in these kinds of situations as the Boolean value false. Now, for a slightly harder one, what do you think is gonna happen if we pass an empty object, right? We talked about objects in JavaScript previously. They're basically what you would call in other languages dictionaries or hashes or maps. There's different terms for this, but it's basically just a collection of keys and values. So what do you think is gonna happen here if we have an empty object? We're gonna say console.log empty object is truthy. And we'll say else console.log empty object is falsy. Well, what you're gonna see is that 
an empty object in JavaScript is actually truthy. Meaning that even though an empty string was considered to be equal to the Boolean value false, an empty object is somehow considered to be equal to the Boolean value true. And to continue with our little test, what do you think an empty array is going to be, right? Personally, if I didn't already know this, and this is going to give away the answer perhaps, if I didn't already know this, I would say, oh, well, since an empty object is truthy, an empty array will probably be truthy as well, right? Because they look similar. Uh, maybe there's some kind of pattern that only empty strings are falsy. You can look for a lot of different patterns if you want to. But the fact is, as I said before, that there's not really a satisfying pattern, at least, you know, when you're first learning it behind what's truthy and what's falsy in JavaScript. So we'll just say truthy to test this one out here. And we'll say else console.log falsy. So what do you think this one's going to be? Just take a guess, write it down, whatever. Well, what you'll see is that this is actually, in fact, truthy. Okay, you might have thought that it would be falsy because it's more similar to an empty string since both arrays and strings have a length property, right? So this.length is going to be zero, and the same thing would happen for an empty string.length zero. But nope, an empty string is falsy and an empty array is truthy. So let's continue with our test. What do you think the value nan is going to translate to? Right. Remember that this is a special value for numbers, which basically means that something went wrong and we tried to, I don't know, multiply a number in a string, right? What do you think this is going to be? Well, what we'll do is we'll just say console.log truthy and else console.log falsy. And if we hit enter now, what we're going to see is that nan is actually falsy. So what do you think infinity is going to be? All right, we'll come back here and we'll say infinity we'll see that infinity is actually truthy. So maybe you're getting tired of this by now, but the point of all of this is that Booleans and truthiness and falsiness in JavaScript really aren't very straightforward. But what I'm going to do is make it as easy for you as possible and tell you the pattern, which isn't really a pattern in JavaScript, of what's truthy and what's falsy. Basically, the only way that I've found to know what's going to be truthy and falsy in JavaScript is to memorize all of the falsy values. Well, fortunately for you, there are actually only seven falsy values in JavaScript, and we haven't actually seen all of these yet, but I'm just going to list them out here for you so that you know what they are ahead of time. So the first falsy value in JavaScript is, as we've seen, zero. All right, so the number zero is falsy. The second falsy value in JavaScript is going to be an empty string. And I'm putting these in an order here, but there's not really any inherent order in what's first and what's second, etc. The third falsy value is going to be not a number, right? Nan, which as we've seen comes about when we try and do incorrect operations with numbers. The fourth one is obviously going to be the Boolean value false, which is of course falsy. And the next three are things that we haven't seen yet. So Number five is going to be the value null. Now, null is technically considered to be an object type. So it's the same type as an object with keys and values that we define using curly braces. We'll learn more about objects elsewhere, but it basically represents the absence of an object. Now, it's not the same as an empty object, somewhat confusingly, but it's basically just a value in JavaScript to signify that there is no value. Now, somewhat related to this, and we'll talk about the difference between these elsewhere again, because it is kind of a poorly defined difference, in my opinion, is the value undefined. Now, undefined, unlike null, is basically the type that's given to variables before any value has been assigned to them, right? So if we just say let x, for example, and don't assign any value to it, the type of x is going to be undefined. And undefined is treated as a falsy value as well. And finally, the last falsy value here is going to be 0n. Now, this is of another type in JavaScript, which is called the big int type. And it's kind of a funny word, but basically these are big integers. It's a type that was added to JavaScript fairly recently in order to allow it to deal with large numbers more effectively. Uh, so we'll talk about that elsewhere again, but basically these are the seven falsy values in JavaScript and everything else besides these is truthy. And here, let me actually scribble out this empty object here since that is not falsy as we've seen and neither is an empty array. 
Okay, so these are again the seven falsy values in JavaScript. Don't try and find a pattern in it, just memorize them. That's just going to be the easiest way to go about it. So again, any of these things are going to be treated as the Boolean value false if you put them, let's say, in an if statement or in a while loop or, you know, situations like that. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. JavaScript as a language has eight major data types, and some of those data types tend to be a little bit more complex to work with. Now, some of these more complex data types include things like objects in JavaScript, as well as other data types such as functions. So what we're gonna be taking a look at here today are some of those more complicated data types in JavaScript, and we're gonna be learning how they all work, the basic syntax for each of them, and some of the little things to be aware of when working with each of these types. So without further ado, let's jump right in. All right, so to get started here, we're going to take a look at JavaScript's object type. Now, if you watched the previous section, you'll know that we covered three of the most basic types in JavaScript there, and just to sort of summarize those, those were the number type, right? So we saw the number type in JavaScript as well as a lot of its nitty gritty details. We also took a look at the string type, and we also took a look at JavaScript's Boolean type. Now, as we saw, all three of these types had their own sort of unique peculiarities, things that you really wouldn't have expected them to have, right? You, Generally speaking, JavaScript's data types behave in a slightly different way than you would expect them to. That's just kind of how the JavaScript language is, for better or worse. So, what we're going to do here is we're going to move on and cover some of the remaining types. We're going to take a look at objects here, we're gonna take a look at functions. So functions are their own type, and we'll take a look at those in more detail here in just a minute. And we're also gonna take a look at the big int, which we covered briefly when we talked about numbers. And finally, we're going to take a look at the symbol type and the undefined type. So as you can see, there are eight main data types in JavaScript. We've already covered the first three, and we're going to try and cover the rest of these data types here, starting with objects. So let's jump right into learning about objects. What I'm gonna be using here for demonstration purposes is the node shell, which again, you can get to just by opening up a terminal. You can open that up in your IDE if your IDE has one. And if you run the command node, you should see that that opens up the node shell where you can just uh, enter in basic JavaScript statements and expressions and see them evaluated in real time. Now, objects in JavaScript probably aren't what you're expecting them to be, right? If you've worked with other languages like Java or C++ or any language that has the concept of classes, you're probably used to objects being uh, basically an instance of a class, right? So if you define a class, called, you know, car, let's say, then an object in most other languages would be an instance of this car class, right? So again, in Java, you'd say new car, and this would create an instance of the car class, uh, which you would call then an object. Now in JavaScript, this is an object, but objects are used more generally to refer to just a collection of keys and values. At some point, we'll take a look at how those two things overlap because they do overlap in the JavaScript language. But, you know, they're basically just gonna be, as I said, a collection of keys and values. So an object can be used to represent a lot of different things in JavaScript, right? So it could be used to represent a person where maybe you have a name, which is a string in here, and you'd have an age, which would be a number, right? So I don't know, 50. You might have a hair color. And this is basically what an object looks like. Okay, so if you wanna actually define an object inside the node shell, which is, by the way, why we have this up in the first place, what you can do is you can just say let, and we'll just say person, right? And the way that you're going to define objects is 
in between curly braces. So we've seen that there's a lot of curly braces in the JavaScript language. It's just one of those things that JavaScript loves. And objects are defined using those. So we're just gonna say let person equals, and then we're gonna have an opening curly brace. When you hit enter here, you're gonna see these three dots. All that means is that it's just giving you a new line to start typing on, right? So basically it's showing you that it realizes that you haven't yet finished typing out the full command. And what we're gonna do is just give this person some properties. So we'll say name, John Doe. We'll give John Doe an age, we'll just say 50. And let's say hair color, I don't know, we'll just do brown. All right, and that will define an object that is assigned to this variable person. Now, once we've defined an object, chances are we're probably going to want to be able to access its values, right? We're going to want to be able to access the different properties. These are called properties here that the object contains. Now, as we've seen before with many, many other things, JavaScript has multiple ways for accessing the values of an object. The first way is pretty simple. It's just by typing the name of the variable, and then you can say dot along with the name of the property that you wanna access, right? So if you wanna get the person's name, you could do that just by saying person.name, and as you can see, that will return whatever the value is for that key, right? And just to give you a little more terminology here, in case I haven't made that explicit, inside a JavaScript object, this is called a key. Right, so that's basically the name of the property. And this is called the value, which is probably pretty self-explanatory. That's the value of that property. All right, so again, if you wanna access other properties such as age, you can just say person.age, person.haircolor, and so on. Now, if you happen to try and access a property that doesn't exist on a JavaScript object, let's say that we type person.salary, right? Well. Obviously up here, we haven't defined a salary property for our person object. So what we're gonna see is that this returns undefined. And this is the same kind of thing that we see printed out when you know we run some kind of JavaScript statement that doesn't have a return value. And basically what it means is that that just plain doesn't exist. Now there is another value that we'll talk about in just a minute here, which is the value null, that also somewhat confusingly is used to represent the absence of a value. But basically this undefined value is used to signify that that variable just doesn't exist, right? So again, person.salary, that doesn't exist. So that's why we're seeing this undefined value. All right, so anyway, that's the first way to access the values of different properties inside JavaScript objects is just by having a dot and putting the name of the property you want to access the value for after it. Pretty straightforward. The other main way that you can access object properties in JavaScript is by using square brackets. So let me just demonstrate what that will look like. I'm gonna do these same things that I did up here, except I'm gonna use the square bracket notation. So in order to access the name property of this person using square brackets, we would say person, then inside the square brackets, we would have the string of name, or double quotes, doesn't really matter which one, but it does have to be an actual string. You can't just say name without quotation marks, since that's something different, as we'll see. And if you run this with the string name, what you'll see is that that will give us the same result as we had up here when we said person.name, Right, we see John Doe, John Doe. Same thing's gonna be true if we try and access the person's age, right? We see 50. If we say person and then hair color, we'll see the person's hair color printed out here as well. All right, and the same thing is gonna be true, obviously, if you try and access a property that doesn't exist, if we were to say person and the string that we were to put here was weight, we would see that that's undefined since obviously we didn't define a weight property up here either. Okay, now you might be wondering why JavaScript has these two different ways of accessing properties of an object. And there is actually one major thing that this notation lets you do that this notation up here with the dot doesn't let you do. And that is access properties dynamically based on the value of a variable. That might sound a little bit confusing, so let me demonstrate. Let's say that we have uh, another variable, right? We'll just call it something like property name, and that variable is equal to one of these properties up here, right? Such as name, age, hair color, etc. We'll just pick name, and 
Basically, what we would be able to do using only the square bracket notation, we wouldn't be able to do this using the dot notation, as I'll show you in just a minute, is access the person's name property by passing the value of this property name variable to the square brackets. So what we could do is say person property name, and we would see that that would give us John Doe because basically what JavaScript does is it evaluates the value of this property name variable and it gets the string name before it actually tries to access this property of the person. All right, now you might be thinking that you see a way to do this with the dot notation by saying person dot property name, right? But what that's going to give you is undefined. And the reason for that is that the person object that we defined doesn't have a property with the name of property name, right? What we're doing here with the dot notation would be equivalent to saying person and then as a string saying property name, okay? Which would again give us undefined. So. It's important to notice the subtle difference between these two things here. In one, we're passing the value of a variable to the square brackets, and in the other, we're actually trying to refer directly to a property called property name. All right, this is something that can confuse people, and trust me, this shows up a lot in JavaScript developer interviews. So anyway, that's how to access the values of properties, right? That's a pretty definitive guide. I really don't think there's any other ways that you're going to have to access object properties that I haven't shown here. So if you wanna just take a screenshot of this and use it as a sort of cheat sheet, you go right ahead and do that. All right, now another thing that I want to just demonstrate here is a source of a lot of errors in JavaScript programs. And that is trying to access a property of a property. All right, now in order to give you a little bit more detail on what this might look like, let's say again that instead of having our original person object, we have another person, All right? We'll say name Jane Doe, age, we'll give Jane the same age as John. And let's say that Jane hair color, I don't know, we'll give Jane red hair. And let's say that Jane has a further property, which would be something like job details, right? And this would just contain information about Jane's career. Now, in JavaScript objects, it's possible to have properties that are themselves objects. And what that would look like is you would just have the property name, same as always, right? Same as we had name, age, hair, color. But the value here is going to be another set of curly braces with its own set of properties inside of it, right? So, you know, uh, this job details object might have title. Jane might be a software developer. Let's say uh, that might have something like years at company, right? The number of years that Jane was working for that company. So I don't know, let's say something like five. And now we could close that curly brace there, which would get us back out to the outer object and we could close that curly brace again. And basically what this job details thing is now is a nested object, right? It's an object inside another object. And this is perfectly valid in JavaScript. It's used quite a bit. If we wanted to access the value of one of these properties of this inner property, what we could do is say person two dot job details dot title. And we could see that that would give us those properties, right? So if you had an object that was nested even further, it would just be person two dot job details dot title dot level dot whatever, right? You can go as deep as you need to depending on your data needs. Although generally speaking, it's best to try and keep your objects as flat as possible since it just makes them easier to work with. So anyway, as I was saying before, this sort of thing here, accessing the property of a property of an object in JavaScript can cause some unexpected errors. And here's why. Let's say that we were trying to access Jane Doe's job title, but Instead of typing in job details, we accidentally just said job details with a lowercase d, right? Now, that's going to be undefined because properties in JavaScript, first of all, are case sensitive. So this job details property with a lowercase d doesn't exist, right? We see that that gives us undefined. Now, what would happen, do you think, if we were to try and access the title property of this non-existent property? Well, to show you what'll happen, let's say person dot job details with a lowercase d dot title. As you can see, what this is going to give us is an uncaught type error, right? This is probably one of the most 
commonly seen errors in JavaScript. You're gonna see it all the time, trust me. I, I still see it from time to time in a lot of my programs. I just want you to memorize the text of this error just so that you know exactly what's going on if and when you get it, right? It's cannot read properties of undefined, and then it will tell you the property you're trying to read. Basically, all that this means is that you're trying to get the property of the value undefined. Now on an object, say person dot blah, 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 it doesn't really matter if this property exists or not, right? Because person at the very least is an object. And so we can try and access whatever properties we want on that object without throwing an error. However, if we try and access a property on something that's not an object, which is essentially what we're doing here, that's when the error happens, right? So if you were to say undefined, which is a valid value in JavaScript dot some value, as you can see, that's going to give us the same error, right? So anyway, that's a very common error to see. And that's why in a lot of JavaScript programs, you'll see that people actually have to test to make sure that a given property exists before accessing another property on that. And what that generally looks like, I'm not gonna go too much into detail here right now, but what that generally will look like is something like person.jobdetails and person.jobdetails.title, right? And that will prevent an error from happening. Basically what this does is it doesn't execute this unless the first thing before this double ampersand sign exists. So again, don't worry about that syntax. I just wanted to point out that you're probably going to see this in a lot of JavaScript programs. And I wanted to make sure that you know what this is for. It's basically just to make sure that this error here doesn't happen. If for example, we know that job details may or may not exist on a given object. All right. And there actually is in more modern JavaScript, depending on the runtime you're using a syntax for preventing that. And you might see this as well. That would be something like person dot job details, question mark dot title. And as you can see, this works in Node.js, right? So you can use the question mark notation if you know that a given object property may or may not exist. And that allows us to avoid this error up here as well, right? So these two statements are more or less equivalent to each other. All right, so that's a pretty exhaustive list of details about accessing properties in JavaScript. And one thing to know is that pretty much everything that we've done up here, right? Uh, accessing properties using the dot notation, accessing properties using square brackets, etc. All of that stuff can be used to modify the properties of objects as well, right? So let's say that we wanted to change person one's name, right? Remember that person is John Doe here and you can actually see the entire object printed out if you just type in person, which is kind of nice. Let's say that we wanted to change person one's name property, all right? Well, the way that we could do that is by saying person.name equals, and then we could change that to something like Johan Doe if we wanted to. And now what we would see is that person one's name would be successfully changed, right? And you can use the square bracket notation as well if you wanted to change person one's age property by saying person age in square brackets. You could say person age equals and then uh, maybe we'll change that to 51, right? And as you can see, that would successfully change that age property. And the same details apply with changing properties as we saw up here with, with accessing nested properties, right? If you wanted to change a nested property, maybe Jane Doe got a promotion and is now a senior software developer. The way that you could update that is by saying person two dot job details dot title equals senior software developer, all right? And as you can see, that would, uh, here, if we were to just type in person two, we would see that those changes would be reflected there. And the same thing is going to apply with nested properties as we saw up here with avoiding errors. Basically, if we were to try and say person two dot job details with a lowercase d dot title equals, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not gonna work because we're gonna get this same error saying cannot set properties of undefined. Actually, it's a slightly differently worded error, right? It says cannot set properties instead of cannot read properties, but, but you get the idea. It's really the same difficulty behind the scenes, right? You're trying to work with a property of a non-existent object. 
Cool, so that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about for now with JavaScript objects. That should get you quite deep into the object world in JavaScript. Objects are used all the time in JavaScript, as you'll see. One last thing that I wanted to mention is a so-called special value for objects in JavaScript, and that is the value null. So null in JavaScript is technically of the object type, and you can see this if you type in type of null. It'll print out object, the same as if you were to say type of, and then, you know, name Sean. That would give you an object as well. So null is used basically to represent a non-existent object. And this might be the case, let's say, if you're waiting for data to load from a server, right? In that case, you might want to explicitly set the value of some object to null just to communicate to the rest of your program that that value doesn't exist yet, right? So you might want to say something like let person data equal null. And while that's loading from the server, let's say the rest of the program will know that this person data hasn't been loaded yet. And then once you've actually loaded it, you'll set person data to whatever data you got back from the server, right? So anyway, that's the null value. And it's not the same thing as undefined in JavaScript, even though many times they're used sort of interchangeably. Really the main difference between null and undefined has to do with the places that they're used and uh, really just their behavior in some very, very specific circumstances. I'm not gonna go too far into it right now. Uh, for now, just know that null is meant to represent explicitly a non-existent object or an object that we're waiting to load, let's say from a server or a database and undefined is basically the default value for variables. And it basically just represents the complete absence of any kind of value or data. All right, so it's a very fine distinction between those two things. Don't worry too much about it right now. Just know that there are some slight behavioral differences between the two and some slight usage differences between the two that we'll see much later on. It's not really that big of a deal. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've taken a look at the object type in JavaScript, we're gonna move on to taking a look at arrays. Now, the first thing that you may have noticed is that arrays weren't one of the eight data types I listed in JavaScript. And that's because in JavaScript, arrays are objects, right? Arrays are considered to be of the object type. And you can see this if you say type of, and then just put an empty array, which is just two square brackets like so you'll see that that returns object, right? There's not a special array type in JavaScript. Just something to keep in mind. Now, arrays in JavaScript, another thing that you should know about them is that their contents don't all have to be of the same type, right? So while it's perfectly fine to have an array of numbers like that, you could also have an array that contains numbers, that contains strings, that contains booleans, that contains objects even right? And that's perfectly fine, right? JavaScript doesn't restrict you like a lot of other languages do to having your array only contain the same type. Now, once we've defined an array, accessing the values that it contains is going to be pretty straightforward. And it's going to look a lot like the second syntax that we learned for accessing object properties using square brackets, right? So first of all, let's just say that we have an array, we'll call it numbers, and we'll set it equal to, uh, you know, one, two, three, oops, there we go, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and let's go up to 10. All right, so we have our numbers array. Let's say that we wanna access one of these values. Well, the way that you're going to do that is simply by saying numbers and by using square brackets after that. So, you know, if we wanted to access the first number in the array, array indices do start at zero in JavaScript, just like in most other programming languages, uh, that would give you the first number in the array, right? So numbers index zero is how this is read. And that would give us the first number in the array. And likewise, if we wanted to access the last one here, that's going to be numbers index nine. 
and that'll give us 10, right? Because there's 10 elements in here and it starts at zero. The last one is going to be nine. Now, you might be wondering if we can use the dot notation the same way that we were able to do with objects. And unfortunately, we're not actually able to do that, right? So you can't say numbers dot zero. JavaScript is just gonna give you a syntax error there saying, I don't know what on earth you're trying to do by saying numbers dot zero. Right, so really the main way of accessing elements in JavaScript arrays is just using square brackets like we saw. Now, you might be wondering what happens if we go beyond the bounds of the array, right? So in other words, we know that the last index in this numbers array is nine. So what happens if we try and access index 10? Well, unlike in a lot of other languages such as Java, in JavaScript, if we try and access an array element that doesn't exist, right? In other words, if we go beyond the bounds of that array, JavaScript is just going to return undefined, right? So it's not as a, uh, it's not as big a deal in JavaScript for better or worse if you go outside the bounds of the array. And I say for worse because most of the time when you try and access outside the bounds of an array in JavaScript, that generally has more to do with the code that you wrote rather than the exact situation that the program has encountered, right? right? So in other words, it's usually a programmer error that's causing that. And the fact that JavaScript doesn't throw an error there can sometimes tend to swallow those errors so that you don't really realize they're going on until later on down the line. Right, like if you were to try and multiply numbers index 10 by some other number, that's going to give you nan, right? So this is a perfect example of a situation where you might accidentally end up with this not a number special number value that we saw earlier is when you try and multiply something like undefined by an. All right, so so far so good. We've seen how to access different elements in an array. Uh, you should also know that arrays, just just like other types such as strings, have properties that you can access that are just kind of built into them. So for example, they have a length property. If you wanted to know the length of our numbers array, for example, you could just say numbers.length, and we would see that that's 10. And additionally, arrays in JavaScript also have quite a wide variety of functions that you can call on them. And at some point in the future, in some other section, I'd really like to go into detail on what all of those functions are. Because really, I would say that array functions constitute a pretty large percentage of the JavaScript logic that you're going to end up writing. So what I mean, first of all, by array functions are basically just functions that you can call by saying the name of an array, so numbers, dot, and then you can call the name of the function, right? So if you watch the section where we learned about loops in JavaScript, you may remember this for each function. Basically what this does is just calls a specific JavaScript function for each element in an array. So if you wanted to, let's say, print out all of the numbers in this array, what you could do is say numbers dot for each, and for each number, which we're calling x, we would just want to say console.log. And in this case, we could say something like the element is, and then we'll say plus X, which will insert that value into the string. And what you'll see is it'll say the element is one, two, three, four, five, all the way through 10. All right, so that's the for each function. There are some other important array functions that allow us to do things like modify the array. So let's say that we have our numbers array and we wanna add a number to the end of it, right? Let's say we wanna add 11 onto the end. Well, one way that you could do that, of course, is simply by saying numbers index 10 equals 11, right? We would see that that would work as well. Now numbers has this 11 on the end of it, but generally an easier way to do this is to use the built-in push function that arrays have in JavaScript, right? So by saying numbers.push, well, let's push the number 12 on, now that we have 11, that will automatically take care of adding whatever we put inside these parentheses here on the end of the array, right? So we don't need to worry about the length of the array as we did when we uh, used this method up here of specifying the last index. And as we can see now, 12 has been successfully added onto the end of the array. Now the opposite of this push function is a function called pop. And these are just references to queues, by the way, such as pushing an element onto the end of a queue and popping an element off of a queue. If we say numbers.pop, and we don't need to put any value in between these parentheses here, basically what that'll do is A, 
it will return the last element in the array, right? Right. So whatever was at the very end of the array, in this case, it's 12. And B, it will actually remove that element from the array for us, right? So if we call numbers.pop, that will get rid of 12. If we were to call that again, that would get rid of 11 and also return 11 so that we would be able to say something like let last element equals numbers.pop, right? And that would automatically assign whatever value numbers.pop returned to last element and remove it from our numbers array. So if we say last element, we'll see that that's 10. And if we take another look at numbers, we'll see that that only goes up to nine now. And as I said, there's a lot of different functions like this that allow us to work with arrays and manipulate them in different ways. But that's something that we're going to take a look at elsewhere because honestly, that could take up an entire section. So anyway, those are the basic concepts of arrays in JavaScript, right? Just to uh, do a quick review here, we saw that arrays are defined using square brackets. The different elements inside an array can be accessed with square brackets as well using the index in between those square brackets. We learned that accessing elements outside the bounds of the array will just return undefined. And we also learned that there are a number of different functions that you can call on an array that will manipulate it in some way or just allow you to work with the data inside that array in some way. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've covered objects and arrays in JavaScript. The next thing that we're going to take a look at is functions in JavaScript. Now, two things. First thing is that functions are considered a separate type in JavaScript, which might seem kind of strange to some of you who are used to working with functions in languages such as Java, where functions aren't really their own type. They're just methods of a class. In JavaScript, functions are an actual data type that you can work with. So the second thing now is that just like with many, many other things in JavaScript, there are several different ways to define functions in JavaScript. There's several different syntaxes that you can work with, and that's what I'm going to go through with you here. Now, the first way to define functions in JavaScript is using the function keyword, and this is probably the most common thing that you'll see, right? It's the oldest way of doing it, and it's also got some benefits to it that I'll explain later on. Basically what it's going to look like is you're going to say function, that's the function keyword here, and then you're going to type the name of the function. So we'll call this one my function, let's say. And then after that, you're going to put parentheses. You can put any arguments that you want the function to have inside of here. I'll touch on that in more detail in just a minute. And after that, you're going to put curly braces. Again, JavaScript really likes curly braces. And inside these curly braces is what's called the function body. Now, the function body in JavaScript, you can basically put anything inside there that you want. And in order to return a value, right, in other words, to define the value that this function is going to evaluate when you call it, you're going to have to use the return key. So Right now, just as an example, we'll make this my function function return a string and we'll just say, hello, I'm a function. And one thing that you might have noticed here if you decided to use single quotation marks is that this apostrophe here will interfere with that. So if you wanted to use single quotation marks like that and have it still work, what you would have to do is put a backslash in front of that. That's called an escape character. Basically, that will tell JavaScript that we don't want this to count as closing the string, right? We just want that to be an apostrophe. So anyway, just a little side note there. So what this return statement will do inside a function is it will make it so that when we call this function, and you can call a function just by putting parentheses after it, like so, when you call this function, Whatever the return statement evaluates to will be returned. We'll see that it says, hello, I'm a function. And if we define a variable saying something like let result equals my function, then the value of our result variable will be equal to that, right? So that's how we define the return value of a function in JavaScript is using this return keyword here. Now, if you want to have arguments inside your function, what that would look like is you just say function, We'll say my other function. And inside these parentheses, 
And inside these parentheses, you're just going to have some variable names, right? Right, And those could just be something like X and Y. Notice here that unlike in a lot of other languages, because of JavaScript's dynamic typing system, you don't have to say int X or number X. You don't need to define the type and you don't even have to say let X, okay? You can just say X and Y and those two things will be accessible inside the body of the function as arguments. I'll show you how that works in just a minute. But in order to demonstrate this, let's just have our function return the sum of these two arguments, right? So the sum of X and Y will just return a string that says something like the sum is, and then in parentheses here, you're gonna wanna make sure to use parentheses because otherwise it won't work correctly. I'll show you why that is in just a minute here if you're curious. So we're gonna say return the sum is x plus y and close the curly braces. And then what we'll be able to do is call this my other function function with two numbers. So we'll just say something like 10 and 20. All right, and we'll see that that will return the sum is 30. So again, just as a side note here, if we had left the parentheses off of this, what would have happened because JavaScript basically goes left to right when you just have a bunch of plus signs without parentheses, what you would see is that the two numbers wouldn't actually be added together, they would be appended. So if we were to say the sum is 10 plus 20, you would see that that would have the sum is 1020 because basically it would just take the 10, stick it onto the end of this string, and then it would take the 20 and stick it onto the end of that string after adding 10, all right? So that's why we had to put the parentheses there. That was just kind of a side note. So anyway, that's the first syntax for defining functions in JavaScript using the function keyword and the function name. The second way of defining functions in JavaScript is by defining these functions as variables. So what I mean by that is instead of starting off with the function keyword like we did above, we're actually gonna say let, and then we'll say something like, function, uh, we'll do function three here because we've already got two other functions. And then we're gonna say equals in the same way as if we were gonna say let x equals five or let message equals hello. We're gonna say let function three equals and then we're gonna have the function keyword followed by parentheses. And from then on, it's pretty much just the same thing as what we saw up here, right? You have the curly braces, you can return some kind of value like so and you can close those parentheses like that. All right, and then in order to call function three, you would just put parentheses after it and it would behave in almost exactly the same way as the function that we just defined up here with the function keyword at the beginning. Now there is one key difference between this way of defining functions and this way of defining functions, and I'll describe that in more detail in just a minute, but first, let's take a look at the third syntax for defining functions. Yes, there are three different syntaxes for defining functions. This third way is actually a special case called arrow function syntax, and you'll see why that is in just a minute here. First of all, what it looks like is we start off in a similar way to what we did uh, up here when we were defining functions just by saying equals function parentheses. So we'll say let my arrow function, right, we'll just give it that name, and then we're gonna say equals, and instead of using the function keyword as we did up here, we're gonna start off by using parentheses, and this is gonna be followed not by curly braces yet, but instead by an arrow, which is just an equal sign and a greater than sign, as you can see here, right? This is where the arrow function gets its name because that looks like an arrow. So after this now is going to come the curly braces, and then you'll have the body of the function just like you did up here in the rest of our functions where you can have any other kind of logic you want and you can also have a return statement. So we'll just say in this case, return I'm an arrow function. And in that case, we're gonna have to use the escape character again for the apostrophe. I'm an arrow function. And then we'll close the curly braces. And in order to call this function, we're gonna call it in the exact same way by saying my arrow function with parentheses, and we'll see that that will display the return value like so. 
All right, now the main purpose of this arrow function syntax here is to make it easier to type function, right? In certain situations, especially when you have to do things like use the for each function on an array, there are plenty of situations where it's much easier to just use this arrow function syntax than to have to type out the entire function keyword, right? So it's really just meant to save you a few keystrokes when you're using a lot of functions. So there are, as I said, some further improvements with this arrow function. One of those improvements is that if the body of your function is only one line and that line is a return statement, then you can actually remove both the curly braces and the return keyword from your function, right? Right, so let's see what that looks like. If we were to say, let my other arrow function equals, and we would just have empty parentheses there because this function doesn't have any arguments right now. What we could do is instead of having the curly braces and the return keyword, if we wanted to just return this string here, we could just say, I'm, we'll use the escape character there again, an abbreviated arrow function. And what we would see is if we were to call this function by saying my other arrow function with parentheses after it, that would behave in just the same way as if we had used the curly braces and the return keyword up above. All right, so this is just an abbreviated syntax for arrow functions. Arrow functions go one step further, however, and that is if your function happens to have one single argument, right? This is only the case when your function has one argument. It's not the case when it has zero arguments or when it has two or more arguments. If your function only has one argument, you can leave the parentheses off, right? So let's say we were to define a function called double and all that function was supposed to do was take a number and double it. Then we could just say let double equals and if it took just x as an argument like so, we could just remove those parentheses from around x. And for the return statement, assuming we only wanted a single statement in the function's body, and that's the return statement, we could just say x times two, right? So you can see that this syntax for defining functions can really be quite a bit shorter than if you had to define the function using the function keyword, curly braces, and the return keyword. All right, and just to see this thing in action, we can now say double. And if we try and double a number like 20, we'll see that that will return the correct result. All right, so those are arrow functions. And as we've seen, there's quite a few different syntaxes that you'll see for those alone, not even counting the other function syntaxes. So just to review the different options for function syntax that we have in JavaScript, the first way, which is probably the most common way that you'll see is using the function keyword, where you say function, the name of the function, parentheses and arguments. Uh, the next way is where you use the function keyword, but define it as a variable like this. And the last way is the arrow function way. And uh, there's basically a lot of different sort of optimizations there that make it easier and slightly shorter to type out. So, so again, JavaScript just tends to have a lot of different ways to do the same thing. And I really do think that it's important that you know all of these different syntaxes for functions because for some reason, people just like to use them kind of interchangeably in different situations. So if you go on Stack Overflow, let's say, you'll see that some people use arrow functions, some people tend to use the function keyword first, some people tend to use functions like what we saw here, where they define it as a variable. It really just kind of depends on the situation. Now, as far as the differences between these different syntaxes that we've seen, because there are some important differences uh, that we won't go too far in detail with right now, because they're not gonna be that important to you at this point. But the main thing to know is that when you define functions using the function keyword first, right? So using syntax number one, we'll call it, this function is accessible anywhere else in the file, even before it's already been defined. So uh, just as an example, if we were to create a JavaScript file, I'm just gonna open up an empty file here for demonstration purposes. If we were to define a function called my function like so, and you know, it would have some kind of function body in here, of course, we would actually be able to call that function up above where it was defined, right? So we could say my function and everything would work correctly. And that's because JavaScript does what's called hoisting functions that are defined in this way, right? So in other words, JavaScript, as we're running the program, will go through and look for these kinds of functions and look for these kinds of functions and where they're used. And it'll make sure that we're able to call them earlier in the code than where we actually define them.
okay? And this is not true if we use the other two function syntaxes, right? So if we were to say, let my function equals function, right? If we were to use syntax number two, this code here wouldn't work, right? We would get an error saying that my function isn't defined and the same thing would be true with an arrow function. So anyway, that's the main difference there is that functions defined with the function keyword first are hoisted and can be used anywhere else in the file they're defined in. And as far as arrow functions, arrow functions do have one important difference as well. And that has to do with something that we haven't even talked about yet. So I'm not going to go too far into detail with it. And that is the this keyword in JavaScript, right? So it's similar to this in Java and keywords like self in Python, but in JavaScript, it works much differently. And the arrow function has something to do with that. But for now, Again, we're not going to go into detail on that because it's way over your head at this point. Just know that there is that difference there between these different syntaxes for functions in JavaScript. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've covered objects, arrays, and functions in JavaScript. So we're gonna close out here by talking about some of the less used types in JavaScript. And just as a reminder, those are going to be big ints. All right, so these are large numbers, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about symbols. And we're going to talk about the undefined type, which we've already mentioned a few times, but we'll talk about it in a little more detail here. So starting off with big ints, we saw when we talked about numbers in JavaScript that JavaScript has some serious precision problems with numbers. And this can be demonstrated by adding together something like 0 0.1 and 0 0.7, where you see that you get 0 0.799999 instead of 0 0.8. Now this is just an isolated instance. If you did 0 0.1 plus 0 0.9, for example, you would end up with one. So it really just kind of depends on where the line falls behind the scenes with JavaScript's number system and how that's stored in memory. All right, but another place that we saw that JavaScript numbers have problems is when you start getting into very large numbers, right? So if we do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you'll see that even just entering that into the terminal here gives us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, blah, 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 and it ends in eight, right? So, right, so it outputs a different number than the number we just entered. All right, so in order to compensate for this difficulty with numbers in JavaScript, JavaScript provides a special type called big ints. And basically, these are just very large numbers that JavaScript specifically works with behind the scenes to make sure they don't lose accuracy as they get larger. So, uh, Basically, if we were to try and do the same thing and add an N onto the end of this, which converts it into a big int, that just converts this into a big integer type in instead of a number type, similar to how in some other languages, adding an F after a number converts that number into a floating point number, even if it looks like an integer, right? Like if you said three F, that would make it a floating point number automatically. But in JavaScript, the only place we do that is with big integers. And, and as we can see, that helps us keep precision as we get larger and larger numbers, right? So you could say, uh, you know, some very large number n times some other very large number n, and you would see that that would give you the correct answer, right? So JavaScript would know how to deal with that kind of thing. Whereas with regular numbers, as we saw, JavaScript starts to break down at a fairly small number compared to what you might run into in certain types of programs. Now, one thing to be aware of with big integers is that this is one of the places where JavaScript sort of breaks its habit of weak typing, right? So we saw earlier that since JavaScript is fairly weakly typed, we can generally add two different types together, right? We can add a string. So we can say hello and then add that together with a number. And that's perfectly fine, right? And we can do that with a Boolean. It works just fine. We can do that with an object even and that'll work as well. Although JavaScript actually has a specific way of converting this to a string, uh, which we see here. But the point is that generally JavaScript is perfectly fine with us adding different types together or, you know, just 
doing arithmetic with different types, although many times if a number is involved, it will return not a number. But big integers is one place where JavaScript is a little more strict because what JavaScript doesn't want to happen is for you to define some giant integer number like that with n, and then try and multiply that number by a regular number, right? So if you were to try and multiply that by two, what you're gonna see is that we actually get an error that says uncaught type error, cannot mix big int and other types. So in other words, JavaScript just wants to prevent you from mixing the big int type with other types and losing precision that way, right? Because if you were to try and do, you know, times two point blah, 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 since this is an integer, right? Big ints are explicitly integer numbers. This would probably not give you the result that you would want. So anyway, that's just uh, one thing to be aware of with big ints. Big ints as a type really aren't used very often. They're used in specific applications, like, I don't know, maybe cryptography programs use these big ints. But personally, I very rarely, if ever, work with big ints in my JavaScript code. I just wanted to uh, make sure you knew that they were there in case you have need of them. So anyway, that's big ints. I'm not gonna go too much more in detail with those. Let's move on to the symbol type. Now the symbol type in JavaScript is again, something that you're probably almost never going to work with unless you get really, really deep into JavaScript programming and wanna do things like metaprogramming, which is actually changing the internals of how JavaScript works itself by writing JavaScript code. Pretty cool stuff actually, but you're probably not gonna use symbols but I'm just gonna show you their basic idea in case you ever see them somewhere. All right, so the idea behind symbols, first of all, the way that you create a symbol is simply by saying symbol with two parentheses after it, and inside those parentheses, you can add a name, right? So you could say my symbol. And what that'll do is create a new symbol for it. Now, the idea behind symbols in JavaScript is that symbols will never be equal to each other unless they're the same symbol. That might sound a little bit confusing, so let me show you what I mean. If we were to just say symbol, my symbol, and test if that's equal to another symbol by defining a separate one, symbol, my symbol, we'll even give it the same name, these two symbols are not going to be equal to each other, even though we define them in the exact same way. And that's the idea behind symbols. Now, you might be confused as to why you would ever want something like this in a programming language. Well, basically symbols are mainly used for metaprogramming. And what I mean by that is, let's say that inside one of our programs, we wanna have an object that contains some kind of data, right? So might have a person's name, in there along with some other properties. And in addition to that data, you might also have some data in that object that doesn't actually belong to the object itself, right? So in other words, you might have data whose main purpose is to help your program that you're writing function better and that doesn't really have anything to do with the object you're defining, right? right? So an example of this might be a property in your object called number of properties which simply tells the rest of your program how many properties this object has, right? So in this case, it might just be one or two or however many properties this person has, right? Now, the problem with this is that if you add this number of properties property to a lot of different objects in your program, you might run into certain situations where you actually have an object that needs to have that property with that name, but used in a different context, right? So just as an example of this, let's say that John Doe is a real estate investor and you wanna have a specific property on that object called number of properties, but that refers to the number of real estate properties John Doe owns, right? Well, in that case, you're gonna run into a rather tricky dilemma because you already have this number of properties property that you're using for internal purposes, right? That is to count the number of properties that the object has in your program instead of the number of properties that the person John Doe owns. Well, that's where symbols come in and, and that's where the fact that two symbols will never be equal to each other is helpful because what we can actually do is use symbols as object property names, all right? so. What this would look like here is if John Doe, again, was a real estate investor and we wanted to have number of properties that John owns, 
and the number of properties that John Doe's object has, we could define those separately using this symbol, right? So we could say name John Doe, we could say number of properties, and this would be the number of properties now that John Doe owns. So maybe John Doe owns 10 real estate properties. And then in order to define another property called number of properties, but that doesn't override this original number of properties property, all we would have to do is create a symbol and we would have to put that in square brackets for reasons that we'll talk about in more detail elsewhere. Basically, you just have to do this when the property name is not a string in an object. So we could create a symbol called number of properties here. And that could be the internally used property that shows us how many different properties a given object has. All right, so anyway, this is a pretty advanced topic, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail about it, but just know that symbols in JavaScript are used for that purpose, right? Right, mainly to prevent two properties of an object from conflicting with each other when you're doing something like metaprogramming, all right? Cool, so we talked about big ints, we talked briefly about symbols. The last thing we're gonna talk about is undefined. Now, we've talked about undefined already. We've, we've seen that basically it represents variables that don't have a value, right? So if we say let x and don't assign a value to x, we'll see that x is undefined and that the type of x is undefined as well, right? And the same thing is true in certain other situations. Let's say that we define a function. We'll say function my function. And let's say this function doesn't return anything, right? It doesn't have any kind of return statement. Well, when we call that function, what it's going to return is undefined, right? So undefined is basically just JavaScript's way of telling us that there is no value there, right? So the same thing would be true if we were to define another function and that function was going to take an argument. So we'll just say, we'll just call that argument X and let's just say console.log X and print that out. If we were to call another function now without an argument, x is going to be undefined, right? So we'll see that logged out here, and we also see the return statement of that function is undefined. Now, some other situations that we've already seen where you might run into undefined would be if you're trying to access a property on some object that doesn't exist. So you could say let person, and I'm not gonna define any properties on here for now, just for brevity. If you were to say person.name or person some property you're gonna see that that gives you undefined. And similarly, the same thing happens with arrays when you try and access an index that goes beyond the bounds of the array, right? So if you say let my array, and we'll just do an empty array here, and then you try and say my array index 100, that's gonna give you undefined as well. So the point here is just that there's a lot of different places where you'll run into the value undefined, and that's really the reason that undefined exists in JavaScript. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. At this point, you should have a pretty good understanding of some of the most fundamental concepts in the JavaScript language, including how to do things like structure your JavaScript programs, as well as how to work with the main data types that JavaScript provides. So what we're gonna take a look at next are three very important concepts that you'll need to know about JavaScript going forward that will really help you make the most of this language and avoid strange errors. So these three concepts are scoping, equality, and error handling. And the way that these things are implemented in the JavaScript language are, in my mind, pretty unique compared to other programming languages. So with that said, let's jump right in and see what this is all about. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about here is something that tends to be pretty confusing for people who are fairly new to JavaScript, and that is the difference between function scoped variables, right? So uh, this is something that we briefly mentioned elsewhere. Uh, function scoped variables are variables that are defined using the var keyword in JavaScript. 
So we're going to talk about the difference between function scoped variables and block scoped variables. And block scoped variables, on the other hand, are variables that are defined using the let keyword. Now, when I mentioned this elsewhere, I strongly recommended that you stick to using the let keyword instead of the var keyword to define variables in JavaScript because block scoped variables are really probably what you're used to if you've ever worked with any other programming language, right? So function scoped variables are something that's actually pretty unique to JavaScript as far as I know. Um, and that's just kind of the way that variables were originally designed in JavaScript was to be function scoped, but it ended up causing so many problems that later on JavaScript added block scoped variables as another option that you could define using this let keyword. So that's the first thing that we're going to be talking about here today is the difference between these two types of variables. Now, in order to demonstrate all of this, I've created a new folder, right? Just, I've just called it JS examples. You can really call yours, whatever you want that the name of the folder isn't really what's important here. And what I'm going to do is inside this folder, I'm just going to create a new file, which I'll call, I don't know, something like index.js. Again, the name of the file isn't that important either. It's just kind of uh, going to be a space for us to write our codes. Since these examples that will show you the difference between these types of variables really need to be more than one line. They're not really something that's easy to demonstrate in the node shell or in the browser shell. So anyway, let's start off here by taking a look at block scoped variables in JavaScript. Again, block scoped variables, if you've ever done programming with any other kind of programming language before, these are probably what you're used to and they'll behave more or less like what you'd expect. So with block scoped variables, which in JavaScript again are defined using the let keyword. So for example, we might say let X equals five. Basically the scope of this variable where you can ultimately use this variable is limited to the block that this variable is defined inside of. Right now, if you happen to define your variable just directly in the file, like we just did here, basically what that means is that variable will be accessible anywhere else inside the file, right? So if we were to have an if statement here, uh, we'll just say if true, just for the sake of example here, but obviously you'd want to have some kind of condition in there generally. Inside this block, we would obviously be able to refer to X, right? So we would say console.log X. And if we were to run this program, which you can do by running node index.js, you'll see that it prints out the value of that variable correctly. All right, now the reverse of this is not true. If we were to define let X equals five inside this if statement and put this console.log X underneath the if statement, then what we would see if we tried to run this code again is that we would get an error, right? Saying that X is not defined. And that's because again, the scope of this variable X is limited to the nearest block that it's defined inside of right now. Blocks in JavaScript are generally going to be defined by these little curly braces, which uh, you've probably noticed by now are seen everywhere in JavaScript. So as we've seen here, since we define this variable inside this block and this console.log X is outside the block, that's basically outside the variable's scope and we're not able to access this. And the same thing is true with functions too, by the way, right? If we were to define this let X equals five, and let's say we have some kind of function inside of here instead of an if statement, right? So we'll say function, my function, like so. And that's just going to print the value of X. As we can see, if we call that function now, what we're going to see is that everything will work exactly the way you might expect, right? X will be printed out by the function and we'll see that five is printed out to the console. And as a rule, this is going to be true, as I said, of pretty much any block, no matter how deep you go, right? So in JavaScript, it's possible to have nested functions. So just to give us a further example, we'll say something like function inner function and we'll have this function be the one that says console.log x and if we call inner function from inside my function then we'll see that we still have access to x right if we run node index.js we get the same result no matter what now on the other hand if this x variable is defined inside my function and outside inner function Inner function is still going to have access to that because it's still technically inside this block where X was defined, right? 
So any blocks that go deeper, right, as this inner function does, are going to have access to the value of variables, but the reverse isn't true, as we saw earlier, right? If we had x defined inside this inner function and we wanted to console log x from outside that, we're going to get an error in this case again, because x in this case isn't defined. So again, this is probably something that you're already used to and familiar with if you've worked with any other programming language. Uh, every programming language that I can think of, Python, Java, C++, etc., they basically all follow this block scoping method of determining variable scope. All right, so let's move on now to talking about function scoped variables, right? And function scoped variables, unlike block scoped variables, are defined using the var keyword. All right, so just to uh, delete everything here and start fresh, if we were to say var x equals five, right? This x now is going to be a function scoped variable. Now the good news is that with regards to functions, function scoped variables work exactly the same way as we saw with block scoped variables, right? So if you were to have a function here, my function, we'll just write that out again. And inside here, we're gonna say console.log x. If we call my function now and execute it, when we run our code, we'll see that we get five printed out to the console, just like we did with our block scoped variable when we uh, defined this variable using the let keyword. And the reverse is gonna be true as well, right? If we define this X inside my function using the var keyword and try and console log X outside that function, and here we'll even put it underneath my function. There we go. If we run this code now, we'll see the same error that we got before with our block scoped variables saying that X is not defined. So again, with regards to functions, function scoped variables and block scoped variables are going to work in pretty much exactly the same way. Now the difference here comes in when we start working with blocks that are not functions. So if we go back now to our if statement, right? We'll say something like uh, if true, and then inside here, we define a variable using the var keyword, and we say var x equals five. Then what you're gonna see is if we try and log this variable x underneath that if statement and run our code, you'll see that that says five, right? Whereas with block scoped variables, this would have given us an error. And that's where the big difference between function scoped and block scoped variables comes in, right? Function scoped variables basically just ignore these curly braces on every single construct in JavaScript except for functions, right? Right. So you could have a very deeply nested if statement, right? If true, if true, if true, if true. I'm just going to put two here now, but the same thing is going to be the case no matter how deep we go. And you'll still be able to access this variable x outside all of those blocks, right? So basically those blocks are just completely ignored by function scoped variables. Now this can cause a bit of difficulty depending on your circumstances. Probably one of the situations where I see the var keyword most commonly misused is in for loop, right? So let's say that for some reason or other, we have to use an ugly for loop, which in JavaScript looks like this. If you haven't seen this before, don't worry too much about it. We just say four, and then we have a declaration here is the first segment of the for loops parentheses. And normally we would say let i equals zero or let x equals zero. So I'll just start off with that and then we'll see what the difference between this and the var keyword is. Perhaps you can already guess. And then of course, we're just gonna say i is less than, I don't know, something like 10. And then we'll say i is equal to i plus one. And by the way, uh, JavaScript does allow you to use the plus plus notation if you want to simply increment the value of a numerical variable. So by saying I plus plus, we're just telling JavaScript that we want to increment this variable I each and every time. So inside this for loop now, let's say console.log and we'll log out the value of I each time. And what you'll see if you run this now is that we'll simply get the numbers from zero to nine printed out each one on its own line, right? So nothing too strange there. What you'll also see is that if you try and access the value now of i outside this for loop, right, by saying console.log i, you will rightfully see an error saying that i is not defined since this right here is outside the scope of i, right? So i doesn't exist 
when we're trying to say console.log i outside the for loop, and it does exist inside the for loop. Again, this is almost definitely what you would have guessed coming from languages like Python, Java, C++, etc. right? Now, let's say that instead of using the let keyword, as I've recommended several times, we instead use the var keyword to define i. Well, you might already be able to guess by now what's going to happen with this. If we end up running our code, what you'll see is that we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through 9, and then when we call console.log i outside the for loop, we see that i still exists, right? So when we use the var keyword in situations like this, whether it's in a for loop, whether it's in an if statement, whether it's in any other kind of block, really, we're going to see that that variable will continue to exist outside that block. Now, as I mentioned, this can end up causing quite a bit of confusion since in many situations like this, you just expect that a variable is going to cease to exist after its block is over. But then we'll see later on that that variable is still there and that we can still use it, right? So if you're not careful with this kind of thing, this could potentially turn your code into a bit of a tangled mess, right? Let's say a developer comes along and innocently enough ends up using this I in some kind of function, right? So we might say something like function, my function, well, in this case, because we defined that variable i using the var keyword, we're still going to be able to access that value inside my function, right? So if you were to use my function in multiple other places in the code, what you would see is that that function would still have access to that value, right? We're still seeing 10 getting printed out here. And that does have the potential, as I said, to get your code a little bit tangled, since at this point now, we wouldn't be able to change var back into let without breaking our code, right? We would see that if we try and run this again, we now get an error. So anyway, that's why I always recommend that you use the let keyword to define variables instead of the var keyword, because quite frankly, the let keyword just works how variables are supposed to work, and the var keyword doesn't, right? It really just comes down to that. So anyway, that's the moral of the story. Always use let in JavaScript. And if you happen to see var in another code base, right? Let's say you join another company, or maybe the company you work at right now has var all over its code base. Just know that var behaves in some slightly unpleasant ways, so just tread with caution there. And just one more detail as well. We saw elsewhere that in order to define constants in JavaScript, you use the const keyword, right? So you would say const my constant equals hello, right? Something like that. Constants in JavaScript are by default block scoped, right? So you don't have to worry about constants. Constants behave scope wise the same way as the let keyword. So I just wanted to point that out because people tend to ask about that as well. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've covered some of the technical details of function scoping versus block scoping with regards to JavaScript variables, the next topic that we're going to cover is the topic of equality in JavaScript. All right, now you may have noticed elsewhere that whenever we've wanted to compare the values of two variables or simply two values, right, to see if they're equal, we use the triple equals sign, right? Three equal signs in a row instead of what you might see in most other languages, and that is the double equals sign. All right, now you might be thinking that this is just a weird syntax decision on JavaScript's part, that JavaScript simply chose to use the triple equals sign instead of double equals, and that double equals just plain doesn't exist in JavaScript. Well, the problem is that that's actually not true, right? Both of these equal signs exist in JavaScript. And really the problem that most newbies to JavaScript encounter is that they behave very similarly, except in a few rather critical situations. And that's what we're going to take a look at here today. So on the surface, both of these equals signs, the triple equals and the double equals, are going to behave more or less like what you might expect, right? If we just open up a node shell here to get ourselves started, this is where I'm going to be typing out my examples. And let's say that we have two variables. We'll say let x equals 5. 
let y equals five as well, and then we'll have the estranged z, which will not be equal to the other two. All right, so if we try and test whether or not these variables are equal to each other using both the triple equals and double equals signs, we're gonna see that they'll behave pretty much like what we would expect, right? If we say x is equal to y, we'll get true. If we say x is equal to z, we'll get false. And the same thing is gonna happen if we use the double equals sign. If we say x is equal to y, we'll get true, and x is double equal to z, we'll get false. All right, so, so far it looks like the double equal sign and the triple equal sign both behave in pretty much the same way, right? The weirdness, however, starts to come in when we compare values that are not the same type, right? So we know that X is the number five, right? It's the number type in JavaScript, and you can see this by saying type of X, and we'll see number. But what happens, do you think, if we try and compare X using the triple equal sign to the string five? Right, well, if we use the triple equals sign, we're gonna get false just like you'd expect, right? Because the number five, in my opinion anyway, and a JavaScript's opinion is not equal to the string five. However, if we say X is double equal to the string five, we'll see that that actually returns true. All right, and you can see this a little bit more graphically even if you just uh, type in a number and say double equals and then type in that same number as a string, we'll see that that's considered to be true by JavaScript, even though those two things aren't the same type. And we'll see that 10 triple equals the string 10 is going to be false. So essentially then the main difference between the triple equals sign and the double equals sign is that the double equals sign compares two variables or two values without regard to their type, right? So the number five is considered to be equal by JavaScript uh, with the double equals to the string five. And the same thing actually occurs, let's say if you compare a number to a big integer, right? If we say something like uh, 25 is triple equals to 25 N, well, since those two things are not the same type, we get false with triple equals. But if we compare those again with a double equals, we'll see that those are technically considered to be double equals equal to each other in JavaScript. Now, things get even weirder with specific values when working with the double equal sign in JavaScript. And we can illustrate this by the fact that the number zero is equal to the string zero, right? That's not that weird. But the number zero is also double equals equal to an empty string, right? We see that that's true. And, and that might not be something that you would have expected, right? I was actually surprised when I just glanced over and saw that in my notes. I was like, really? That's, that's double equals equal to each other in JavaScript? Well, yes, it is, unfortunately. And it gets even worse because the number zero is equal also to the empty array in JavaScript. We see that that is also considered to be true. And by the way, all of this weirdness goes away if you use the triple equals sign, right? If we say zero is triple equals equal to the string zero, we get false. Same thing with the empty string, we're gonna get false. And same thing with the empty array, we're gonna get false, right? And it's for this reason that I generally recommend that people stick to using the triple equals sign, right? Good. Instead of the double equals sign, which is weird, right? I don't want to say bad because there are some situations where it's kind of nice to work with the double equals sign, some very, very few situations. But anyway, the behavior of the double equals sign is generally just weird. Now, in case you think that you see a pattern going on with this double equals sign and that maybe it's got something to do with falsy values when you compare the number zero to something else, well, unfortunately, that's not actually the case because if you compare zero to a falsy value such as undefined, right? If you say zero double equals undefined, oops, let me try retyping that there, right? And the same thing is true with the value null, that's also false, right? So there's really not any rhyme or reason behind some of the things that the double equals sign considers to be equivalent in JavaScript. And again, that's why I usually recommend to avoid using the double equals sign and just sticking to using the triple equals sign. Now, for those of you who are trying to look on the bright side of the double equals sign and find some you know, possible applications for it in JavaScript, probably the example that you're coming up with in your head right now 
is something along the lines of, what if I write an application where the user has to enter a number and that input is a string and I wanna compare that to see if that's a number, right? So, right? so in other words, if we collect a number from the user, right, we'll just say one, two, three, and we wanna see whether that's equal to the number one, two, three, well, we could just use the double equals sign and we'd get true, right? Well, this does work, but generally what I recommend instead of doing this is to explicitly convert one of these values to the other type, right? So if the value that you got from the user is a string because you got it from a text input, and text inputs are something that we'll take a look at elsewhere, but just know that generally speaking, the input that you get from a text input, right, an HTML input element is going to be a string, well, what you're going to want to do instead of using the double equals sign, which is, as we've seen, a little bit unreliable at best, you're just going to want to try and explicitly convert the user's input to a number. And you can do that in JavaScript by saying number and then putting in the input like so. And it'll try its best to convert that to a number if it can't convert it to a number, just in case you're wondering that, right? If we say ABC, then that'll just give us not a number, right? That'll give us that special number value that tells us that something went wrong in some number related operation. All right, so we've seen the triple equal sign, we've seen the double equal sign, and we've seen that the main difference between them is that the triple equal sign actually pays attention to the data type of the two values that we're comparing, and the double equal sign doesn't, which can cause some very strange behavior as we've seen. So the last thing that I want to cover here is the topic of object and array equality, right? So let's say that we have two objects or two arrays and we wanna check whether those two things are equal. And by equal, let's first define what we mean by equal when we're talking about objects, right? We'll just say something like let person one equals, we'll just say name John Doe, age 50, right? And let's say we have person two, and person two has the same properties, right? Well, most people would consider these objects to be equal because they contain the exact same properties and the exact same values. But something to be very aware of in JavaScript is that no two objects will ever be considered equal to each other by either the triple equals or the double equals sign, right? So even though person one and person two both have the exact same properties and values, if we say person one is triple equals to person two, we're gonna get false. And the same thing for the double equals, if we say person one double equals person two, that will also give us false, right? So in this situation, and this is something that we'll talk about in much more detail elsewhere, but basically when you're using the equals sign, right, either the triple or double equals sign with two objects, and this is true of arrays as well as we'll see, what the triple equals or double equals sign is doing is checking whether or not these two things are references in memory to the same object, right? And this is something we haven't really talked about, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail on it right here because there are just better places to do it. But if we were to say something like let person three equals person one, well, what we've done here, this doesn't actually create a copy of person one and assign it to person three. It actually just makes the variable person three point to the same object in memory as person one, right? Right. So if you wanna picture these two declarations here as just creating a little space in memory where we're storing the object's properties, right? Name and age, this is person one. And we're doing the same thing with person two, right? What, uh, what the equal sign does is it checks to see whether those two variables are pointing to the same box, right? So uh, in both cases, since we have separate boxes here that both of these things are pointing to, the answer is going to be false as we've seen. However, what we're doing down here with let person three equals person one is we're saying person three and we're just pointing it at that same box, that, right? That same area in memory as person one is pointing to. So what this means is that when we say person three is equal to person one, all right, I'm gonna test this out right now. Person three is equal to person one. We're gonna see that that's actually true. And the same thing is gonna be the case if we use the double equals sign. That will also be true, meaning not necessarily that these two objects have the same keys and values, although they do, but it's referring more to the fact that 
in memory, this is the same object, right? And you can see that if uh, you change a property on person three, let's say person three dot age equals 100, you'll see that on person one, that age is now set to 100, right? So these are basically just two separate variables pointing to the same portion in memory. So changes to one will be reflected in changes to the other. All right, so that's equality as it has to do with objects. The same thing as I said is true with arrays. So if we say something like let numbers one, and we'll just have one, two, three, four, like so. And then we say let numbers two equals one, two, three, four. Well, meaning that they contain the same elements in the same order and the same number of elements, even though they look like they're equal to us, JavaScript is not going to consider them to be equal because we're gonna to have to say numbers one is equal to numbers two, that'll be false, and numbers one double equal numbers two is also going to be false, right? Because again, first of all, arrays are considered to be objects by JavaScript. If we say type of numbers one, we'll see that that's an object. Since JavaScript doesn't have a separate array type, arrays are just special objects. So anyway, JavaScript treats array equality in pretty much the same way as object equality. Now, you might be wondering, how then can we see if two objects are equal, right? How do we check to see if two objects have the same keys and values for those keys? Well, really in that case, what you're gonna have to do is conduct what's generally referred to as a deep equals check, where basically all you do is loop through all of the keys in the object, and for an array, you're just gonna loop through all of the elements in that array and check to see if it equals the corresponding element in the second array that you're comparing it to. All right, and for now, I'm just gonna leave that up to you as an exercise if you wanna try and implement a deep equals function that you can pass into objects or to arrays to and see if they're equal. So anyway, that is the rather lengthy and somewhat convoluted topic of equality in JavaScript. Just as a reminder, the main takeaway here is that you should always err on the side of using the triple equals sign. There really are very, very few, if any, situations where you'll wanna use the double equals sign. So you wanna use the triple equals, you don't wanna use the double equals. If you see a double equal, and it's specifically being used to compare uh, two variables of different types, right? Like a number and a string of that number, then do the person who wrote that code a favor and just change it to what we saw up here where you explicitly convert one into the other and use the triple equal sign. And oops, I actually didn't even do that here. So let me just correct that and paste that here. This should be triple equals and we'll see that that will also be true. That's generally considered to be the right way to compare two values of different types instead of using the double equals sign. So one more time, I'll repeat it. Use the triple equals in JavaScript. Don't use the double equals in JavaScript. Oh, and another thing that I actually haven't even mentioned yet, I can't believe I forgot to do this, is that if you want to invert this, right? In other words, if you wanna to check to see if two values in JavaScript are not equal, there is a corresponding not equals for both the triple equals sign and the double equals sign, and that's going to look like this respectively. We're gonna say 10 is not equal to uh, 10, and that will of course be false since the two are equal. If we say 10 does not equal, uh, I don't know, some other number, seven, that'll be true. And the same thing is gonna be true if we compare uh, two things that are different types using the triple equals. So with the triple equals, basically just the first equal sign turns into a not symbol. And the same thing is true with the double equals. If we say 10 does not equal, double equals that is, 10 will get false since, again, with the double equal sign, those two are considered to be equal. So that's how you convert the triple equal sign and double equal signs to not. Just wanted to mention that before we closed out here. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've discussed two fairly nitty gritty topics in JavaScript, the first was variable scoping, right? So we learned about function scoping versus block scoping, and then we also took a look at equality, right? Using the triple equals and double equals signs in JavaScript. 
The next thing that we're going to talk about is errors. Now, assuming that you've done some kind of software development before, you'll probably be well aware that errors happen quite frequently in programs, especially when we're writing applications that communicate over a network or that rely on connecting to some external service. So in JavaScript, it's pretty important that we know how to work with errors and that we know how to catch errors when they occur and handle them appropriately. Now, before we get into that, what I want to do first is talk about some of the main built-in errors in the JavaScript language, right? And we've already seen a few of these just by generating them naturally. Basically, these built-in errors cover some of the most common cases in JavaScript where something goes wrong when running a program. All right, now the first of these errors is what's referred to as a reference error. All right, so a reference error which is spelled like that, is going to occur basically when you try and access a variable that doesn't exist. So we actually saw this when we were talking about function scoping versus block scoping, right? If we define a variable inside a block of some kind, right? We'll say if true, let x equals five, and this is a block scoped variable because remember we used the let keyword. Then if we try and access x outside this block, by saying something like console.log x, this is going to throw a reference error. And you can see this by running the code with node index.js. And sure enough, you'll see that JavaScript tells you what kind of error just occurred. All right, so again, the reference error just means that you tried to reference a variable or a function or something like that that doesn't exist, right? JavaScript just has no idea what it is, even though it's technically valid JavaScript syntax. All right, and speaking of syntax, another common built-in error in JavaScript is something called a syntax error, all right? So a syntax error basically just means that while running the program, the JavaScript program encountered some sort of statement or some sort of syntax that it did not understand whatsoever, right? An example of this would be if we were to say, I don't know, if, and then we were to forget the parentheses, right? Because the parentheses, that's really the only valid syntax available in JavaScript for if statements. That's just how it works. And so what JavaScript is gonna do, it's gonna take a look at this if keyword. It's gonna say, okay, cool. I guess I'm going to find some parentheses after this. And then it finds a T, an R, a U, and an E. And it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not valid syntax. And it will throw this syntax error, right? You can see this if, uh, here, let's just comment this other code out so that it doesn't stop before then. You can see this if you run the code now. We'll see that we have a syntax error. It says unexpected token true. And this unexpected token part, right, that might be a little bit confusing for you if you haven't worked with JavaScript much before. Basically, unexpected token just refers to what I described there, right? JavaScript has a specific expectation for what should come after a given keyword or uh, the syntax that it should find in a specific situation, and you somehow shattered its expectations by putting something there that doesn't belong, right? And you can even see this, depending on your IDE, if you just hover over this red underline here, uh, you can see that what my IDE is saying is that it's expecting an opening parentheses there. And that's what generates a syntax error, right? As a matter of fact, it's actually very easy to generate a syntax error. All you have to do is just kind of mash your keyboard a little bit and JavaScript will oblige and show you a syntax error, right? If you just save that and then try and run your code, you'll see that that gives you a syntax error as well, right? It'll just say invalid or unexpected token, which is basically just JavaScript's way of saying, you know, I you gotta help me out here. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so anyway, that is the syntax error. And just as a side note here, we talked elsewhere about how JavaScript is an interpreted language instead of a compiled language, which means that when we run our code, right, when we type in node, and a file name telling the Node environment that we wanna run the code inside a given file, Node is going to actually be looking at the code that we wrote. Now, this is in contrast to compiled languages like Java, where you actually have to compile the code that you wrote and translate that into some kind of machine code that the runtime can actually interpret, right? 
Now in compiled languages, this syntax error would actually be found at compile time, generally speaking, right? So before you're able to actually run the program, the compiler would tell you that this error exists. However, in JavaScript, you're not gonna see this error until you actually run the program. Now this is a little bit unnerving for some people and here's why, right? Let's say that we have an if statement. I'll just use if true and then we'll have an else block as well. And let's say that the top of the if block just has some kind of basic code in there, console.log, hello. And furthermore, let's say that this case here is by far the most common case, right? So this is gonna cover, I don't know, let's just throw out a number, 99% of the situations. And this other case here is something that a lot of developers don't even think to check. Now the problem comes in if we try and do something like what we did up here, right? We'll just say something like console.log x, right? Now, of course, x doesn't exist here. So what we would expect if this were a compiled language, which it isn't, is for the compiler to actually pick up on that fact and say, hey, whoa, hold on. You're trying to access a variable that doesn't exist here. You can't do that. That's an error, right? Before you're even able to run the program. However, in JavaScript, since again, it's an interpreted language, this error won't actually be found unless this code is run. And again, that's gonna be a little bit unnerving for people because if we had another console log statement underneath here, right, such as hello again, then this error will never actually be caught until, as I said, the else block is executed. So if we were to run this code now, by saying node index.js, you'd see hello, hello again, as if we didn't just write something that would throw an error in between the two, all right? Now, if we change this to if false, we will actually see the error. Now, the problem with this, of course, is when you're a JavaScript developer writing code that's not used very frequently in some larger program, right? The problem with that is you could write something that doesn't make any sense, right? Some code that would never execute correctly, like this code here, and until that code is actually called by the rest of the program, you won't actually know that that code doesn't work, right? In our case here, we would never have known that this code didn't work if we didn't specifically check this case. And it's for this reason why test-driven development is such a popular thing in the JavaScript community, because it makes sure that every line of code gets called and it makes sure that a, you know, a line of code like this one here that's going to cause the program to crash doesn't make its way in. All right, so that's just something I wanted to point out about errors in general. And as a matter of fact, this sort of thing isn't true with things like syntax errors, right? If we were to just write some nonsense code in here and say, if, hello, something like that, right? That's obviously nonsense code and we can see that it has a little red underline there. And even if we were to change this to if true and this code would never get executed, if we try and run this code with node index.js, we're still gonna get an error telling us that there's an unexpected token, even though we didn't actually try and run this section of the code, all right? So JavaScript environments will generally find these kinds of syntax errors, but it's, it's the more innocuous errors like what we just saw with console.log that end up remaining hidden until they cause the program to crash. So anyway, now that we've got that out of the way, let's just go back here and we'll just uh, retype our nasty syntax error thing there. And we'll leave that there as an example. Now the next type of error in JavaScript that we're gonna look at is the type error. And this basically happens when we try and use a given type in JavaScript in a way that it's not supposed to be used. All right, so a good example of this would be, let's say we were to define an object, right? So we'll say let person, oh, and this is a type error, by the way, let me just type that here so that uh, we have that as a note. Let's say that we were to define an object person and I don't know, it, it doesn't even have to have any properties, I guess. We'll just leave it as an empty object. And let's say that we try and call a function that doesn't exist on JavaScript objects. For example, person.2 uppercase, right? This doesn't make any sense. And so what this will do is it'll actually throw a type error. You can see this if you run your code with node index.js, you'll see that this will say type error person.2 uppercase is not a function. 
Now, this error doesn't have nearly as much to do with the fact that the to uppercase function belongs to a string as it does with the fact that we're trying to call something that's undefined as a function. All right, so in other words, person.to uppercase is undefined, right? And we can see this if we say console.log person.to uppercase like that. If we run this now, we'll see that it just logs out undefined, right? Now, obviously in JavaScript, if you try and run undefined with parentheses after it, JavaScript will think that you're trying to call undefined as a function and that will throw that type error that we just saw, right? Which is exactly what the type error is for. It's when you're using a type such as undefined or null in a way that it's not supposed to be used, such as by adding parentheses after it, right? And the same thing would be true, by the way, if we were to try and call person as a function. If we run this code now, you're gonna see that it says type error, person is not a function as well, right? So any of those cases will end up throwing the type error and really the, the most common situation where you're gonna see the type error is when you think that an object contains a certain property, right? Or a certain function like this, but it actually doesn't. Right, so if you had a lot of person objects in your application and most of those person objects had a to uppercase function that maybe, I don't know, returned the person's name in uppercase, then this would work just fine until you get to the one person that doesn't have the to uppercase function and you'd run into a type error, all right? So you'll run into this kind of thing quite frequently when you're trying to call functions that don't exist. That's, as I said, where I generally see this kind of error pop up. So that's a type error in JavaScript. The final type of error that we're gonna talk about here is something called a range error. And this usually happens when you accidentally write code that produces infinite recursion. Now, many of you may not know what recursion is and that's perfectly fine. Basically recursion is just when a function calls itself, right? So uh, if we define a function called my function and inside this function, we have some other kind of code and then we call this function by name like that, that's going to create an infinite loop since this function is going to call itself, it's gonna call itself, it's gonna call itself, it's gonna call itself. And it's basically going to do that infinitely until the JavaScript runtime realizes what's happening and puts a stop to it, at which point it will throw this range error, right? So if we kick this off by calling my function like so and try running our code, we're gonna see that we get a range error, maximum call stack size exceeded. And usually this is going to happen in situations like this where you accidentally implement infinite recursion or otherwise just do something like this that you shouldn't do. So anyway, that's the range error. And those are the main types of built-in errors in JavaScript. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've talked about some of the most common types of built-in errors in JavaScript, the next thing that I wanna talk about here is how to catch and handle errors. So catching and handling errors in JavaScript is generally done using the try catch block, although as you'll see later on, there are other methods for doing this. The try catch block in JavaScript looks something like this. Basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna have a try block using the try keyword here. And inside this block, you might have some code that has a possibility of failing. Now, what you're not gonna wanna do, generally speaking, is put some code in here that will fail for a very expected and preventable reason, right? Saying console.log x in here, which would normally give us a reference error, this is going to produce an error that will actually be caught by this try catch block. Right now, the problem with putting this inside a try catch block is that the try catch block will just sort of silently swallow that error, right? It's not going to tell you anything about it. And you can see this if you run your code by saying node index.js, no error will be produced, even though this clearly is producing an error, right? It's just being caught by the try catch block. So you're not gonna wanna put preventable errors inside a try catch block. The type of errors that you'll generally be putting in here are things that might fail for reasons that are outside your control, right? The most common situation is making some kind of network request, right? So if you make a network request, 
which we'll see how to do elsewhere. That's not something that we're ready to do at this point, I don't think. So you might make a network request in here and you know that that has a possibility of failing because every network request has a possibility of failing. So what you wanna do is if an error occurs, you wanna catch it and handle that in some way, right? So you might wanna just log that error out to the console so that you can see what happened. And by the way, this little E in parentheses in the catch block is the error that occurred. Right, this allows you to handle different errors differently in JavaScript. So uh, just going back, let's actually just use this example because it's an easy way to produce an error in JavaScript. Let's try logging out the value of a non-existent variable, which as we know will produce a reference error. And inside this catch block now, we should see the actual error that occurred printed out to the console, right? So let's run our code again. We're gonna say node index.js. And sure enough, we'll see our reference error logged out. And just one thing to note is that this reference error is not coming from the runtime itself, right? In other words, it's not the runtime that's finding this error and stopping the program. This is actually us saying console.log error in here that's causing this to be printed to the console. If we didn't have that here, as we saw, nothing would be printed out. All right, so that's the basic syntax for try-catch blocks. And, and of course, as in other languages that use try-catch blocks, JavaScript try-catch blocks have a finally block that you can use as well. You, you can leave this off and nothing will go wrong. But basically, this is where you'll put code that does basic cleanup, right? So if you create some sort of subscription, which we haven't seen how to do yet, so don't worry about it. But if you do create some kind of subscription in the try block, and something goes wrong, the finally block will allow you to check whether everything went successfully and close the subscription if it didn't. So basically in here, you're just gonna put cleanup code. And for now, I'll just say console.log, we'll say inside finally block. All right, and as you'll see, whether an error occurs or not, the code inside of there will be called. And the same thing will happen if no error occurs in the first place. We'll see that that finally block will be called as well. So if we run it again after removing the error creating code, we'll see that it says inside finally block. So it's just a good sort of fail safe block to put cleanup code, as I said. All right, now one last thing that I wanna cover here is the syntax for creating our own errors in JavaScript, all right? So there are lots of different situations where you might wanna do this, especially if you're creating something like a library that other programmers are going to be downloading and using. Chances are you'll want to make your own errors in case something goes wrong, right? In case the code that's calling your code tries to do something that for some reason doesn't work. Well, in JavaScript, the way that you can create and throw your own errors, right? That's basically the terminology for triggering an error in JavaScript. The way that you do that is by saying throw, and then you're going to create a new error object in JavaScript. So creating an error object is done by simply saying new error. And this syntax might look a little bit new to you, but don't worry about that right now. We'll talk about classes and instances, that kind of stuff in JavaScript elsewhere. For now, just know that this is how you create a new error. And basically what you're gonna do is put parentheses after that error with some kind of message inside of there. All right, so, you know, let's say that uh, we just wanted to communicate that something went wrong. Well, what we would do is we would basically just say something went wrong, all right? And that would allow us to throw our own error. We could handle that down here in the catch block by checking whether or not the error message said that something went wrong. Or better yet, let's uh, just for the sake of example, let's say something along the lines of system one broke, right? Uh, basically what we would be able to do here is check to see what error occurred by saying if e dot message, that's how you access this string inside of here. You could say if e dot message equals, again, using that triple equal sign that we learned about before, system, let's make sure we spell that right here, system one broke, then we could just log out something like, uh-oh, system one is 
broken. Now, obviously, in the real world, you'd want to have more in-depth error handling logic, but this is just a demonstration showing how to throw your own errors. So basically what we would see here is if we run this code, we'll see, uh-oh, system one is broken, which means that basically this has triggered an error, which causes the catch code to be run, and it compares the message and sees that that's the same thing as what we triggered above, and therefore executes this console.log statement. All right, so that's how you throw your own errors in JavaScript. And as I said, that's a pretty common thing to do when you're doing things like creating your own library or really just if your development team decides that this is the route that they want to go with handling difficult situations in your code is by throwing and catching errors. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. As you continue on your journey to improve as a JavaScript developer, there are a few key things that will really go a long way toward helping you master the language. Now, one of those things in particular, which is what we're gonna be starting to talk about here today, is the ability to work effectively with JavaScript arrays. All right, so we already talked about the very basics of arrays in JavaScript and how they're technically objects, but there are a lot of other details about JavaScript arrays that can really make or break your programs, as you'll see. So without further ado, let's jump right in and start learning about the finer points of arrays. Okay, so to get started here, I want to just make sure that you're on the same page. And in order to make sure of that, we're going to do a brief review of how arrays work in JavaScript. And this is something that we covered in a different section when we were talking about JavaScript data types. But, you know, it's easy to forget in the midst of everything else. So we'll just touch on the very basics of working with arrays in JavaScript. And this will provide a nice foundation for the rest of the more in-depth concepts that we're going to be talking about in this section. So first of all, defining arrays in JavaScript, the basic syntax is going to look like this. You're going to say let or const. And I guess you could use var as well, although I've recommended not using var for reasons that we discuss elsewhere. And then, of course, you're just going to define the name of the array. And the way that you're going to define the array itself is using square brackets. And in between these square brackets, you can put whatever you want, right? It can be numbers. It can be strings. It can be objects, right? And it can even be other arrays. So basically, any data type can go inside an array. And in JavaScript, unlike in many other more strongly typed languages, you can have multiple data types inside the same array, right? So it's perfectly fine to have a single array with numbers, strings, objects, etc., all inside of it. So once you've defined an array, the way that you're going to actually access and modify the elements is by referring to those elements by their index, right? And indices in JavaScript start at zero and go all the way up to whatever the array's length is minus one. Okay, so if we wanted to access the first element, that would be zero. So we would say my array zero, and that would give us whatever the first element in the array is. If we wanted to get the second one, that would be one. If you wanted to get the last one, as we said, that would be three. And all this is going to do is just return whatever element was there. So if we were to say console.log my array, and by the way, to demonstrate these, I'm just using a basic project with index.js and I'm just writing all my code in here so that we can run it using node.js. And to do that, we'll just say node index.js and we'll see that sure enough, my array three printed out this empty array. If we were to change that to zero, that would print out the first element in the array. Let's run it again. And sure enough, we'll see one. All right, so that's accessing elements in JavaScript arrays. Pretty straightforward. Um, if we want to change an element in a JavaScript array, that's pretty straightforward as well. All you need to do is reference whatever index you want to change and set that equal to another value, right? So let's say that we wanted to change this second element in our array, right? Which would be index one. In order to do that, we would just say my array index one, and we would say equals 
and maybe we want to change this to goodbye or something like that. All right, and that would have the effect of obviously changing this from hello to goodbye. And if you print out my array by saying console.log my array, which will allow us to see all of the elements and run our code, we'll see that that has successfully changed the second element there, right? The element with the index of one. All right, now as far as adding elements to an existing array and removing elements from an existing array, those two tasks are done primarily using some built-in methods on JavaScript arrays. And those are gonna look like this. So let's say that we wanted to add another element onto the end of our array. Well, basically what we would wanna do there is say my array dot push and this push is a method that basically allows us to add another element onto the end of the array, as I said. So, uh, you know, let's say we wanted to add the number 100 onto the end of this array. All we would have to do is say myArray.push100, and that would add that extra element onto the end of this array. So, again, if we print out our array by saying console.log myArray, we should see, if we run our code, that 100 is now an element in the array. Now, in order to do the opposite and remove the last element in an array, you're gonna wanna call the pop method on an array. So if we say myArray.pop, and you don't pass any arguments to this method, it's just a method that you call without any arguments. Basically, what that's gonna do is just remove whatever the last element in the array is, right? So what you're gonna see is that by calling myArray.push, we're adding an element, We'll print out the entire array, and after calling myArray.pop, we should see that that element has disappeared. So let's log out our array again. I'm just gonna copy this and paste it down here. If we run our code again, what we'll see is that, sure enough, we have the longer array with 100, and after calling pop, we see that that extra element is gone. All right, now you can call either of these methods as much as you want, right? If you wanted to remove more than one element from the array, you could just call myArray.pop more than once. And same thing, if you wanted to add multiple elements to the array, you could just call myArray.push more than once, probably inside a for loop or something like that. All right, so those are push and pop. And really the thing about these that you have to keep in mind is that they only allow us to operate on the last element in the array. So in other words, if you wanted to, let's say, remove the first element in the array or add another element to the beginning of an array, that's gonna require some other built-in array methods that we haven't talked about yet. So just keep that in mind. We're gonna be seeing how to do this later on, but I just wanted to review the push and pop methods since you're going to see these very often in JavaScript programs. All right, now the last thing I wanna talk about here is getting the length of an array, which is very important. In order to get the length of the array, all that you're gonna to need to do, and I'm just gonna remove these here, is reference the length property on a given array. So if we say myArray.length, what you'll see is that that will print out four, right? Because this has four elements in it. So if you wanna think about the length property of an array as just telling us how many elements are in the array, that's the correct way to look at it, right? Uh, what some people kind of struggle with from time to time is they think of length as the last index in the array. And as I already said, the last index here is going to be three. That is the length of the array minus one. All right, now for some reason, people always seem to wonder what the maximum length for an array in JavaScript is. And uh, I'll give you the number. It's actually quite a large number. It's two to the 32nd power. Where is the caret key? There it is. It's two to the 32nd power, which is equal to a very large number. It's four billion. 294,967,296. So very large number there, and you probably won't ever want to create arrays of that size since even though it's technically allowed in JavaScript, that will almost definitely affect the performance of your programs. But that is the maximum length of an array. And again, for some reason, I get that question quite a lot. So Anyway, those are really the basic things that you need to know about working with arrays in JavaScript. We're gonna be building off of this foundation. There's lots of additional functionality that JavaScript provides us with in the form of things like built-in methods that we can use on arrays. And there's just a lot of other technical details that I wanna talk about with regards to arrays. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.
All right, so now that we've reviewed some of the basics of arrays in JavaScript, the next thing that I want to talk about is managing array data using something called the spread operator. Now, first of all, the spread operator in JavaScript is a fairly new operator, and it looks like this. Uh, it's basically just three dots. So in order to type this operator, you're just going to hit the period key three times. And that is what's called the spread operator. So the next question is, what is this operator used for? Well, basically the spread operator is used whenever you want to reference the elements in an array without treating them as if they were in an array. So that sounds a little bit complicated. It's usually just best to see this thing in action. So first of all, Let's assume that we have two arrays. We'll say something like array one, and that'll be one, two, and three. And let's have another array that will be array two, and we'll make that one uh, four, five, and six. Now, let's say that we wanted to join these two arrays together. Well, we can do that in JavaScript using the built-in concat function that's available on functions, right? So you could say array one dot concat array two. And if we were to log the result of that out, you'll see that that gives us both of those arrays joined together, right? So if we say node index JS, we'll see that that gives us one, two, three, four, five, six. But another way to do this is, as I said, to use the spread operator. And in order to show you what this looks like, we'll just say console.log. And then you're going to use square brackets, just as if you're defining a regular array. But instead of putting in elements, you're going to say dot, dot, dot. There's the spread operator there. Array one and dot, 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 array two. Now, again, what this spread operator is doing here is it's taking all of the elements of these respective arrays and putting them in this spot in the new array, right? So basically what we're saying here is we want all of the elements from array one inside this array, and we want all of the elements of array two inside this array at this space, right? So this is going to give us the same thing as we got here when we called concat. And you can see this if we run our code again, we'll see that these two things give us the same result. Now you might be wondering why we need the spread operator in general, right? Why can't we just say array one and array two without the spread operator? Well, in order to show you the difference there, We'll just run our code again, and what you'll see is that now, instead of having an array that has a single layer and has one, two, three, four, five, six all on that layer, basically what this has done is this has inserted the actual arrays, array one and array two, into a new array, right? So, so we have a sort of nested array here instead of the flat array that we got when we used the spread operator. So that's the difference between using the spread operator and not using the spread operator. And this can actually be a very useful thing for managing array data, right? Let's say that we wanted to create a copy of an array. Well, the way that we could do that is by using the spread operator with a single array, right? So you could have array one copy, we'll say array one copy equals, and then you could just say in square brackets, dot, 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 array one. And what this would do is it would take all of the elements from array one and put it inside of this new array. So it would basically be creating a copy, as I said. Now, the reason that you would want to create a copy of an array is because doing something like this, if we were to say array one copy equals array one, that just creates another reference to array one in memory. And that's something that we'll talk about later. So don't worry too much about it right now. Just know that if you see this kind of syntax on Stack Overflow or in JavaScript code elsewhere, that basically is what it's doing. It's creating a copy of an array. And you know, if you see something like this, basically that just means we want to combine the contents of two or more arrays, right? You can do this with as many arrays as you want. If you had an array three, you could say array three, dot, 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 array three like that. And you know, you can go as far as you want, as I said. Now, another thing that we can do when working with the spread operator in arrays is add extra elements, right? So let's say that in between the elements of array one and array two here, we wanted to add some more numbers, right? Let's say we want to add 100 and 200. Well, that's perfectly fine, right? You can just put those directly in the middle in between array one and array two. And what you'll see if you run your code again, is that we get one, two, three, 100, 200, 
four, five, six. So it's really just a nice visual way of combining arrays. Whereas, you know, if we were to do this using the concat function, we would say array one dot concat 100 dot concat 200 dot concat array two, right? That's not as visually obvious what's going on, in my opinion anyway, as what we're doing down here with the spread operator where we're saying, we want all of array one, we want these two numbers here, and we want all of array two. So that's really one of the advantages of working with the spread operator uh, with regards to arrays. Now, another possible application of the spread operator in JavaScript, which is something that can uh, initially confuse people a little bit, has to do with functions. So let's say that we just have a simple function called add, but instead of this function just taking two arguments like we see here, x and y, and returning their sum, right, x plus y, let's say that instead of being limited to just two arguments, we want to be able to pass in as many arguments as we want to this add function and have them all added together, right? So we want to be able to have our function work when we say add one and two, and we also want it to work when we say one, two, three, and we also want it to work when we say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, blah, blah, blah. Well, the way that you're going to make this work in JavaScript is also by using the spread operator. All right, and this is a little bit of a divergence from the way that we saw it used up here, but basically what it allows us to do is convert the arguments into an array, right? So it allows us to convert the arguments that we're receiving in this function in as an array. And I'm just gonna show you what it looks like. It's gonna look like this. Instead of having X and Y, we're just gonna say dot, 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 args, right? And you can call this whatever you want. You can call it numbers instead, if that makes more sense to you. And what this would allow us to do, again, numbers is now going to be an array containing all of the arguments that were passed into the function. So uh, again, if we called add with one and two, numbers would now be an array with one and two inside of it. If it were one, two, three, it would have three. If it were all of these numbers here, it would just be an array containing all of those numbers, right? So it would look like that. And what this allows us to do is basically just loop through all of those arguments that we received and, you know, we can add them together. So just to show you what that would look like using a for loop, we could say for let x of numbers and we'll have our sum here, which will start at zero. And inside the for loop here, we'll just say sum plus equals x. And then we'll just say return sum. Okay, so that will give us the sum of all of our numbers, and if we just add a console.log around all of these, we should be able to see that the result works. So we'll say console.log, console.log, and there we go. So let's run this again. We're gonna say node index.js, and sure enough, what we'll see is the results of adding all of these numbers here. We have three, we have six, and we have 28. If you wanna do this 28 one on the back of a napkin or on a piece of scrap paper or on a calculator, I guess you could do as well. Um, feel free to go ahead and do that, but I'm just going to assume that that's the right answer. So anyway, that's how the spread operator works in terms of working with the arguments of a function. Right, it allows us to get all of the arguments of a function as an array instead of referring to them one by one. Another application of this is if you wanna do the reverse, right? So let's say we have an array of numbers like this and you wanna pass it as arguments to a function. So in order to make this a little bit simpler, I'm just going to convert this back to a regular function with specific arguments. So we'll say, uh, here, I'm just gonna remove these here. We'll say function add and we'll give it three arguments, x, y, and z. And then what we're gonna do is just return x plus y plus z. Now, we have these arrays that we created up here at the top, which, you know, have three elements in them. So what we would potentially wanna do in certain situations is pass all of the elements to a function like this one as individual arguments. Now, this won't work right away if we try and say add array one since basically what this is doing is passing array one as this first argument, and then the second two arguments are just going to be undefined. And as you might've guessed, what will happen is we're gonna just end up with the nan value. Oops, let's uh, actually 
print that out, we'll say console.log add array one. And if we run this again by saying node index.js, we'll see that we, oh, it's actually something different than NAN, I guess because the first thing wasn't a number. Basically, we just get one, two, three, undefined, undefined. So that's not at all what we wanted, right? So what we're gonna want to do instead here is use the spread operator, right? Basically what the spread operator allows us to do, just like how it allows us to take all of the elements in an array and sort of spread them into this space of the array, hence the name, it's going to allow us to do the same thing here with the arguments that we're passing to a function, right? So uh, what this is doing here again is just passing an array as the first argument. What we want is for each individual element here to be passed as a separate argument. So in order to do that, we can just use the spread operator. And what we'll see now if we run our code again is that that will give us the successful answer of six. All right, so anyway, that's the spread operator and we've seen how to work with it with arrays. This is something that you see quite a lot in modern JavaScript. Again, it's something that was added fairly recently to the JavaScript language. So if you're looking at JavaScript back from like 2012 or 2011, right? If you're on Stack Overflow and you're looking at some old post, they probably won't be using this. But in more recent posts, you'll usually see that people will tend to use this just because it's a little more readable, right? This, again, is a little more readable than having to call concat several times like we saw up here. So anyway, just to review what we covered here, there are really three or four main uses for this spread operator when working with arrays. The first one here is to copy an array, right? So the spread operator is used for copying. The second situation here is to combine arrays, and you can also do this by combining arrays with other elements, as we saw by adding these individual elements in the middle here, right? So combining is going to be the second main use case for the spread operator when working with arrays. The third case is going to be when you want to access all of the arguments as an array from inside the function, and unfortunately I deleted that code, but basically that was when we had dot, dot, dot args or numbers or whatever you want to call them. And this is the third situation. So it's going to be args as array. And the fourth situation is the inverse of that. That's what we saw here. And that is using an array as args, right? Passing the elements in an array as arguments to a function. So we'll just call that array as args. All right, and those are the four main situations that you're gonna see this spread operator used in uh, when working with arrays. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've covered the spread operator in JavaScript, the next array-related topic that I want to move on to is array equality, right? So we saw in a separate section that whenever you want to compare two values in JavaScript to see if they're equal, you'll generally end up using the triple equals sign, right? The double equals sign exists in JavaScript as well, but you're usually gonna want to avoid that because it doesn't usually behave the way that you would expect, right? So Anyway, if you're comparing two numbers like five and five with the triple equal sign, this is going to give you the value true. And likewise, if two things aren't actually equal to each other like this, then that's going to give you the Boolean value false. Now, when working with arrays, things unfortunately are a little bit more complicated than this. And that's because when you compare two arrays using the triple equals sign, right? So let's say we have two arrays. We'll type these out again, one, two, and three. And we'll have our array two, which will be, uh, let's make it one, two, and three again, right? So if you wanted to compare these two arrays in JavaScript, your first inclination might be to use the triple equals sign. So we're gonna say console.log array one is equal to array two. However, what you're gonna see if you run this code, right? so we'll say node index.js, you're gonna see that that gives us the Boolean value false, right? So even though array one and array two have the same exact elements, and you can see that that's true just by looking at them, saying array one is triple equals to array two is going to return false. Now, 
As it happens, two arrays in JavaScript are never going to be equal to each other unless they're references to the same array in memory. Now, again, in a separate section, we talked about this in terms of objects, but just to review here, because this is a very important concept in JavaScript, I'll go over it again. When you create a new array, right, just by using the syntax that we have here, essentially what you're doing is you're setting aside a certain portion of memory to hold that array, right? So, you know, this is basically just creating something somewhere in JavaScript's memory that is holding these values one, two, and three. And when you do that again, right, as we're doing here with array two, you're basically creating a separate portion in memory with those same values. Now, when you say array one is triple equals to array two, and this is also true of the double equals sign in this case, what you're asking JavaScript is not whether these two arrays have the same elements in them. We can see that they do quite clearly. What you're asking instead is whether or not these two names here, array one and array two, are references to the same array in memory, right? So basically the triple equals is asking, are these two things a reference to the same array? And in this case, as we saw, since we're setting aside two separate portions of memory for these two arrays, the answer is going to be no, which gives us that Boolean value false. Now, a situation where two arrays would be equal to each other is when instead of defining a new array, you actually just create a new reference to an existing array. And you would do that if you were to say, let array two equals array one, right? This is not creating a copy of array one. This is basically just creating another reference to array one in memory. So again, if what we're doing here is setting aside some part of memory where we have the values one, two, and three, then what this thing here is doing is just creating another reference that's pointing at this exact same part of memory. All right, so in this case, when we say array one is triple equals to array two, that's going to return true. And you can see this if you run the code. So let's just open up our terminal here and we'll say node index.js. We'll see that that will give us true. Now, this actually brings us to a very important concept in JavaScript when working with arrays and objects and also functions as well. And that is the difference between working with variables by value and working with variables by reference. All right, so in JavaScript, when we're working with arrays, we have to work with them generally by reference. And what this means is if we create two references to the same array in memory as we've done here, then any changes that we make to one will automatically affect the other, right? So if we were to say something like uh, array one, uh, index one is equal to 100, okay? And then we'll print out array one and array two. We'll say console.log array one and console.log array two. If we run our code now, what we're gonna see is that both arrays have been modified by simply making a single change to array one. And again, that's because both of these things are both basically pointing at the same values in memory, right? We're just uh, basically creating two different names for the same thing in this situation. And so when we say array one, index one is equal to 100, we're basically just taking this, changing it to 100, and so correspondingly, we've changed array two as well, right? So, you know, if we were to change this to array two, index one equals 100, we'll see that that will give us the same result, right? We end up with one, 100, and three. Now, this whole idea of working with arrays by reference does have some somewhat more hidden implications in JavaScript. And one major implication there is when you want to work with the const keyword, right? So we saw earlier that the const keyword in JavaScript, right? If we say const x equals five, let's say, this basically prevents us from reassigning a different value to x later on, right? If we try and say x is equal to 100, if we run our code now, we'll see that that will give us an error, right? And that error will say uh, type error assignment to constant variable. Basically, we declared this variable as constant, so JavaScript isn't going to let us change it. Now, this works with the basic data types, such as numbers, strings, etc. But when it comes to things like arrays, 
the const keyword doesn't work quite as well as you might hope. In order to show you what I mean, let's say that we define a new array, const array one equals, we'll just do one, two, three again. Well, because of the const keyword, it's true that we're not going to be allowed to just say array one is equal to uh, four, five, six, let's say, right? We're not going to be able to do that. We're going to see the same exact type error when we try and run our code. It'll say type error assignment to constant variable. We'll see that it doesn't like what we're doing here. Now, on the other hand, if we were to instead just say array one index two is equal to hello, right? Something like that. Then this is actually going to be perfectly valid. And here, let's log that out to the console just to see the result. All right, we'll run that again. Oops, there we go. Run that again. We'll see one, two, hello. Now, you might be a little bit surprised at the fact that we're able to change things that were declared as constant in JavaScript. But basically what this constant keyword is doing is it's making sure that the value of array one isn't reassigned, but it's not actually making sure that the individual elements in the array stay the same. Right, so in other words, again, when we say const array one equals array one, two, three, and we end up with something like this, as I've already discussed, array one, basically all that the const keyword is going to make sure of is that array one isn't reassigned to something else, right? So uh, we can't basically declare another array and change what array one is pointing at, which is what we were trying to do when we used four, five, and six, and we saw that that gave us an error. So this is the only thing that the const keyword is going to prevent us from doing when working with arrays. Unfortunately, it's not going to prevent us from changing the individual elements in an array. So that's something to keep in mind when you're working with arrays in JavaScript. You're gonna to wanna to be very careful that you don't accidentally change something in the array. And there are more subtle ways of doing this too, by the way. Uh, for example, if you were to call array one dot push hello, right? That's also going to be perfectly fine because again, we're not changing the reference of this array one variable. We're only changing the underlying data. So JavaScript is gonna be fine with this. As we'll see that without even batting an eyelash, it adds the string hello onto the end of this array. Okay, so again, just something to be careful of. If you really want an array to be constant, there are ways to prevent the array from changing, which we'll take a look at elsewhere. We're not gonna take a look at that right now, but uh, ultimately you just want to avoid using things like push or directly modifying or mutating the values in that array. Now, while we're on the topic of working with arrays by reference, this also has some important implications when you're working with functions, right? So let's say, um, here, we'll just uh, define a new function here. We'll say function, and we'll call this function something like print elements, all right? And what this function is gonna do, it's just gonna take an array as an argument, and it's going to loop through all of the elements in that array and print each element out individually. So we'll just say four, we'll just do x, uh, let x, of array, and we'll say console.log x. All right, so this is just gonna print out all of the elements, and if we call this function, we'll call it with, you know, just an array of one, two, three, and what we'll see if we run our code is that it will print out one, two, and three. Okay, so far so good. However, let's say that instead of just having an innocent function called print elements that doesn't modify anything in our array, let's say that this function actually makes a change to our array. All right, so we'll say array two equals changed, right? We'll just do something like that. And then after we call print elements, let's log out the contents of the array that we pass in. Now, in order to make this work, we're gonna have to actually define this as a separate variable. So we'll say let array equals one, two, three. And then inside here, we'll just say print elements array. And after that, we'll log out the contents of array. Well, since arrays are passed by reference in JavaScript, what we're gonna see is that this line here will actually have an effect on this array. All right, and what I mean by that is if we run this with node index.js, you'll see that it says one, two, and changed. 
And then we see that the actual contents of that array that we passed as an argument have been changed, right? So in other words, it's possible to have functions in JavaScript that actually change the values of the arguments we pass in. Now, depending on your preferred programming style, this may or may not be a good thing. I usually prefer to avoid this just because it tends to make your code fairly complicated, right? If you were to say have a function that was uh, remove end, right? right? And that's just gonna take the last element off of an array. All that this function would have to do is call array.pop and we would see that that would actually remove the last element from any array that we passed into it, right? So we could say let array equals one, two, three. And if we call remove end on that array and print it out, we'll see that that array no longer has the last element. So console.log array. If we run this again, we'll see one and two. All right, and just to demonstrate what this would look like with other values in JavaScript, if we were to pass in something like a number, numbers in JavaScript are passed by value, right? As are most of the simple data types such as numbers, strings, etc. So if we were to have a function that tried to change a number, right? Let's say function double, and that's basically just going to take a number and double it. We'll say x equals x times two. Well, that's not actually gonna do anything because if we say let number equals five, or, there we go, and we say double number and then log out the value of number, we'll see that number is still going to be five, right? Because numbers are passed by value and the same thing will be true of strings, booleans, etc. So this is mainly gonna be true with arrays and also some of the other complex types like objects and functions. So you'll just wanna keep that in mind as you're working with arrays, especially in cases where you have to pass an array as an argument because there's a very big risk that you could unintentionally modify the array that was passed in without wanting to. All right, so I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've discussed the concept of working with arrays by reference and also the topic of array equality, what I wanna do here to close out is show you how to do a deep equals operation on arrays, right? So two arrays, we already saw that even if two arrays have the exact same elements in them, if we have array one equals one, two, three, and array two equals one, two, three, even if the two arrays have the exact same elements, they're not gonna be equal to each other when we say array one is equal to array two, right? That's just never going to happen unless these two things are references to the same array in memory. So unfortunately, JavaScript isn't really going to help us out there naturally with the triple equals operator, but there are ways to check whether or not two arrays are equal to each other, and we call this deep equal, right? When we're basically checking to see whether two arrays have the exact same elements in them. And this is also true when we're working with objects, right? If we wanna test to see if two objects have the exact same properties and values. Uh, but we're just talking about arrays right now. So, so I'm gonna show you how to create a function that will tell us whether or not two arrays are deep equal to each other, all right? So this function, we'll just call it uh, arrays are equal. You can call it something a little catchier if you want. But basically what we're gonna do is have this function take two arrays. We'll call it array one and array two. And it's going to return whether or not those two arrays have the same elements in them. And this is basically going to be an opportunity for us to get a little bit of experience with writing some actual JavaScript logic to solve some real problems. So. Essentially, what we're gonna do in order to tell whether two arrays are deep equal to each other, we're gonna start off by looping through array one and checking to see whether the corresponding keys, right, the corresponding indices on array two have the same values. So what that'll look like, we're gonna say for let x of array one. All right, so for each element in array one, we're gonna to want to check if the corresponding element in array two is equal. So what we're gonna to have to do 
is say let is equal. And this is gonna start off as true. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna loop through all of the elements of our arrays. And if any two elements are not equal, we're going to set this to false and that'll be what we end up returning down here. So we'll say return is equal. This is just kind of a naive approach here. There are of course, a lot of different ways to implement this, but what we're gonna need to do next is we're essentially going to have to get the index that we're currently on with array one, right? Just because we know the element doesn't mean we'll know how to access the corresponding index in our other array. Now, in order to do this, we're gonna need to do a little bit of JavaScript magic that we haven't learned about yet because JavaScript doesn't have any built-in way using the for of loop to get the current index that we're on in the array. So what we're gonna need to do, and don't worry too much about the mechanics here right now, but what we're gonna need to do is just say array1.entries. And basically what calling the dot entries function on an array does is it will give us an array of arrays that looks something like this, right? It's going to, you know, just using these arrays up here as an example, it would take the array one, two, three, and it would give us an array of arrays where each of the internal arrays contains two elements. The first one is the current index and the second one is the current value, right? So again, for this one up here, it would be zero, one. We'd have index one whose value is two. So this next one would be one and two. And then we'd have number three, which would be index two and the value is three. So that's what array1.entries is going to give us. Now, the way that this helps us is it gives us both the values of our array and the indices that we're currently on. So what we can actually do, and this is a little thing called array destructuring that I'm about to show you. Don't worry too much about the mechanics here. Again, we're just going to say let, and then we're gonna use square brackets and say index and x. All right, so now index is going to be the current index that we're on in our loop, and x is going to be the current value of the element at that index in the array one. So what this allows us to do now is check to see whether x is equal to the corresponding element in array two. So we'll say array two index, right? So we're using that to access the current index of array two. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say is equal equals x, blah, 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 blah. And if this is false, right, if is equal is now false, we don't need to go through the rest of the elements in the array since we already know the two arrays are not equal. So the way that we can do that in JavaScript is by saying if not is equal, we're gonna say break, right? So the break keyword gets us out of a for loop. So what we should be able to do now is say, arrays are equal, array one and array two. We'll console.log the results of that here and we'll run our code. And what we should see is that this says true. Now, if we change one of these elements, let's say we change it to one, two, four for array one, we should see that that gives us false, right? So everything's working well so far. However, the problem with this logic that we just wrote is it's missing a very important situation, and that is when one of the arrays is longer than the other, right? So let's say that array one and two both have the same first three elements, but array two has elements four, five, and six as well. Well, obviously these arrays aren't equal to each other. However, if we run our arrays our equal function on them, we'll see that that returns true. Now, the reason for this is that the current logic that we have is only looping through the elements in array one, right? So one, two, three, and it gets to the end. It says, cool, everything matched, and it doesn't actually check to see whether array one and array two have the same number of elements. Now, your first inclination as to how to fix this might be to, you know, do something rather convoluted, like maybe you write another for loop here that does it in reverse to make sure that those are equal to, right? Uh, basically going through all of the entries of array two instead of array one. However, there's an even easier way to do that. And that is to simply say, if array one dot length does not equal array two dot length, 
we're just going to return false, right? So basically, if the two arrays don't have the same length, we'll know that they're not equal, and we're just going to return false, which will make it so that none of this logic down here will execute. And by the way, I just wanted to point that out. The return keyword does make it so that nothing after it gets executed. That is, if we get to this statement, right? If it skips over the if statement, all of this will still get executed. So anyway, if we run our code again with those two arrays, we'll see that that now gives us the value of false which is great. Another situation that we'll probably wanna cover here is what to do if all of the elements in the array are not necessarily numbers, but some other type. Now the type that we're particularly concerned about here is what happens if we have a nested array, right? If we were to say something like uh, one, two, and then we'll say three, four inside a nested array, all right, that's a perfectly valid array. And if we have that same value in both of our arrays, both of these things are technically equal, right? We would probably want this arrays are equal function to return true for this. However, what we're gonna see if we run this again is that it will return false. Now, the reason that this is returning false, even after all of this logic that we wrote, is that basically when it gets to this last element here, Right? Remember that no two arrays in JavaScript are equal unless they're references to the same array in memory. When our logic here gets to this final element, it's going to say three and four is equal to three and four, right? That's the check that it's going to perform. And it's going to get false, right? Because again, no two arrays are equal in JavaScript unless they're references to the same array in memory, right? I'll just say that over and over again until it gets through to you if it hasn't already. So what we're gonna need to do, unfortunately, is we're gonna need to check to see whether each of our elements is an array. And if that element is an array, we're gonna basically call this function recursively. Now, if recursion makes your head hurt, don't worry too much about it right now. I'm just gonna show you how to implement it and if you wanna go back through and you know test it out by writing it on a piece of paper or something like that just to understand how it works, you can feel free to do that after this. But basically what we're gonna to wanna to do is for each element, before we check whether the two elements are equal to each other, we're gonna to want to check to see whether that element is an array. Now, the way that you can check to see if something is an array in JavaScript is by using the array.isArray built-in function, right? And this array thing here is just the global array object that we can access in JavaScript. We'll talk more about that later on. Uh, but basically this will tell you if something that you pass to it is an array, right? So this would return true. If we were to pass, I don't know, a number or even an object, that would return false. And remember that we have to use this because the type of operator isn't a reliable way of telling if something's an array because arrays are technically objects, right? This would return the string object. So anyway, array.isArray is the function that we're gonna use to test to see whether or not two things are arrays. So what we're gonna wanna do is say if array.isArray x and array dot is array y, right? So in other words, if both of the elements that we're taking a look at are arrays, and actually I don't know why I said y, this should be array to index, right? So we're checking to see whether both of those are arrays. If both of them are arrays, we basically want to recursively call this arrays are equal function, which should basically allow this function to work with uh, arrays that are as deeply nested as we need, right? So uh, it won't just work with arrays that are nested on one level, it'll work with arrays that are nested on multiple levels. All right, so all we're gonna do is say is equal equals arrays are equal x and array to index. And that should take care of the rest. And then we're gonna to want to say else and only perform the rest of this logic here if both of the values are not arrays, right? So we'll put that inside the else clause and that should be all we need to do. Oh, and here, actually the if is equal thing, we'll wanna put that outside because that will apply to both of our cases. So let's try this thing out now. We'll run node index.js and sure enough, we see that we get true. If we change something in here, 
like so, we should see that we will now get false. All right, and just to demonstrate that this can do deeply nested arrays, let's do six, uh, eight, I don't know, I'm just gonna randomly type numbers here to make it deeper like that. And, oops, it looks like I missed a closing brace there. So let's just copy this and make array two equal to that to see if we get true. So we'll say node index.js, sure enough, we get true. And if we change one of the values in here, we'll just change this to something like three we should see that that now gives us false. All right, so we've overhauled now our arrays are equal functions so that it will take nested arrays into account. The one thing that it's not gonna be able to do at this point is deal with objects in an array. And that's something that we're gonna see how to do in another section. So anyway, that's how you create a function that deep equals compares arrays. It is a little bit complicated and there are ways to make this prettier by using something like the for each function or other built-in functions such as map. But again, we're not gonna talk about that right now. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. We've already seen how to work with JavaScript arrays effectively, and as we've seen, there are quite a few details that you have to know in order to do so. The next thing that we're gonna take a look at, which is also critical in becoming an effective JavaScript developer, is how to work with JavaScript objects, okay? So we've already seen that objects are basically what in other programming languages is called something like a dictionary or a hash table. Basically, JavaScript objects are just key value stores that allow us to group data together. So what we're gonna be taking a look at here today are some of the more intricate details of JavaScript objects and how they apply to writing JavaScript programs. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Okay, so to get started here, just to make sure that we're on the same page, what I'd like to do is just have a brief review of the basic JavaScript object syntax. Again, just to make sure that you're aware of all of this stuff before we move on to some of the more complicated uh, nitty gritty details with JavaScript objects. So first of all, defining an object in JavaScript as we've seen is done using curly braces. So if you wanted to define an object, we would say something like const or let you could do my object equals and then inside curly braces, you would define all of the properties for the object. All right, so you know you could have property A and then the value for that property, property B, you could have a value for that property. And of course in objects, it's possible to have different properties of different data types, right? So you can have numbers, strings, and even objects, arrays, pretty much any kind of type mixed in as values for this object. So again, just to sort of review the little bit of vocabulary that's associated with JavaScript objects, all of these here are what we call properties. And for each property, right, each property is divided into two main parts. We have the key, right, which is this part over here on the left-hand side, right? The key is basically the property name, and we have the corresponding value for that key, which is over here on the right-hand side, and as we've seen, can be, you know, pretty much any kind of type. The next thing that I wanna review is how to access different properties on JavaScript objects. So you might have uh, my object dot a, and that would be how you access the value for the a property on our object, right? And if you were to log this out to the console by saying console.log my object.a, and then we'll run our code here by saying node index.js, you'll see that that will log out the corresponding value for property a on our object, all right? And another way to access object properties in JavaScript is to use the square bracket notation. The square bracket notation uh, just is a slightly different way of doing it. It's used in different situations, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But basically, if you wanted to do this same thing using square bracket notation, 
you would just have square brackets and then you'd have as a string the property name, right? So just one thing to keep note of here is that when you just use the dot notation here, you don't need to explicitly make this thing that comes after it a string. When you're using square bracket notation, this has to be a string, right? You can't just say A without the quotation marks since that wouldn't work, right? That would be trying to refer to a variable named A. And that actually brings me to a very important point about square bracket notation and one of the main advantages that it has over just the dot notation. And that is that it allows us to actually use the values of variables as an index, right? Or to refer to a specific property. So, you know, if we were to have uh, a variable here or a constant, we'll just call it my property name. And if we were to make that property name something like C, right, or A or B, doesn't really matter here, then what we would be able to do is we would be able to pass that variable's value in between these square brackets here. And what this would do is it would look at the value of that variable and try and access that property on this object, right? So it would look at the value C and it would try and access the property C on my object. So what we can see if we run this code again is that that would log out hello, which is the value for property C on my object. So that's generally when you'll see square brackets used instead of the dot notation. Otherwise, the dot notation is generally used when you don't need to do this kind of thing. So those are the main ways of accessing object properties in JavaScript. One thing to keep in mind is that if you try and access a property that doesn't exist, right? If we were to try and say my object dot D, that is going to give us undefined, all right? So it's not going to throw an error for us when we just try and access a property that doesn't exist. It's just going to return the value undefined in JavaScript. But one thing that you do want to keep an eye out for is trying to access properties of properties. And what I mean by that is, you know, normally we might have a property on our object whose value is another object, right? So we might say D E one. And the way that we would access that in JavaScript is by saying my object dot D dot E. And if we were to run this again, we would see that that would give us one, which is the value that we had there. And if you wanted to do this using square bracket notation, what that would look like is we would say my object. Then in a first set of square brackets, we would say D as a string. And after that, in a second set of square brackets, we would say E as a string. So both of those are going to give us the same result, right? They're just different ways of doing things, again, depending on the exact code needs, right? If you wanted to have these D and E things be values of a variable and pass that variable to the square brackets, that would be when you'd want to use this notation instead. Now, where I was going with this, when you have a nested object and you're trying to access a property on that object, if there's a possibility that this object won't exist, right? If uh, you know my object here has that property, but then another object, which we'll call my object two, I suppose. All right, we'll say my object two. If this one happens not to have that property and we were to try and access dot D dot E on it, then what we'll see, and here I'm just gonna remove this one since it would give us the same result. What we would see is that that would actually give us an error because we would be trying to access property E on undefined, right? So this first part here is going to return undefined as we saw. And if we try and access a property dot E on a value undefined in JavaScript, that's going to give us an error because uh, undefined isn't an object that we can access properties on. So just something to keep in mind. That's a very common error to see in JavaScript. And in order to protect yourself from it, there's really two main syntaxes that you'll see. The first is to use the and symbol, right? Which is the double ampersand in JavaScript. And what that allows you to do is say something like my object dot D and my object two dot D dot E. And what this will do this is something called short circuit evaluation in JavaScript. Pretty strange name, but basically what that means is that it will check first to see if this exists. And if this doesn't exist, then it won't execute this part after the double ampersand symbol. And therefore we won't get an error, right? We'll just get undefined. And you can see that if you run your code again, we'll just see undefined, all right? So that's one way of protecting yourself from that error, but this is a little messy. So more modern versions of JavaScript actually provide a shortcut for this. And that is 
using the question mark symbol. What you can do is you can say my object two dot d question mark dot e. And what this is telling JavaScript is that there's a possibility that this d thing might not exist. And in the case that it doesn't exist, it's not going to try and access this property and therefore you won't receive an error. All right, so if we run this again, we'll see that we get undefined instead of an error. Okay, so that's pretty much all I wanted to review with JavaScript objects. Just one more thing is that if you want to set properties on an object in JavaScript, the way that you're going to do that is just using the same syntaxes that we've already discussed, right? Either using the dot notation or the square bracket notation. And you're gonna just put the equal sign after that and you can set the value to whatever you want, right? So if we were to log out our entire object now by saying console.log my object, we would see that after changing the property A, right? After changing the value for the property A, the object that gets logged out now has that property modified. All right. So hopefully this has been a helpful review for you with regards to the basics of working with objects in JavaScript. And as I said, this is gonna serve as a great foundation going forward into some of the more nitty gritty object related details. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've done a brief review of the basics of working with objects in JavaScript, the next thing that I wanna talk about with regards to objects is working with the spread operator. Now you may recall that the spread operator is something that can also be used with arrays, and the concepts are basically the same when working with objects with a few little added complexities just because of the nature of JavaScript objects. So. In order to illustrate what the spread operator is used for when working with objects, let's say that we have two different objects, right? So we might have one that's uh, person data, right? And this might be name, we'll say John Doe. Uh, age, we'll say that John Doe is 59. And then we'll say hair color uh, brown, something like that, right? So that's our first object. And let's say that additionally we have another object and that this object contains some career data for this person, right? So we'll just call this object something like career data. And this will have some different properties, right? So it might have something like company, we'll just say XYZ corporation. We'll say something like position. Let's say that John Doe is a manager and we'll say years at company. All right, and that'll just be something like five. Okay, so we have two different objects here and the first situation where the spread operator is used when working with objects in JavaScript is when we wanna combine two or more objects. So again, let's say that we want a new object now that contains all of the keys and values from our person object, as well as all of the keys and values from our career data object. Well, what that would look like, we would just say something like let, and I'll call this combined object. And using the spread operator, which by the way is just three dots in JavaScript, that's what the spread operator looks like. We could tell JavaScript that we want all of the keys and values from our person object by simply saying dot, 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 person. And underneath that, we could tell JavaScript that we want all of the keys and values from our career data object by saying dot, 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 career data. All right, and what that will do is it will take all of the keys and values from both of these objects and sort of spread them into place. So again, what this is telling JavaScript is that we want to take all of these things without, by the way, the curly braces. I'll show you what it would look like if we were to leave the three dots off our person and career data down here in just a moment. But basically what this is gonna do, as I said, is just combine all of these properties. So if we log out our combined object, we'll say console.log combined object. Then what we'll see if we run this code is that we have an object that has all of these properties combined. All right, so that's pretty straightforward, right? 
So you might be wondering what would happen if we were to just leave these three dots off. That's usually what people ask about when I demonstrate the spread operator. So in order to see what this will do, let's just run our code again without those spread operators in place. And what we'll see is that we now have an object with two properties that themselves are objects, right? So essentially what we just did there, and this is a syntax we actually haven't learned about in JavaScript, a shortcut, if you will. What we're doing is we're basically just creating an object that contains both the person object and the career data object as properties, right? So this is the same here as if we were to say person and then type out all the properties, blah, 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 and career data, and then type out all the properties after that as well. And just as a side note here, this is actually a shortcut, right? If you write an object and you just write the key name here without the value, this is a shortcut in JavaScript for this, which is what we would have to do otherwise, right? Where we say person and we want the value for that to be the value of a variable called person and career data. And we want the value for that to be the value of this variable career data. Right, so since this is such a common pattern in JavaScript, it's a very common task where you'll want to take some variable and insert that variable's value as a property into an object with the same name as the variable in the first place. Right, this is such a common task that JavaScript provides a shortcut. Whenever we have the key name, which is the same as the variable name that comes after it, we can just remove the duplication and the colon there and end up like this, right? So these two things here are the same thing as what we saw before. And so that's why we end up with this result, right? We have person, which has the value of this person variable and career data, which is a property with the value of this career data variable. So getting back to the spread operator, basically what the spread operator does is it tells JavaScript that instead of wanting the object itself as a single property in this new object we're creating, we instead want all of the individual properties from that object spread out in this part of our object, all right? So this is saying that we want person's properties and career data's properties instead of the person and career data objects themselves. And you can see the difference here if you just take a look at the difference in output that we have. All right, so spread operator, very, very common thing. You're gonna see this used quite a lot in JavaScript. And another common thing that you're gonna to want to do in this situation here, right, where you're taking existing properties from an object is you might wanna add your own properties and what that would look like. Let's say that we wanna add a likes property. I will say that John Doe likes hamburgers, like so. so all that we would have to do is add this property in, in addition to the spread operators and what that'll do is simply add another likes property to this finished object, along with all of the properties that we've spread from person and career data. So if we run this again, you'll see that this contains all of the properties from person, all of the properties from career data, and this additional property, which we added manually. Now you might be wondering what happens if we have some conflicting properties, right? In other words, what if both our career data object and our person object have the same property with a different value, right? So let's say that this one has name, we'll say uh, John Doe without the H. Well, what do you think is gonna happen when we try and spread the properties from both of these into this combined object? Well, basically in this situation, what's going to happen is whatever property came last is going to have the last say, right? So uh, our career data was spread after our person object. So the value that was on career data is going to be the one that's in the final object. And furthermore, if we were to manually override a specific property after these two spread operators, right? If we were to say again, name, and for this one, we'll just say Jim Doe. If we run our code again, what we'll see is that Jimdo will now be the value for name. So essentially it doesn't really matter if we're using the spread operator here or if we're just manually defining a property, whatever value comes last for a given property will be the final value for that property. Now this overriding actually does have a few main uses in JavaScript. The most common one that I've seen is as a way to update an object without having to manually access each and every property. So let's say for example, 
that we remove career data and our combined object. And let's say that we wanna make some updates to this person object here and keep some of the properties the same, right? So let's say that John Doe uh, dyes his hair. What we could do is create a new object called updates and that could contain the updates, right? So maybe John Doe has a birthday and decides to celebrate by dyeing his hair uh, purple, we'll say. And we'll say age 60. Well, if we want to take the updated properties inside this updates object and apply it to this person, what we can do is we can say, let updated person equals, and then using the spread operator, we can say dot, dot, dot person, which will take all the properties from person and dot, dot, dot updates, which will take all of the properties from our updates object and override any properties that it has in common with our person. And what we can see now, if we log out our updated person, all right, I'm just going to run our code again. Oops, we need to save our code first. Let's try that again. And there we go. We'll see that the updates have been successfully applied. And furthermore, the properties that weren't contained inside our updates object still have their same values. So that's another very common use of the spread operator in JavaScript is to update certain properties on an object without having to know specifically what all of the properties on the object are. And of course, you know, if we wanted to, we could have easily just updated age and hair color inside of here. But there's a lot of cases where for whatever reason, you'll be getting the updates from some portion of the user interface, let's say, and you're getting it in this format already as an object with properties. So, you know, it makes it easier in certain situations to just say dot, dot, dot updates instead of this. But both of these would work. As you can see, if we run this again, we'll end up with the same result. Okay, so that's one main use of the spread operator is to combine two or more objects or just to get the properties and values in a specific object and put them in another object. Another very common usage of the spread operator is as a way to copy objects in JavaScript. Now, this is something that we've actually talked about elsewhere with array, and the same thing is true with objects in JavaScript. Let's say that we have an object. We'll call this object my object one. And let's say this object has properties A1, B2, and C3, right? Just a dummy object here for demonstration purposes. And let's say that we create another object, my object two, and we want my object two to have the same keys and values as my object one. Well, your first inclination with this might be to say my object two equals my object one. However, what this will do is instead of creating a copy of my object one, it will actually make my object two a reference to the same object in memory as my object one. Now this is something that we'll talk about more later on, but suffice to say right now that if we were to change a property on either one of these objects now, right? If we were to say my object two dot a equals 2000, and then we were to log out my object one. So we'll say console.log my object one, well, what we'll see if we run our code is that my object one has changed just from us changing a property on my object two, right? So in other words, this is not creating a copy. It's simply creating another reference to the same object in memory. Something that we'll talk about in more detail later on, but I just wanted to point that out. So if we wanted to copy an object in JavaScript, we can actually use the spread operator to do that, right? And the way that we do that is we simply use the curly braces like so. And inside here we say dot, 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 my object one. All right, so again, what this is gonna do is it's gonna take all of the keys and values of my object one and create a new object with those keys and values, which means that we're creating a copy, right? So if we log out the values of both my object one and my object two now, after making a change to my object two, we'll see that they actually have different values, which means that they're not the same object in memory. Okay, so that's how to use the spread operator to copy objects in JavaScript. So we've already talked about using the spread operator for combining objects. We've talked about using the spread operator for copying objects. The last usage of the spread operator that I wanna talk about here is as a way to allow us to access both specific properties as well as get all of the additional properties that we haven't accessed 
as an object themselves. So that might sound a little bit confusing. Let me just show you what I mean. So let's say again that we have an object. We'll say something like let person. And again, we'll just use John Doe as our example. John Doe, age, I don't know, I'm just gonna type a random number, maybe John's 12. And we'll say hair color, there we go, brown. Okay, so let's say that we wanna create a new variable called name that has the value of the name property from this person. All right, now naively, that would look like this. We could just say let name equals person dot name. And additionally, we wanted to get a property which we'll call other info that would be an object containing age and hair color, right? So again, naively what that would look like, if we were to just do it like this, we could say let other info equals, and then we could say age person dot age and hair color person dot hair color. Well, what you'll notice here is that there's quite a lot of code being used to do a pretty simple thing, and that is basically just split up this object into two separate variables. So the spread operator actually allows us to do this in basically a single statement. Now, before I show you what that statement looks like, I want to talk about something called object destructuring in JavaScript. It's a pretty straightforward concept, but basically it's meant to prevent us from having to do this kind of thing in JavaScript, right? So, you know, when working with JavaScript objects, again, it's a pretty common thing to want to create separate variables whose value is the same as a specific property in an object, right? So you might want to create variables called name, age, and hair color that have the same value as this person's name, age, and hair color properties. And in JavaScript, what that would look like, what we, what we would normally have to do is say, let name equals person dot name, let age equals person dot age, and let hair color equals person dot hair color. Now, again, that's pretty tedious to do, especially if you wanna do this with, let's say 10 or 20 different properties. So what JavaScript lets us do is, is use object destructuring, horrible name, but very, very nice concept, which is basically just a shortcut syntax for all of this. So instead of saying let name equals person dot name, let age equals person dot age, let hair color equals person dot hair color, etc., we can just say let, and then in curly braces, the names of the variables we wanna create, name, age, and hair color equals person. All right, so this that we just wrote here has exactly the same result as what we saw before with let name equals person dot name, et cetera, but it's obviously much shorter. And this is what object destructuring looks like. So anyway, returning to the original problem, right? Getting one or two variable names from our object and then just getting the rest of them in a separate object, right? Again, we want the same result as if we were to say let name equals person dot name and then let other info equals blah, blah, blah. Well, using the spread operator in combination now with object destructuring, what we could do instead is say let name and then dot, dot, dot other info equals person. All right, and if we remove this stuff now, or I'm just gonna comment it out so you can see the equivalence there. What we can see now, if we log out both name and other info, by saying console.log name and console.log other info, we'll see that that will give us the results that we're looking for, right? So name, sure enough, is the person's name. And just ignore the little line through that. I'm not quite sure why my IDE is complaining about that, but it's perfectly valid JavaScript syntax. And what you're gonna see is that the name is the name value and the other info is the rest of the properties, right? So one thing that you'll see quite frequently is maybe you'll have name and then dot, dot, dot rest, right? That's a pretty common thing that I'll see developers do. It's not super explanatory, but that would have the same effect here as other info. It's just a different variable name. All right, so anyway, that's how to work with objects in JavaScript using the spread operator. Just to review the three main concepts that we've learned here, the spread operator can be used to combine objects. It can be used to copy objects, and it can also be used to, we'll call this splitting objects, right? So it can be used to split objects like so in combination with object destructuring. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.
All right, so now that we've talked about the spread operator and object destructuring in JavaScript, the next object related topic I want to cover is the topic of object equality in JavaScript. All right, so this is something that we talked about elsewhere with arrays. And since arrays are technically objects in JavaScript, the same thing here is going to be true with objects as it is for arrays. Now to be a little bit more specific about what I'm talking about here, let's say that we have two objects. We'll just call these my object one. All right, and this might have a one, b two and c three. And let's say that we have another object called my object two. And this one has the same exact keys and the same exact values for those keys as my object one. All right, now a pretty common thing that you're gonna run into in JavaScript is you're gonna need to compare two objects and make sure that they have the same keys and the same values for those keys. So the first thing that new JavaScript developers usually try to do to see if two objects have the same keys and values is they say my object one triple equals my object two, right? And if it's really bad, if they're really new to JavaScript, they might use double equals, but we'll say that they at least know triple equals, which as we've discussed elsewhere is generally the equal sign that you want to use in JavaScript. It's just less error prone, but whatever the case, they're going to expect that this is going to tell them whether or not these two objects have the same keys and values. Now, if we log out the result of this operation by saying console.log my object one triple equals my object two, what we'll see is that we get false, right? Even though again, everything is pretty much identical between these two objects. And by the way, you'll get the same result if you only use a double equals, right? It'll still be false. So anyway, the reason that this is happening, the reason that we're seeing that these two objects are not equal to each other, even though we know that they have the same keys and values is that in JavaScript, when comparing two objects, what JavaScript is actually comparing is whether or not these two variables, my object one and my object two are pointing to the same object in memory, right? So what you think this is asking is are the keys and values equal, right? So keys and values equal. That's what you think you're asking JavaScript when you say this, but what you're actually asking instead is are these objects the same object in memory, right? So we'll talk a little bit more about this concept in just a minute here, this being the same object in memory, being references to the same object, etc. But for now, just know that this is what this thing here is saying and not this up here, as you might've thought. So, in order to show you what this being the same object thing in memory means, we already saw earlier that the way that we copy an object in JavaScript is not to simply say something like, let my object two equals my object one, right? We discussed that this basically just creates another reference to my object one in memory. And what you're gonna see if you try and compare my object one and my object two now, is that it will return true, right? So again, this is asking, are these two variables references to the same object in memory? And because we're doing this, they are, and it's returning true. Whereas if we were to create a copy of my object one, again, using the spread operator, like we saw, this would be false since these are not now references to the same object in memory, right? They're references to different objects in memory. So anyway, the point of all of this is that in order to find out whether or not two objects in JavaScript have the same properties and values, there's really no other way to do it than to simply look through each individual property and check to see that it's the same as another object, right? And that's something that we'll see how to do next. We're gonna see how to actually create a function that compares two objects based on their properties. But in JavaScript, there's really no way around that, right? There's no direct shortcut using basic JavaScript syntax that will tell us whether or not two objects have the same keys and values. All right, so we're gonna see how to actually do what's called a deep equals comparison between two objects. And we saw how to do this elsewhere with arrays, where basically we just looped through both arrays and compared the corresponding elements in each array. We're gonna see how to do that with objects very shortly, but first I wanna go into a little bit more detail about this object reference thing. So 
What we're doing here when we declare a new object using the curly braces in JavaScript is behind the scenes, we're creating a sort of blob of memory, if you will, that contains all of the object's keys and their corresponding values, right? So we're creating this sort of space in memory that will store each of the keys and its corresponding value. And when we say let my object one equals blah, 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 we're basically assigning a name to that blob of memory. All right, so now instead of let, we will just say my object one. This is basically just a name here for this blob of memory. Now, when we come along and say, let my object two equals my object one, right? Like we were doing before without the curly braces and the spread operator, what that's doing is instead of creating another separate blob of memory that we're assigning the name my object two to, we're simply creating another name, right? Another alias, if you will, for this blob of memory called my object two. And that's why any changes that we make to my object two now, as we saw, will also affect my object one, right? If we say my object two dot C equals, and then we just assign some completely different value, my object one, since it's basically looking at this same portion in memory, is going to reflect that change, all right? Now, when we create a copy of an object, as we're doing here, what we're doing, right? Let's just redraw this blob here. We'll just say A, B, and C, and we'll assume that these are the properties from my object one, one, two, three, right? We'll just say my object one. Well, what we're doing when we create a copy of this is we're actually creating a separate blob here in JavaScript's memory. We're taking all of these keys and values and transferring them over here, right? A, B, and C, and their corresponding values, of course, one, two, and three. And we're assigning a name to that, which is my object two. And that's the end of the operation, right? This arrow kind of goes away. And these are now two completely separate pieces of memory with completely different names, right? So if we were to change this now, if we were to say my object two dot C equals blah, 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 that's only going to change this part of the memory, right? Because we have this other part of the memory over here, which is my object one, that's no longer connected in any way to my object two. So just to go through a little bit of terminology for those of you who aren't familiar with this yet, in this case, my object one and my object two are what are called references to a certain portion of memory in JavaScript. Now we've already seen one consequence of this, and that is again, if we just try and say my object two equals my object one, these are now just references to the same portion of memory. But there are some other things that you need to keep in mind when working with object references in JavaScript that aren't quite as obvious. Probably the one that tends to catch people off guard the most is if, let's say we have a function, right? We'll say something like function my function. And let's say that this function takes an object as an argument, right? And let's say that this function just wants to compute the sum of all of the values in this object, right? Well, that would be pretty straightforward. We would just use a for in loop, right? This is how you loop through properties in an object in JavaScript. We would just say something like for let key in object. And then we would say something like out here, we would say let sum equals zero. And inside this for loop, we would say sum plus equals object. And then we would access that key on that object. This is a good example of a use case for the square bracket notation in JavaScript. And then we could simply return the sum. All right, now this function is gonna work exactly the way that we would expect it to. But let's say that somewhere in all of this logic, we end up making some sort of modification to object here. So let's just say, for example, here, this is kind of a contrived example, but this sort of thing does happen all the time in JavaScript functions. Let's say that we say something like object dot uh, D equals four. All right. Maybe we just want to add this property onto all of the objects that we call this function on just for the heck of it. Again, it's a bit of a contrived example, but the concept here is what's important. So let's say that we call this function on our object, right? So we're going to say let sum or you know what, we'll call this total, just so that we uh, don't get confused with the sum inside of here. We'll say let total equals my function, and we'll call that on my object one, all right? 
So let's log out now the total by saying console.log total. And then after that, we'll log out object one itself, right? So we'll say my object one. Oops, and that's just my obj, all right? So if we run this code now, what you're gonna see is that we get the sum of all of the properties, including this D property that we added on beforehand. All right, so that's a correct answer there. But when we log out the value of our object after that, notice that this object, even though all we've done is pass it as an argument to a function, the object has been modified, right? Now this has to do with everything that we were talking about beforehand with object references. So it might've been kind of obvious to you when we said let my object two equals my object one, that these were both just references to the same object in memory. But something that's less obvious in JavaScript is that when you pass an object as an argument, this argument is just a reference to the object that you passed, right? So to illustrate this situation that we have here again, what we're doing is we're defining all of the keys and values of my object one in memory here, right? I'm not going to explicitly write them all out again. But then what happens is when we pass my object one as an argument here, then it's going to go into the body of my function. And what this object argument here is, is basically just another reference to this portion in memory. So when we make a change to object here, we're basically making a change to that property here, and that change is going to persist after the function completes, which is what we're seeing when we run our code, that now my object has an extra property after we've run it. So, so this is something to keep in mind, and just as a matter of interest here, this sort of mechanic, right? The idea of functions being able to affect the arguments that were passed into them, the term for this is passing by reference. Right, so in JavaScript, and we'll just say passing by reference here, in JavaScript, objects and arrays, which as we've seen are also objects, as well as functions are passed by reference. And that means that pretty much any change that we make to that argument inside a function will be persisted outside the function, right? So if we pass this here, function makes a change to it, my object one is going to be different after we've passed it to that function than it was before, all right? Now again, that's only true for the more complex data types like objects as well as arrays, which are objects in JavaScript. But for simpler data types like numbers and strings, those are actually passed by value, right? So passing by value basically just means that those variables are copied and a copy of that variable is used inside the function, all right? Now, in some programming languages, even when you're working with things like objects or arrays or whatever, the programming language will actually copy that for you to make sure that you're not making any changes accidentally, but JavaScript unfortunately doesn't do that. So you're gonna wanna be careful of this kind of thing inside your JavaScript functions because it will actually change the object or array that you're passing in. So anyway, lots of concepts here just to sum up what we've learned. In JavaScript, when you define an object, the variable here is basically just a reference to a space in memory that holds all of that object's properties. And this means A, that in order to copy an object, you have to do something like this, instead of just saying my object two equals my object one. And B, when you're working with functions, you're gonna want to make sure that any object arguments or array arguments as well that you're dealing with are not modified somehow in the body of the function because objects and arrays are passed by reference, which means that any changes that you make to them inside the function will be persisted. So just some technical details to keep in mind when working with JavaScript objects. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've talked about a lot of individual details with objects in JavaScript, and we've also discussed object equality, what we're gonna do here to close out is we're gonna take a look at how to implement a simple function for telling whether or not two objects are deep equals to each other in JavaScript. That is, whether or not two objects in JavaScript have the same keys and values, right? The same properties, essentially, as one another. So 
First of all, in order to get started here, what we're going to do is we're going to copy all of the code that we had from earlier when we saw how to tell whether or not two arrays were deep equal to each other. All right, this is also a very common problem in JavaScript. So I'm going to copy that code and I'm going to paste it inside index.js. If you don't still have this code, uh, you're going to want to just type all of this out, right? You can just pause the video right here and type out this function, right? The function ends right there. And I'll just zoom out for you so that you can get that all on the screen. Basically, that's the function. So pause it here if you need it. Otherwise, I'm going to move on and zoom back in. All right, so we already have this arrays are equal function from, again, elsewhere, where we saw how to tell whether or not two arrays were deep equal to each other. And basically what this does is, first of all, is it checks to see whether or not two arrays are the same length as each other. If they're not, obviously they can't be deep equal to each other, so we return false. And if they are the same length, then what we do is we simply loop through each of the entries for that array, and we check to see whether or not the corresponding entries in that array are equal to each other. Now, one of the most interesting parts of this was how to deal with nested arrays. And what we saw here is basically if two corresponding entries in a JavaScript array are both themselves arrays, then what we're gonna simply do is call this function recursively on those two arrays, right? So that's what you're seeing here, arrays are equal and then we would have the two individual elements. And again, feel free if you want more details on this so to go back and watch the section where we implement this. But for now, I'm just going to skip ahead. So anyway, what we're going to do, and the reason that we brought this arrays are equal function in here is because in order to really tell if two objects in JavaScript are deep equal to each other, we need the ability to know whether or not two arrays are equal to each other, right? So just to uh, demonstrate what that would look like, Let's say that we had A1, B2, and C3. And then we also had a property called D, which was an array that just had one, two, and three inside of it, all right? Well, in order to tell whether or not these two arrays are equal, right, let's say that we have the same thing in here, we would need the ability to compare element by element these two arrays, which is what this arrays are equal function allows us to do. So the objects equal function that we're going to be building here is basically going to take advantage of this arrays are equal function. And once we've completed that objects are equal function, we're actually going to add another case to this if statement here that will allow us to compare two objects if they occur inside an array, right? So if we have these two arrays here, and then one of those elements in the array is an object, right, with a one, Currently, our arrays are equal function doesn't handle this very well, right? It doesn't handle it at all. It just says, nope, those arrays aren't equal because, again, in JavaScript, two objects are not considered equal unless they're references to the same object in memory. So anyway, let's get started here with our objects are equal function. We're just going to say function objects are equal and for this one, we'll take two arguments, object one and object two. And inside here, what we're going to do is something very similar to what we did down here in our arrays are equal function, except we're going to be looping through the objects properties instead of the elements in an array. So for this, first of all, we're going to say let is equal equals true, right? We're going to do the same thing we did in here. We're just starting off assuming that it's true. And if two elements happen to not be equal to each other, we'll set this to false and break out of the loop. After that, we're going to check to see whether or not these two objects have the same number of properties. Now, the reason that we're doing this is to make it so that we don't have to loop through each object separately and cross check it with the other object. Right, this gives us a quick and easy way to tell whether or not a one-way comparison, right, checking the properties of object one on object two will give us the same result as a comparison going the other way. Right, so first of all, in order to get all of the properties in our objects, we're gonna use a function called object.keys. All right, don't worry too much about this right now, just know that object.keys gives us an array containing all of the keys of an object. This is something that we'll discuss in more detail elsewhere. So we'll say if object.keys object one dot length, right? Since this is an array, we can check the number of properties by checking the length of the keys array. So if that's equal to object.keys object two dot length, 
then that means that the comparison is going to be the same. But actually what we want to do is handle the case where those are different lengths, right? Because if two objects have a different number of keys, we know without even looking at those keys that the objects aren't deep equal to each other. So in that case, right, I change this to a not symbol. We're going to say return false. All right. Now, in the case that the two objects do have the same number of properties, what we're going to need to do is simply loop through all of those properties and check to make sure that they're equal. Now, this is a pretty straightforward thing to do using the for in loop. We're just going to say for let key in object one, right? We're just going to loop through objects one's keys and cross check the values for those keys with the values for those keys on object two. So inside here, we're just going to say if object one square brackets key is equal to object two square brackets key, right? So in other words, if the corresponding values for this key on both object one and object two are equal, then we're simply going to want to go to the next key. However, in order to make sure that we can compare these two objects, if they have a property that's an array, let's say, we're going to want to do the same thing that we did down here in our arrays are equal function, where we use the array dot is array function that JavaScript provides us with to check to see whether these two values here are arrays. So first of all, what I'm going to do is say, let object one value equals object one key. And we'll do the same thing for object two value, right? This is just to make it a little bit more readable. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check to see if both of those values are arrays. So we'll say if array dot is array object one value and all right. So double ampersand here array dot is array object two value. All right. So if both of those are arrays, we want to turn this over to our arrays are equal function. So in that case, we're just going to say is equal equals arrays are equal object one value and object two value. And then after this if statement, just like we did inside our arrays are equal function, we're going to want to say if we already know that these two objects aren't equal, we're simply going to want to break out of this for loop, right? There's no reason to check the rest of the keys since we already found two keys whose values were not the same. All right. Now, otherwise, if these two values aren't arrays, we're going to want to compare their values. And there is going to be a third case here that we'll introduce in just a second. That is, if the two values are objects, we're going to want to call this function recursively, as you'll see. But before we do that, we're just going to want to say is equal equals object one value, triple equals object two value. All right, so that will set is equal to false if these two things are not equal, and it will set it to true if they are equal. Okay, so everything should work so far if we remove this array property from my object one and my object two. Let's just try now calling objects are equal. We'll say console.log objects are equal and our objects up here, my object one and my object two, we'll pass those as arguments, my object one and my object two. And here, let's make sure I don't have any other console.logs there. So let's run our code now and see if this works. We should see, oops, it looks like we're getting undefined, which, which basically just means that I forgot to return the value of is equal from inside this function. So outside our for loop here, we're just gonna say return is equal like so. And let's try running this again. Sure enough, what we should see is that we get true returned if both of our objects are equal. And if we were to change one of these values to something, let's say four, we'll get false. Now. Again, the problem with this right now is that if we have a nested object, right? Let's say that we have property D, which is an object with property E, whose value is four, right? We'll do the same thing here, E four. Well, even though we can see that these are still the same object, our objects, our equal function isn't yet set up to handle nested objects. So if we run this now, we'll see that this returns false because again, in JavaScript, no two objects are ever going to be equal to each other unless they're references to the same object in memory, right? I'll say it till I'm blue in the face there, but uh, that's why this isn't working right now. So all we have to do here is add a recursive case inside our objects are equal functions if statement. So before we say else and have the final else case, 
we're going to say else if, and then we're going to check to see if both of these properties are objects. Now, the way that you can do that in JavaScript is simply by saying if type of object one value is equal to object, and we'll check the same thing for object two value. So we'll say type of object two value is equal to object. And we already know, by the way, that these things aren't arrays because at this point, if we get to else if blah, 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 we'll know that they're not arrays. So we know that these two things are just objects and not arrays. And in that case, what we wanna do is we want to call this recursively, right? We wanna say is equal equals objects are equal, object one value as the first argument and object two value as the second argument, okay? And just to top this off, we're gonna basically use this same exact case. We're gonna add this to our arrays our equal function down here so that from this point on, we'll be able to handle basically arbitrarily nested objects and arrays, right? That is, we'll be able to compare objects that have array properties and arrays that have objects as elements. So let's just paste this in here. I'm going to move else down and we're going to paste the case from above. And in order to just make this fit in, we're gonna have to change this from type of object one value to type of X and type of array to index up here, right? If you don't remember what those are, don't worry too much about them. Basically, these are just the two elements that we're comparing in the array at this point in time. And that should be all we need to do to finish that off. So let's try this again. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna make some of these objects nested. We're gonna add some arrays in there. So we have a nested object and we'll also add an array in there that has an object. All right, so we'll do the same thing in here. We'll do a one, so we clearly can see that these two things are equal to each other. Oops, and here, let's add another property here. We'll call this one f and f. So there we go. So we can see that these two objects are equal to each other just by, you know, kind of scanning and doing a spot check. So they should be marked as equal by our objects are equal thing. And the important bit here is that we're able to compare nested objects, and we're also able to compare arrays within objects and objects within arrays. So that should allow us to check this. Let's try running our code again. And remember that we're just logging out here the result of objects are equal, my object one and my object two. So if we run our code, oops, it looks like we're getting an error. And that is, I believe, from our copied and pasted code inside arrays are equal. Yep, sure enough, we forgot to change object one value here to X and object two value here to array two index. Again, don't worry too much about what those are. Just know that that's kind of the equivalent of what we're doing up in our objects are equal function. So let's try this again. We're going to run our code and sure enough, we'll see true. And if we go in here somewhere and, and just change the value of one of these things, we should see that that will now give us false. Now the same thing is going to be true of our arrays, right? If we use our arrays are equal function to compare array one and two, what that's going to look like is we're just going to change this to arrays are equal, array one, array two. And I believe they should be equal, right? They both have objects inside of them, which is great since that will test out our objects are equal function as well. So let's try running our code again. And sure enough, this will return false because this value is different. So let's just make these equal to each other. And they should be equal now. So let's try node index.js. Sure enough, we get true. If we change this value inside one of our arrays objects to a different value, we'll see that that will give us false as well. So congratulations on completing that through these two functions, right? These two functions are actually quite complex. And my idea with these functions have been to try and capture a lot of the oddities of working with objects and arrays in JavaScript. So Hopefully just by studying these two functions that we've created, you'll be able to really understand objects as well as arrays in JavaScript on a deeper level. So again, feel free to dig pretty deeply into these two functions that we've created and make sure that you're clear on why we've done certain things and on how each of these things works. And again, that should give you a pretty deep understanding of objects in JavaScript. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.